last known image of a woman just before she would vanish into thin air. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Akia Eggleston. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Akia is a mother to a two-year-old daughter, and she was eight months pregnant. She was absolutely excited to have her second child, and she was a really good mom. She was 22 years old and living in the Baltimore, Maryland area. So apparently the pregnancy this time was causing some medical issues and she was on bed rest at the time that this case happens. She wasn't allowed to really do anything, like move anything, move around too much. It was considered a high risk pregnancy. In May of 2017, Akia was going to be having her baby shower and this was something that she had been planning for a long time. She had a large guest list, there was gonna be a lot of festivities, it was, she was so excited for it. However, on the day of the baby shower, she was not there. She did not show up for it, which was an immediate red flag to everyone. So they would go to the place where she lived and she wasn't there either. And so the family looked for her for several hours and then they would call the police to report her missing. They noticed that there was like a dresser had been moved out of her apartment and like all of her clothing and stuff. It looked as if someone had moved her out, but her roommates, I guess, weren't home at the time they had no knowledge of why that happened, why the dresser was gone, why the clothing was gone. So as police are trying to trace her last moments, they discover that she made a withdrawal from the local bank. So this image is her going up to the teller where she would eventually withdraw $572. Now that was an unusual amount at first, but then police discovered what it was for. It was actually for, I guess, a down payment for a new home that she plans to be sharing with her two children and the father of her new baby. It's believed that she left the bank and she traveled the 3.2 miles back to her home and then something happened at her house shortly after the bank. Approximately six months after she disappeared, she still hasn't been found, suddenly one of her debit cards is seen in a bush and it's in pristine condition. So police believe that it was planted there well after the fact. And then in February of 2022, police announce we have arrested someone for the murder of Akia Eggleston, her boyfriend and the father of her new baby, Michael Robertson. Based on witnesses, based on interviews, on social media accounts, based on cell phone data, they were able to pinpoint his location during the time that Akia disappeared. Authorities believe that an argument broke out between the two of them and that he just killed her. He would be convicted of the murder of Akia and her unborn child, and he got life without parole. Akia and her unborn child have never been found. She was found brutally murdered 62 years ago, and they are just still trying to figure out who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Alexandra Vacheruk. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Alexandra was a 23-year-old nurse and she was living in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Canada. On May 18th, 1962, the former beauty queen was scheduled to work a nurse's shift that night. She was living with roommates and the last people that can say they saw her alive were her roommates that night. She said she was going to go into a, a local drugstore to drop off a letter and then she was gonna take a walk before she went into work. But she never made it to work. In fact, she was never seen alive again. An exhaustive search would begin within a day of her disappearing because she was reported missing pretty quickly. And they searched for a couple of weeks, but they just couldn't find any signs of her. And then a six-year-old boy was walking along this riverbank. And in one of these little like tree bush areas, he saw a hand sticking out of the dirt. When police went to go investigate, they confirmed that there was a body underneath the dirt, and it would be confirmed to be that of 23-year-old Alexandra Vacheruk. Alexandra had been bludgeoned over the head with a concrete block. She was sexually assaulted, and the coroner would determine that she was under the dirt and buried before she was actually dead. This happened in 1962 before any type of investigative technology was really in existence. And so they just didn't have any evidence. There weren't any fingerprints collected. There wasn't any DNA that would have been collected at that time. And they had very few witnesses. 
A group of like teenage boys said they saw her walking uh, at one point that night uh, before she was supposed to go into work. But as far as I know, those teenage boys were, uh, I'm assuming, ruled out. And sadly, this case just went cold pretty quickly. But the police there in Saskatoon were still holding out hope that someone would come forward with information. But no one really has. And then Alexandra's four nieces, by about 2008 or so, they began to start investigating the, on their own. And since then, they have done hundreds of interviews. They have collected DNA samples from potential suspects. They hand that stuff over to police. Apparently it's never matched anything yet. I don't know if they've retested like clothing or whatnot for DNA from, you know, the body. And they say they've narrowed it down to about three or four suspects with a couple of them still being alive and a couple of them are dead, but they have not released the names of those people or they have not released their theories either. But her case is still unsolved. If you have information, you can contact this number. A young girl would go on the news with regards to her missing friend, and then she, too, would go missing. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Ashley and Miranda. Viewer discretion is advised. Ashley Pond was a 12-year-old girl who lived in an apartment with her mom in Oregon City, Oregon. They lived in the Newell Creek Village Apartments. On January 9th, 2002, Ashley was running a little late for school, which is something I guess was normal for her. So she rushes out of the house, says goodbye to her mom, and then begins to take the 10-minute walk up the hill to her bus stop. Later that day, her mom, Lori, had gotten home from work and noticed that Ashley wasn't home. Worried, she would call the school to see if Ashley was still there for some reason. They told her Ashley never even got to school that day. I don't know if the school attempted to call Lori ahead of time or not. I'm not sure. At first, there was this thought that people had, okay, maybe Ashley ran away, but then all of her belongings were still in the house. She literally brought nothing with her, and she was 12, and she had never run away before. So the police and the FBI come in, they go to the apartment complex, they begin to interview every single person they can. Meanwhile, they have search crews out there looking through every nook and cranny they can in every wooded area and they're just coming up with absolutely nothing. They have no idea where Ashley Pond is, and they have no idea what happened to her. At some point during the initial investigation, her friend, Miranda Gaddis, was actually interviewed on the news who was talking about her friend's case. The two of them, the two girls, had known each other since the third grade. She was also a neighbor living in the same apartment complex. As a couple of weeks goes by, they're still looking for her, Life for everyone else outside of the Pond family kind of starts to go back to normal. And then a couple of months goes by, and then it's March 8th, 2002. It's believed that Miranda would have left her home that morning sometime around 8 o'clock to head to the bus stop, and she would have gone up the exact same hill that her friend Ashley would have gone up when she likely was taken. The belief, by the way, is that Ashley had been abducted on her way to the bus stop because they found out she had never gone to school that day and she never got on the bus that morning. Well, the same thing would happen to Miranda. Later that afternoon, Miranda's family would be made aware that Miranda didn't show up to school. And so given what had just happened with Ashley, she was immediately reported missing and another investigation into another missing young girl has started. The police go to their school and they interview every classmate, every teacher, every faculty member they can, and they don't really get anything from it. The girls were good friends. They didn't have any enemies. There weren't any, like, you know, boyfriends in the mix. They set up roadblocks, seeing if they can get information from people that way. They have FBI going door to door, but they don't get any new information. The similarities between the girls' abductions, I mean, it was uncanny. It was basically the exact same scenario that happened to both girls. And so they do truly believe that they were both abducted by the same person. Who that person was, however, they were having a hard time figuring that out. At that point, the school bus would no longer pick the kids up at that you know particular bus stop. They would actually pick them up now directly from the apartment complex, go figure. And then in August of 2002, they got an unfortunate break. This is the home of a man named Ward Weaver. In August of 2002, he was arrested for sexually assaulting his son's girlfriend. Ward Weaver, his son, would also tell police that he believes that Ward had probably kidnapped both girls and killed them both. That was enough for police to get a warrant. They were able to search a shed in the backyard of his home where they found a body. 
The coroner would determine that the body was that of Miranda Gaddis. And then two days later, they are searching in the same backyard and they see this like recently laid concrete. And so they, they break it up and they find a barrel underneath the ground. And that barrel has another body confirmed to be that of Ashley Pond. They would soon learn that Ashley was friends with Ward Weaver's younger daughter. So he was arrested and then charged with the sexual assault and the murders and kidnapping of both girls. He would then confess that he did in fact do it. He had kidnapped both of them as they were on their way up the hill to the school bus. And so Ward Weaver would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. There was nothing at the scene of her disappearance that would indicate foul play, but somebody killed her. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Barbara Blackstone. Viewer discretion is advised. Barbara Blackstone was born on November 27th, 1956, and she was living in Wisconsin at the time of this case. She was a teacher at New Lisbon High School, and she had been doing that since 1984 until her disappearance in 1987. And at the time of this case, she had a husband, and by all accounts, it was a happy marriage. It was July 9th, 1987, and Barbara lived off of Delmore Road, and her and her husband had this very large property. On that day, Barbara was mowing her lawn. But then she ran out of gas for the lawnmower, so she would go to a nearby gas station in her car. She would purchase some gas and bring it back home. When her husband got home, he saw that her car was parked, the trunk at the time was open. There was a full gas can inside the trunk, but Barbara was gone. He searched the entire property. He looked in the house, everywhere, called her name, nothing. There were no signs of a struggle. There were no drag marks. There was no blood. There was nothing to indicate that anything happened here. It just looked like Barbara just left. But she was reported missing, and of course they begin their investigation, they're looking everywhere for her, and for some time they're not finding anything. They're not getting any tips, they're not getting any leads. Barbara didn't have any enemies, she didn't have any jilted exes, she was a very well-respected person in this community. Everybody loved her. Now, in the summer of 1987, Barbara was not the only one to vanish. There was also Angela Hackle and Linda Nockreiner. Between June, July, and August is when all three of them would vanish. Angela and Linda were found. They had both been shot to death. Later, police would determine that each one of those victims was killed by someone different. And they determined that whatever happened to Barbara was not related to the other two women. A month after she disappeared, Barbara's body was found. And they determined that this was absolutely a homicide. But they have no idea how she got there. They have no idea who did this to her they have come up with nothing and no one. From what I understand, her husband must have been looked at and questioned, and I can only guess he was cleared, but there's no like definitive answer I can find to that. But he is still kind of actively, you know, looking for help to solve this case. Barbara was just a quiet homebody. She was a teacher, and no one can figure out who would do this to her. But somebody out there knows. If you have any information about the murder of Barbara Blackstone, please call 608-847-5649. This road is the last place a 14-year-old girl would ever be seen. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Beth Miller. Viewer discretion is advised. Beth Miller was born on July 27th, 1969, and I think she had seven siblings. And from what I can tell, she was described as a very fun, uh, very just outgoing young girl, just like a ton of personality. And everyone said that she was just hilarious, that she loved making people laugh, and she loved to laugh. She was also athletic. She played on the basketball team, and she would go jogging every day to keep herself in shape for basketball. And that's exactly what she was doing on August 16th, 1983. Beth would leave her house to go on her daily jog. She did this every single day. She came home every single day. Typically, she would jog with a friend, but this particular day, she decided to jog on her own. She left her home um, on that afternoon, and she never got back. And Beth has never been seen since. 
she had jogged down this road like she always did. And when she got to like this park area, some witnesses would say they think they saw a man in a red pickup truck. Uh, 1975, maybe 1976, it had a white camper top and it had out of state license plate and the person in the car was talking to what people thought was Beth, which kind of lines up because I guess a couple of days prior, Beth's sister saw Beth talking to someone in a pickup truck that the person inside was like inappropriately flirting with this 14 year old girl. But who that person is, nobody knows. And if they have anything to do with this at all, again, nobody knows. They would search, I mean, just for miles and miles around. They never found a single trace of her. They would search on foot. They had helicopters in the air. They had searched any bodies of water nearby. They brought in dogs to pick up the scent, but nothing, nothing ever came of it. About eight or nine years later, her sister would actually become a detective for the sole purpose of taking the lead on this case. She would find out through a grand jury that basically the authorities really fucked up this investigation from the get-go. There was extremely poor cooperation amongst different investigative units. People weren't working with each other. Documents and statements that had been taken in this case had just been lost and they just bungled it. Her sister worked on the case for like seven or eight years, but because of all of the mess ups, she could never get any further on it. And she eventually retired. If Beth is still out there alive, she may look something like this. Somebody knows what happened to her. If you have information, please call 303-239-4222. This happened 19 years ago and the question still remains, where is Billy? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Billy Smolinski. Viewer discretion is advised. William Smolinski Jr., who would go by Billy, is pictured here with his family at a younger age. But by the time this story is taking place, he is living in Waterbury, Connecticut. Specifically, here in this home, a house that he loved. And it was a house that he shared with his beloved dog. Billy is described as not a perfect person, flawed like the rest of us, but he's a good person. He never really fell into the wrong crowd. He never experimented with illegal substances. He kept a pretty level head. About a year prior to this case happening, he started to date this woman, Madeline Gleason. But a year later, Billy begins to suspect that she is seeing another man. And so he pretty much begins the process of breaking off the relationship with her. Madeline, in fact, had been dating another man named Chris Sorensen. And on the day that this case occurs, Billy allegedly places a phone call to Chris Sorensen, essentially with a, with a vague threat of, you better watch your back. So the date in question is August 24th, 2004. Billy is last seen outside of his home in Connecticut at approximately 3 or 3.30 p.m. He goes over to his neighbor's house and says, hey, can you please take care of my dog while I'm out for a couple of days? And the neighbor says, yeah, of course. And then Billy is never seen again. Billy had alleged he was to be taking a trip for a couple of days. And so when his parents found out that he hadn't come home yet, they report him missing because this is very unusual. And when they go to his house, they see that his truck is actually still parked in the driveway. It was actually at the end of the driveway and inside the truck were his keys and his wallet. So where did he go? And how did he get there? Police learned that Billy had deposited his recent paycheck just shortly before his disappearance and that money has never been touched in his bank account. His bank account's never been used. His social security number has never been used since. And that's when a man named Chad Hansen comes forward to police to say he knows what happened to Billy. He said a friend of his named Sean Kopayuk well, he had killed Billy and buried his body, and he helped bury the body. So then he would lead police on a wild goose chase. They had them searching throughout all of the woods in the area. They brought in cadaver dogs. They have the family and friends, police searching all over the state. But everywhere they look, everywhere that Chad says the body is, is never, it's never found. His parents are at a loss. They're grieving, and now this guy is basically, they think, lying to them about where the body is. They actually think that Chad is telling the truth about the murder part, but he isn't telling the truth about where the body is. So Chad here will plead guilty to providing false information and he's sentenced to four and a half years in prison for it. Now, Sean Kapriuk, however you say his last name, is actually the son of the now ex-girlfriend, Madeline. Sean, however, died of an overdose in 2005. The ex-girlfriend, Madeline, then sues Billy's family because they are placing the missing persons flyers around her neighborhood and they, she felt that they were doing it aggressively almost to threaten that her or harass her. 
and Madeline would actually end up winning that lawsuit. And she has always denied having any involvement in whatever may have happened to Billy. Again, the family does think that Chad was probably telling the truth about what happened. It's just a matter of where the hell is he? But he still has never told the truth about that. And so we are here 19 years later and Billy Smolinski has never been located. No trace of him has ever been found. No information, true information about what actually happened to him that day has really come forward. Not information that they've been able to verify. They haven't found any evidence, physical evidence of an altercation, no blood, anything like that. He was just there and then he was gone. It does sound like the police believe he certainly met with foul play, but of course there is always that chance, that sliver of hope he could still be out there somewhere, but the odds are probably pretty low. And so now the family is still asking for the public's help in trying to find out what happened to Billy. Somebody somewhere out there knows the truth and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the disappearance of William Billy Smolinski, please contact the Waterbury Police Department at 203-574-6941. Please help his family get him back home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brian Mace. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Brian Michael Mace is a 20-year-old living in Fauquier County, Virginia. He lives with his mom and his stepdad, and his stepdad owns a roofing company in which Brian actually worked for. On April 9th, 2003, his stepdad said, hey, go ahead and take the day off. And so Brian would sleep in a little later than he usually did that day. When he woke up, basically everyone was gone except for his sister, Jody. And then he left the house and he told Jody, I'm going to go rent a video game. And then Jody had to leave at about 11 o'clock in the morning. So she never saw him come back home. At 1 p.m., his stepdad, Carlo, goes back to the house because he then decides he needed Brian that day for another project they were going to be working on, but he couldn't do it alone. So he was going to pick up Brian. However, when Carlo got to the house and he tried to open the front door, he couldn't because for some reason it was blocked or something was broken with the lock. So he goes up a flight of stairs around back to enter through a back door, which he was able to open. But when he did, immediately a bunch of smoke flew out and he realized, oh my God, the house is on fire. And he's thinking to himself, Brian's in the house, so I have to go in there and get him. So he's, he runs in the house, even though it's basically on smoking up and on fire, screaming Brian's name, he can't find him, but he still doesn't give up. And so he goes downstairs and he ends up tripping over something because he can't really see anything because of all the smoke. But when he looks down, he realizes it's Brian. And so really without thinking, Carlo just takes Brian and he drags him out of the house, hoping he can save his life. But unfortunately, when they get outside, he realizes Brian is already dead, not from the fire, but from a gunshot wound to his head. Somebody murdered Brian. Once the smoke finally settled and the fire never really took off because there wasn't enough oxygen in the home because there were no windows open or doors open when it was lit. But they did realize that Brian himself was the starting point of the fire. So whoever started it literally started it on his dead body. The rest of the house had clearly been ransacked. Things were tossed, everything was thrown all over the place and a whole bunch of guns were stolen. So police decided this was obviously a robbery that Brian must have interrupted when he came back home from renting a video game. And the burglar must have seen him and then just immediately shot him in the head. They also believe that there are multiple people involved in this because the gun collection that was stolen was huge. To my knowledge, there were no witnesses who saw anything or heard anything. The fire destroyed any fingerprints and any DNA that could have been left behind and they found none. Police also found out through his sister Jody that on the morning of the murder, they got three phone calls to their house. And each time the person wouldn't respond and they would hang up immediately. They were able to trace the phone numbers that called and they've discovered that all three of those phone calls came from the same number, which they traced to a payphone. And this was about a mile and a half, two miles away from their home. The payphone did have a fingerprint on it, but that fingerprint even to this day has never matched anyone. And honestly, it could have been anyone's fingerprint, not necessarily related to this. However, police do suspect that the people or person who called the house three times that morning, there's a very good chance they are involved in this, which means that it's someone that this family knew. There was also a string of burglaries that were very similar to this that had happened around that same time in the same area. And they suspected maybe those people are responsible for this, but eventually when they captured those burglars, they were able to determine that they were just not they were alibied, so they could not have been present during this murder. Police have questioned the family. They have questioned all of the friends, 
people that just were acquaintances, people through this, you know, roofing company that his stepdad owned, they have tried everything and no one has come forward with any information that will lead to whoever killed him. It does sound like this was a burglary gone wrong, that Brian walked in on these people at the worst possible moment. But who those people are to this very day is still unknown. So if you have any information about the murder of Brian Mace, please contact the Fakir County Sheriff's Department in Virginia at 540-347-3300. Please help Brian and his family get the justice that he so rightfully deserves. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Candace Shields. Viewer discretion is advised. Candace Renee Shields, who would go by Candy to some people in her life, she was born on September 19th, 1991, and she was living in the Graham, Texas area at the time of this case. She was dating a man named Jeremy Thornburg, and they actually had a one-year-old child together, and at the time of this case, she is four months pregnant with their second child. It was December 10th, 2011. 20-year-old Candace was at her grandparents' home in Graham, Texas, but by the following morning, she was just gone. All of her items, her belongings, like purse, wallet, everything, was in her grandma's house, in the room she was staying in. Candace was supposed to be starting a new job that day, but she never showed up to it. And most importantly of all, she absolutely adored her one-year-old child, and she would never just pick up and leave. So the family immediately felt something was off. By December 15th, a couple of days later, she is reported missing. The police looked into her, like, social media. She had logged into her Facebook on that December 10th evening, and they found out that the last person she was speaking to was her boyfriend, Jeremy. Apparently, there was an argument between the two of them because Jeremy suspected that Candace had been seeing other men, which is insane because he was also seeing another woman. Her name was Luana Long. According to some people, Luana Long was very jealous of Candace. And apparently, she had even threatened Candace a couple of times. So police would zone in on these two almost immediately. Initially, the two of them would deny having any involvement in anything that happened to Candace. But police were able to get a warrant, and they found a gun um, in Jeremy's possession. There was a small spot of blood on that gun, and that blood would match Candace. And then cell phone records would show that the two of them were basically in the exact same area as Candace, the night she would have disappeared. They had a roommate who also told police that all of their bleach went missing that night. And so they were both arrested and they were charged with Candace's murder despite not having her body. And Luana immediately flipped on Jeremy and confessed. According to her, Jeremy lured Candace out to an open field area to talk when he then shot her in the back of the head and killed her. Luana then says she helped Jeremy dump bleach all over her body, but for some reason they've never still been able to find her body. And from what I understand, the both of them are being completely uncooperative and are not telling authorities where she is. Luana would end up pleading guilty to Candace's murder, and she got 30 years. Jeremy would go to trial and he was convicted. He got life in prison without parole. But the family still wants to know where she is. Okay, so I think I'm going to be really good at this. Oh, shit. Whoops. <clears throat> Whoops. Okay. Oh, raspberries. All right. Ah, oh, tarnations. Here we go. Okay. Ah, oh, dagnabbit. All right. That is not the bee's knees. Okay, this time. Well, I'll be. God bless it. Whoops. Whoops. Wow. Mm. All right. God, fudge packers. Come on, concentrate, Mike. God, son. Oh, you're a dumb dildo. Oh, here we go. Okay. God, insert a pen in my asshole. Maybe I'll see better if I do this. Ah, oh, nippleless titties. All right, here we go. Come on. God, God damn it. I'm going to poison you with antifreeze. Oh, okay. Oh, a vada cadaver your dick off. The glasses aren't helping here. Son of a tit licker. All right, come to Jesus moment here. Here we go. God damn it, son of a bitch. I'm gonna slather chocolate on the Pope and lick it off his ass. I think I have some anger issues. I need to... God, I wanna eat some dingleberries. God, this plane is going down. 
Okay, go fuck! Oh, you have to actually touch the screen. Oh, okay. True Crimeers, this is the case of Carol Montecalvo. Viewer discretion is advised. Carol was born on February 11th, 1945 in Buffalo, New York. Later down the road in life, she would meet this man, Dan Montecalvo. Now, Dan was a convicted bank robber, but apparently Carol would, I guess through her church, they would write letters to prisoners, and so they were interacting that way. That's how they met. And then by 1980, he's out and they get married. But according to, like, family, friends, and neighbors, the two of them had a very up-and-down, rocky relationship. But nothing, like, out of the ordinary that you wouldn't see in a couple, kind of, anyway. Like, the neighbors didn't say they ever saw the two of them having, like, a large fight or argument. You know, the two of them were active members of their church. Carol was described as incredibly uh, generous, and her faith was everything to her. She was all about helping others and giving to people who were less fortunate, people who were needy. She donated her time, her money, but the money part probably didn't sit so well with Dan. But in March of 1988, Carol would end up winning a trip to Hawaii. And so on March 31st, 1988, the couple was getting ready for that trip. They were packing. Dan says, hey, do you want to go out and just, you know, take a break and go for a walk? And Carol's like, yeah, absolutely. The two of them arrive back to the house, and then a few minutes later, Dan places that 911 call that I played at the beginning of this video. He says that he and his wife were both shot by intruders. So essentially what he says is when they get back from their walk, they go back into their home and nothing seems unusual, but then Dan hears Carol screaming and then the gunshots. He then rushes out to the hallway where he sees his wife on the floor, and it looks like she'd been shot. And then... Someone comes up behind him and shoots him in his lower back. When police first arrive, they're not sure if the shooter is still in the house or not, but after some time, they realize that there was no one else in there other than Dan and Carol. So they rush Carol to the hospital, but unfortunately, she would be pronounced deceased. Within a day of this happening, uh, police were having a hard time believing Dan's story. You see, when police arrived, every light in the house was on. There were cars parked in the driveway, their cars. All indications pointing to the fact that this house was currently occupied by people who were still awake. So why would robbers choose this house, of all houses, to break into? When it was more than obvious, somebody was home. Furthermore, Carol's purse was in plain view and not one thing was stolen from it. Something just, it just was not adding up. There were no witnesses who saw or heard anything. There was a brief moment when police believed that this case may have been related to another murder that happened in the same area. The murder of a Burbank police officer, Deputy Charlie Anderson, who actually I covered his case recently over on my YouTube channel. Then when they started digging into Dan's life, they began to realize that this probably had nothing to do with his wife's murder. They found out that Dan had a significant amount of debt. And they also basically realized and covered that he was a convicted bank robber. And they found out he was meeting other women, sleeping with other women. And then the life insurance policy came into play, $600,000 that would have gone straight to Dan in the event of Carol's untimely passing. And that would more than take care of all of his debt. Two acquaintances of Dan would go to police to say that Dan had talked to them about also getting life insurance policies on their wives. And the way he kind of approached it seemed very, like, fishy, very concerning. About a year or so after the murder took place, they would get a warrant to search his home, his new home, and they found a receipt for a storage unit. So they went to the storage unit, got a warrant to search that, and they found a, a little container that would have held two guns, but the guns were missing. Apparently, they were able to find out that this box held a 25 caliber and a 38 caliber gun, which was the same ammunition used in the supposed murder robbery story. Carol was shot with a different ammunition than Dan was shot with, but those guns have never been found. So at that point, they arrest Dan Montecalvo for the murder of his wife, Carol. He goes on trial and he is found guilty of her murder. 
He was sentenced to 27 years to life. In January of 1991, one of their neighbors, her name was Suzanne, I guess, would come forward to say it was actually her and a friend that broke into the Monte Calvo home and shot both people. Susan said it was her friend that shot and killed Carol, and it was Susan who shot Dan. They were able to look into this woman, Susan, and they discovered she had a long list of mental health issues. Lots of, like, medications. She was someone who, like, considered a pathological liar. She was known to make up a lot of stories. And she was also one who always was looking for attention. So they believe that Susan's story was really just bullshit. And that they had the right person in prison. No evidence has ever come to link to Susan or this friend. Dan always claimed his innocence. But he would end up dying in prison. There has never been any evidence to come forward to show that anyone other than Dan was responsible. They were killed in a hit and run and their murderer is still at large. Hello true crimeers, this is the case of Shansami and Abby Thamavong. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information for this case or really any images. But it was August 6, 1998, and this was at the on the I-40 near the Arizona and New Mexico border. Chomping Famavong and his wife were taking their two girls from California and they were going to Wisconsin and they were going to be driving the whole way. He was driving a Toyota 4Runner. So on that August 6, 1998 day, at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning as they are on the road, there is a lot of, you know, uh, big rig traffic, which is pretty typical. Chom Ping was driving in the fast lane when he noticed there were, like, there was a couple of semis coming up behind him. So he moved over to the slow lane in order to let the, you know, the bigger trucks pass by. He did that to avoid them, to let them go. But one of them would apparently, for no reason whatsoever, ram their truck right into the back of their truck. The semi-truck just plowed into this Toyota 4Runner and it ran the vehicle off the road. And then this truck, this is what they described it looked like. This is not the exact one, obviously, but it just kept going. The Thamavong vehicle literally rolled down a hill. And the impact was so extreme that it actually killed the two girls, nine-year-old Shansami and six-year-old Abby, both were pronounced dead at the scene. They had actually been vaulted from the car, thrown out through the windows. Everyone else in the vehicle would manage to survive, but had injuries. The only thing left behind was a small part of the semi's bumper, but that was it. It was pitch dark in this, you know, remote stretch of road. They did not get the best look at, you know, the exact colors of the truck or if it had any like, you know, lettering on the side. They didn't see, they couldn't see the license plate. It all happened so fast. By the time the semi-truck hit them, they would've, wouldn't have been able to see anything anyway. But it was described as an 18-wheeler. Police did look to see if any, you know, similar vehicles had gone in for repair or gone to any of the truck stops, the mandatory truck stops along the highway, but they didn't find anything. And whoever was driving this truck has never been found. The person driving the truck is a murderer. They killed two very, very young girls, very innocent girls who were probably just asleep in the back of the car. And they haven't gotten justice and they deserve it. And so if you have any information about the identity of the person driving that semi truck, you can actually contact the Arizona State Police because it was in Arizona where the incident occurred. And please help this family get justice. They deserve it. The CCTV footage you see behind me is that of a man who literally just shot and killed a woman and the police are still asking for the public's help in trying to identify this man. Hello true crimeers, this is the case of Chelsea Small. Viewer discretion is advised. It was November 12, 2013 in Taylor, Michigan at the Advance America Cash Advance store. 30-year-old Chelsea Small, who was the mother to two children, was working there that day on her own. Chelsea had only been working at this location for a couple of months. On the door was a buzzer that a customer would have to ring in order to gain entry to the store. And so there was no indication that Chelsea knew this man or recognized him, or there was no indication that she felt concerned or threatened by this man. 
But the man walks in, lifts up a gun, and fires several rounds into Chelsea Small, and she collapses to the ground. He is then seen just casually walking through the location and goes through the door like, like he owns the place. He is seen just kind of going back behind the counter, again, not showing any kind of like need to hurry. And eventually he takes items and puts it in a bag. And so again, this is him afterwards and now he is leaving the store. But he just sort of just, like he's just a customer. He's just so casual about it. He just murdered a woman, stole presumably money, and just walks out like nothing happened. This is broad daylight. The man is described as being between 35 to 50 years old. He is a white male, approximately five foot 10, with a slightly heavier build. He has long dark hair that at least goes down to like his shoulders. They also described him as having kind of an irregular walking gait. And he's also clearly an incredibly confident person and completely unfazed by this type of activity. The man walked out with a small amount of cash, nothing worthwhile. And he killed a mother of two children for, for what? This happened a little over 10 years ago now, and unbelievably it's still unsolved. Some have speculated this man may be a truck driver, which would make it even more difficult to find him. But that's, again, it's just a rumor or a theory. But he's out there somewhere. Whatever his job may be, he is out there somewhere. Surely someone recognizes this man, recognizes the way he walks, you know, recognizes the way he carries himself. Just someone out there knows who this is and someone has got to come forward. He also, by the way, used a silencer, which is unusual for these types of robberies. So that may help identify him too. If you have information, please call 734-287-6611. These two masked men are wanted for a murder that happened nearly nine years ago. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christopher Reese. Viewer discretion is advised. I don't know much about Christopher. All I can see is that he was described as a family man who was just trying to make ends meet to support his family. Christopher and his family lived in Notice, Idaho. I believe it's like a, a little small town. He was working here at Jackson's Food Store, a convenience store slash gas station, and he was working the overnight shift. It was December 17th, 2014. Christopher was working alone in the store. CCTV would show that one man walks in with like a dolly. He is covered basically head to toe. He has uh, what looks like a face mask on. And then right after him, another man walks in carrying what police described as an assault rifle, also wearing the same type of clothing with a face covering. Police said that the two men walked in, pointed the gun at Christopher, and shot him execution style. They then stole the safe from the store, and then they stole Christopher's vehicle from the parking lot. Police would arrive sometime afterwards, I believe when the customer noticed the body of Christopher Reese, and there really wasn't much evidence left behind. All they really had was what they found on the cameras. Both men were described as being uh, kind of husky. By the little you can see of them, of like their eyes, their area of their eyes, you can tell that they're likely white men or light-skinned men. They walked in in what they described as a very tactical approach. They were very matter of fact, and they just basically were there to do this job. A short time later, Christopher's stolen car was found, as well as the stolen safe. From what I can see, the safe was not broken into and nothing was taken from it. They probably couldn't open it. However, there was uh, cash stolen from the registers. But that is all police know, and that is all they have at least given to the public. They said they have not identified any actual suspects in the almost nine years since this happened. They say they have had persons of interest that they've looked into, but no arrests have ever been made. There really isn't much forensically they have to analyze. And it sounds like they're relying solely on just identifying these two men based on these images, based on their size, the weapon they're holding, and honestly, a lot of times people like this love to talk about what they did. If their goal was to, you know, rob and steal money, they've probably done this before and maybe have done it since. And maybe they have said something to someone. 
So if you have any information, please call 208-343-COPS. The smallest bit of information will help. Christopher Reese and his family deserve justice. A man would drown to death upside down in one of the worst deaths imaginable. Fewer discretion is advised. So this thing is called a water butt, something I have never heard of before, but apparently it is like an outdoor use type thing. It is a storage unit for water, specifically for like rainwater, for it to collect into one barrel, basically. So I've seen like an image of it looking like this, and then I've seen them looking a little bit bigger like this. I don't know exactly what size the unit was for this particular story. So this particular story happened in Hull Beach, which is in England, and it happened to an 80-year-old man who was a father to two adult children, and he was outside working on a stepladder. Well, I'm not exactly sure how the wife didn't find him at first, but she would report him missing to a neighbor because she was looking around and couldn't find him anywhere. And so the neighbor decided to help her look, and so they went into, I guess, the garden, where they saw a broken stepladder, and then they saw basically one of these containers with someone's legs sticking out of it. And it turns out it was the 80-year-old man. He had fallen. He had fallen off a stepladder, which broke, and he landed head first into this barrel, essentially. And this is why I'm thinking it looked more like this, because they said the man was like tightly in there. Like it was very difficult for anyone to pull him out. And this was about a four foot tank and he was in it in, up into his waist. And so his head and everything was completely submerged in water. And so they're, they're finally able to yank him out. But at that point, because the ambulance then arrives, but at that point he's already pronounced deceased. He drowned in this small amount of water while upside down in this barrel. He just, by some crazy chance, happened to fall perfectly into it, where if it wasn't gonna be the water, he likely would have suffocated from lack of oxygen because the opening was basically completely sealed. And because his head was submerged in water, he was probably trying to scream for help, but no one would hear him because he was screaming underwater. And so that's the scary part, is that he was drowning slowly, trying to ask for help, but no one would hear it. And they can really only speculate as to what happened. I mean, they, they saw a broken stepladder, they assumed he was on it, and it, and it broke while he was on it, and then he fell upside down into the barrel. That's, they don't know exactly how this occurred. I believe they looked into the wife, they did an inquest and everything, and they determined this was just a horrific accident. It's just insane that he managed to actually fall into this perfectly sized barrel. She was found frozen solid inside of a cryotherapy chamber in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Pictured here was 24-year-old Chelsea Ake Salvacion, who lived in Las Vegas, Nevada. She was, I believe, from what I understand, one of the managers here at Rejuvenice. And it's a spa there in Las Vegas that deals a lot with cryotherapy. And this is what a cryotherapy chamber looks like something I would probably never in my life ever want to get in. But basically a person would go inside of it and you are exposed uh, from two to four minutes worth of time to temperatures that can get to negative 166 degrees as low as negative 319 degrees Fahrenheit. So these things are allegedly supposed to help with like inflammation, with pain, blood flow, weight loss. They're there to help improve skin. And some claim it can even help with like aging and depression. These treatments have not been approved for medical use by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. On October 20th, 2015, a co-worker of Chelsea's noticed her car was still in the parking lot, and I guess her uncle would end up going inside to see if they could find Chelsea, because she hadn't come home the night before, she wasn't responding to texts and calls. And unfortunately, when they get inside the spa, they find Chelsea and Chelsea was deceased. They found Chelsea basically crumpled down into like a fetal position or like a ball at the bottom of the cryotherapy chamber. And she had been essentially frozen solid. The uncle used the term, she was rock solid frozen. 
And then this led to people saying that Chelsea Ake Savasian, she was frozen to death. She froze to death. That's how it happened. But that actually wasn't what happened. So the coroner would determine that she actually died of asphyxiation. She essentially suffocated to death. They would explain that normal air has about 21% oxygen. But in this instance, there was an excess amount of nitrogen released, which actually brought the level percentage of oxygen down to about 5% or even less than that. And so if she was breathing in this air, and what it would do is it would basically almost within seconds create unconsciousness in her. There was no evidence that she even tried to open the chamber or ever tried to leave it. The interesting thing is, is they found texts on her phone that stated that she believed there may be a nitrogen leak in these chambers. And that's, that's what it happened. There was a nitrogen leak, which caused that rapid decrease of oxygen to occur. Now, Chelsea did enter the cryotherapy chamber on her own, unsupervised, no one else was there. And that's not something you're supposed to do, but she did everything correct in terms of setting it all up. But she just wasn't prepared for that severe nitrogen leak. I believe these locations were closed down shortly afterwards. A man died doing laundry in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. So the story happened near London, England, and it happened back in 2011. And it happened to a 38-year-old father of two young children. So this is called a clothes horse. I had actually never knew that was its name, um, but essentially it's a drying rack for clothing. It's typically a wire or sometimes a wooden frame that can fold up for easy storage. So the man was doing laundry that particular day and near him was a stool and he had been drying, he had been putting clothing on the rack and he accidentally tripped over that stool and I think he fell backwards and he actually landed inside the clothes source. And when he did so, the, the wire rack basically, it tightened and it closed in on him. And he became essentially tangled in it. This is an image of where it happened to a woman, something kind of similar, and obviously she made it out okay. But just so you can kind of get an understanding of how it can wrap around a person's body. But when the gentleman was trying to free himself from this, what he was actually doing was inadvertently tightening the wire bars onto his body more. And it actually continued to compress and compress against his neck and his chest. Later on, they would find very deep indents in his body. And the coroner would later say that there was an immense amount of pressure put, especially on his neck, you know, in his throat area. And so unfortunately, and kind of in a scary way, he slowly suffocated, he was asphyxiated to death by something as simple and trivial as a clothing drying rack. Something that no one in a million years would ever think this kind of thing could even happen. But it did happen. The coroner in this case actually said this was extremely uncommon. He had never seen this before. That the victim, he would have said, would have had a much higher percent chance of being struck by a meteor or by lightning and dying. Than, you know, as opposed to this kind of thing happening. But I guess it goes to show that, unfortunately, we really can't take anything for granted. Can you answer 10 B1 questions in 50 seconds? I don't know. What is that? What's a B1 question? What color would you say your skin is? See-through? What's better? PlayStation or Xbox? Oh, Dreamcast. If you were an animal, what would you be? A blind lemur. What? How long does it take you to brush your teeth? Three hours, 16 minutes, 14 seconds. Do you prefer something sweet or savory for breakfast? I like it when it's sweaty, I guess. I... What's a word that's Wait. not in any of your passwords? Butthole? Have you ever been with a large group of people where you are the only person of your ethnicity? Racist. Does your wrist itch? It does now. How long do you spend on your phone every day? 26 hours. If you were a celebrity, what would your stage name be? Big Titty John. Wait. Every day. No, John's not even in my name. Hold on. Why did better. I say that? Big Titty John. I don't even know why. Okay, listen. I don't know. Police pretty much knew who killed him from the get-go, but it would take 30 years to finally get a conviction. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Cyrus Jefferson. Viewer discretion is advised.
Unfortunately, I really don't know much about Cyrus. I do know that based on a description his sister gave in a news clip I saw, Cyrus was described as a type of person who never knew a stranger, meaning that he basically was immediately friends with everyone he met, and he was just a kind soul, and his life would be ended at just 20 years old. On October 11th, 1986, in just this big open field in the city of Lemon Grove, which is in San Diego County, California, a man's body was found. This person had been stabbed numerous times, including once through his jugular. And the only piece of evidence they really had, at least that they've said out loud, is there was a glove found near his body that would eventually have the victim's DNA on it, I'm assuming blood. And many, many years later, they would find another DNA profile on it. But again, this is back in 1986. So at that time, they didn't have that information yet. So the victim was identified as 20-year-old Cyrus Jefferson. And when police began to investigate this, they found out that he had been, I guess, driving around in his car with a friend of his. His friend was named Stacy Littleton. So police knew that Stacy Littleton was with him that day. And so he immediately became a suspect. As a matter of fact, they actually arrested Stacy Littleton, whose younger photo I don't have but they had to release him because they had no information to connect him to the crime scene. They had no evidence connecting him to it. Just all they had was that he was seen driving around with them. Stacy, of course, denied having any involvement in this case. And so without evidence, they had to release him. And then the case just went cold and it stayed cold for 30 years. When the cold case team reopened this case, they recovered the glove from the evidence box, the glove that had, you know, DNA on it. And at that point, they were able to confirm that one of those DNA samples belonged to Cyrus Jefferson. Again, I'm presuming it was his blood. And then the second DNA hit on this potentially bloody glove was Stacy Littleton. His DNA was now in the system because he was a criminal, a felon. He had been convicted a few times. At the time that they found this DNA, he was in prison for illegal substance-related charges. He was a father, something Cyrus was never allowed to be. The DNA then places him back at the crime scene, so he was arrested and charged with murder. They believe that the two friends got into a fight where he stabbed him numerous times and dumped his body in the field. He was convicted and got 26 years to life. A murder, a fire, and a kidnapping and it would take six years to finally get the answers. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Daphne Boyden. Viewer discretion is advised. Daphne was born on June 27th, 1978, and she was born in Vallejo, California. And it looks like she basically just lived there her entire life. Unfortunately, I don't really know much about who she was as a person, but at the time of this case, she was the girlfriend to this man here, Lathan Williams. He was an up-and-coming rap star who had, like, basically just filmed his first rap music video, and it was soon to be released. And he and Daphne, they got pregnant. And then baby Lazon was born. And from what it looks like, you know, Daphne and Lathan were very good parents. They were super excited for, you know, this new adventure. Lathan was on this path to success. Daphne, who was still 17 years old, well, unfortunately, we would not be given the opportunity to see who Daphne would have become. Now, Daphne was living with her grandma, and on the afternoon of May 17th, 1996, two women would visit the house under the guise of wanting to see the new baby. The grandma lets them in. She doesn't know who they are, but Daphne appears to know who they are, and they're very friendly with each other. And then the grandma had to leave to go to bingo. She comes back less than two hours later. Her house is on fire, and unfortunately inside is the body of Daphne Boyden. She had been shot dead and baby Lazon was missing. These two women were the top suspects, but as to who they were, nobody seemed to know. The grandma didn't recognize them at all, and she was the only person still alive who witnessed them. There were neighbors who said they saw two women basically fleeing from the house shortly before people noticed the fire. They were spotted by at least like two or three different groups of people. And every time someone described one of the women basically holding her jacket over something, presumably the baby. Sometime shortly after, Lathan Williams, the baby's father, is shot in the head, but he actually survives. But they weren't sure if this was like connected in any way. 
but unfortunately they never had any evidence and they just had no idea who did this. And then finally in 2002, thanks to an anonymous tip, the police got the break they needed. The tip they got was that Latasha Brown, who was living just two miles away from where this happened, well, she had a child that would be the same age as Lazon, but medical records would show that she was not pregnant whatsoever, ever. She had a previous relationship with Lathan Williams. And then many people would say that she was actually jealous of the relationship that he had with Daphne. So apparently, like literally right after this murder kidnapping occurred, she would move to Texas. And then a short time after that, she moved back to the same neighborhood, essentially, where this took place. Apparently, there were people in her life that was like questioning, like, you know, where did this kid even come from? But really, nobody did anything about it until the police finally got someone to come forward anonymously to tell them, hey, I think this kid might be Lazon. So police got a warrant to search their, their house. And they were also able to take like fingerprints and DNA from this child, which would reveal that that child was, in fact, baby Lazon. And then this is Ossianetta Williams. No relation to Lathan or the baby. But the anonymous tips they got also led to her. She is the friend of Latasha. And so when police got her into custody, she basically just folded. And she would eventually agree to testify against Latasha Brown. And therefore, she would be given a lighter sentence. So she was sentenced to 13 years in prison. Dolores Brown, who was Latasha's mom, would also be arrested, and she was charged with child concealment because she knew about the identity of this child and never said a thing. And she was given a one-year sentence in prison. Latasha Brown was convicted of murder and kidnapping, and she was given a sentence of 37 years to life. Baby Lazan was reunited with his family. Unfortunately, when he was found, Lathan, his dad, was actually in prison on a 12-year sentence for a robbery, but he would be released in 2010. And then, you know, Baby Lazon was reunited now finally with all of his family. So at least in some way, shape or form, there is a very happy ending to the story. A woman is murdered in her home and her mother refused to let her murderer escape justice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Debbie Whitlock. Reviewer discretion is advised. It's March 24th, 1988, here in Modesto, California. 32-year-old Debbie was married to Harold Whitlock, and together they had a young daughter, who at the time of this case was three years old. Harold had a 17-year-old daughter from a previous marriage that would sometimes, I guess, live at the house with them. But on this particular March 24th, 1988 evening, Debbie would actually be home alone with her three-year-old daughter. Harold was going out to a bachelor party that night, and he would be back the following morning. The following morning, March 25th, at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning or so, Harold comes home and he discovers his wife has been murdered. Debbie is lying in the hallway, and she, there was blood everywhere. When the ambulance arrived, they would pronounce her dead at the scene. She had been stabbed many times. Thankfully, their three-year-old daughter was safe and sound inside of her crib. Most of the stab wounds were done to her neck. She was also sexually assaulted and they were able to confirm that this was done after she was deceased. There was really no signs of a struggle elsewhere in the house. There was no apparent forced entry. The knife that was used to kill her was found next to her body covered in her blood and that knife was from their collection at the house. So police initially said, we're looking at Harold first. He's gotta be the guy. However, they were able to corroborate his story for the most part. He was at a bachelor party that he had started to attend at 10 p.m. the following night. He said he was there all night, but it turns out that was a lie because he was actually, after the bachelor party, he went to his girlfriend's house. He was having an affair. The girlfriend did corroborate that he was there with her, however. There was DNA left behind at the scene, and eventually they would determine that that DNA did not belong to Harold. And so at a certain point, he was completely cleared of any wrongdoing. Police also discovered that Debbie as well was having an affair. They found out who her boyfriend was. They would talk to him. They would get his DNA. Again, he was cleared as well based on alibis and DNA. Debbie and Harold had recently gone through a, a pretty rocky point of their relationship. He started drinking a lot of alcohol and it put a lot of strain on their marriage. And at one point they kind of veered apart, but eventually they would end up reconciling. 
and their marriage appeared to be back on track, but they were both having an affair. Debbie's mom, Jackie, she never felt that Harold was responsible for the murder. She was insistent to police. There's no way he did it. And she fought tooth and nail and she never ever let police give up this investigation. She was determined to find out who murdered her daughter. She made sure no one forgot this story. Debbie's mom would be extremely persistent with police, making sure they were always on top of this case, making sure she basically was grilling them all the time about where they were at in the investigation. She ends up putting up uh, a reward for any information that leads to the arrest of Debbie's killer. And finally, her persistence and her desire to not let police forget about this pays off. I think she might have been instrumental in getting this case on Unsolved Mysteries as well which aired in 1995. However, it was not covering her case. It was more about a particular psychic that was brought in on her case, but it was featured nonetheless. And then in December of 1996, a man would go to police to say he thinks he knows who killed Debbie. This guy, Scott Fizell. Allegedly on the night the murder took place, Scott would tell this friend that he just committed a murder. But this acquaintance of his was actually soon arrested for, you know, other charges. And he spent nine years in jail. When he was released from prison, and this would have been about 1996 or so, he would go to police and tell them what he knew. And so police were able, at this point now in 1996, they can get a clear understanding of DNA that was left behind at the crime scene. They found... Uh, blood that was not Debbie's and uh, did not belong to the husband or the boyfriend. They also found male bodily fluid in Debbie and they took that DNA, built a profile. When they got his name, they were able to create his profile and it was a 100% match. Scott Fizell was the murderer of Debbie Whitlock. At the time of the murder, Scott was 18 years old. He lived in the same neighborhood as Debbie. He eventually moved to Arkansas after the murder where he lived until police basically tracked him down. And for some reason, they offered him a plea deal. Basically, he would be convicted of first degree murder and also burglary, but they would drop the sexual assault charges, which was not something that her mom was happy with, which I understand. And he was unbelievably only sentenced to 31 years in prison. He will still be relatively young when he is released. It was said that it's just never the same after his wife's murder, especially after finding her the way he did. Sadly, he took to drinking again, and in 2001, he had been drinking, and he drove his car off of a mountain, and he died. So, in a sense, Scott Fizell killed two people that night. And the sad part is, is he gets a chance to live his life in freedom at some point. Something he didn't give this family. He was killed in what one of the killers would describe as a satanic ritual. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Elise Paler. Viewer discretion is advised. Elise was born on April 24th, 1980 in Templeton, California. At the time of this case, she's living in Arroyo Grande, California with her parents, and she is 15 years old. It was July 22nd, 1995. Elise was supposed to be leaving Arroyo Grande High School and should have been on her way home. However, she never got home, and so her parents would report her missing. And for the next eight months, there just was nothing. They couldn't find her. They interviewed people. No one seemed to know where she was. Nothing of her belongings were found. This case just immediately started cold, and it stayed ice cold for eight months. And it was only when someone would come forward to say that they were there when she was killed. 17-year-old Royce Casey would go to police, basically stating that he was now a born-again Christian. He had converted to Christianity, and so that means he needed to come clean about what he knew. He was there with two other teenage boys when Elise Paler was brutally murdered. And to prove it, he would lead police to where her body was. And so it was confirmed. He led them right to where her body was. They had to use dental records to confirm, but this was confirmed to be the body a 15-year-old Elise Paler. Elise had been absolutely just brutally murdered. She essentially was tortured and Royce would say that this was all for a satanic ritual. The others involved were 16-year-old Jacob Delishmut and 15-year-old Joseph Fiorella. The three of them had recently started some metal band and, and one of them suggested that in order for their band to be taken seriously, they would need to offer a sacrifice to the devil. 
And so they just happened to come across Elise Paler. She was like this perfect, you know, blonde, blue-eyed girl, wholesome. She was a Christian girl. And they figured that she would be the best one for this sacrifice. You know, sacrificing a wholesome, genuinely good person would be the best thing for them. So they followed her around for weeks to understand her movements. And they finally lured her to a remote location under the promise of buying like marijuana. When they got to that location, one of them took a belt and wrapped it around her neck and began to strangle her. Then another one of the boys took out a knife and began to stab Elise in her neck. And then all three of them took turns with a knife and stabbing her about 12 times, but not deep enough to actually kill her. They wanted her to bleed out slowly and painfully. And that unfortunately is exactly what happened. They sat and watched her bleed to death. And, and that's also when they learned that Elise was sexually assaulted after she was dead. Part of this satanic thing was to commit necrophilia. And so at least one of the boys came back to her body and, and had sex with her corpse. Depending, there are some stories that said that two of them had gone back to do that and one of them did not. I will, I'll never, I'll, I'll, I'll never get it. I'll never understand it. So the three of them were arrested and they were charged with her murder. So Casey would plead no contest to first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison and he could be paroled after 21 years. Jacob would also plead no contest to first degree murder. He also got life in prison, but could not ask for parole until 26 years. And then Joseph Fiorella would also plead guilty to first degree murder and he too got life in prison with a minimum of 26 years. In 2021, Casey, Royce Casey was up for parole and the governor Newsom had denied his parole. But then the Superior Court overruled that decision and they paroled him. He apparently was a model prisoner. He actively participated in a lot of rehabilitation in prison. He got his GED. He was working towards a bachelor's degree in psychology. All of these things that Elise wasn't granted the right to do. But hey, he was allowed to, so that's great. But he is now out there in the world. Jacob and Joseph are still in prison. They have not been paroled. When the trials and everything were over with, Elisa's parents would actually end up filing a lawsuit against a metal band. I believe it's the band Slayer. The parents alleged that lyrics from some of their songs would essentially be like detailed instructions on how to sexually assault, torture, murder, etc. you know, against, you know, women. But a judge would throw out the entire thing stating that, you know, there is, well, quote, there's no legal position that could be taken that would make Slayer responsible for the girl's death. Where do you draw the line? Which is accurate. It's kind of like when people blame movies or video games for mass shootings, you know, that kind of thing. So the family once again tried to sue them for basically the same reason, but this time they stated that Slayer knowingly distributed harmful material to minors, basically stating that they were expecting minors to do this kind of thing. But again, it was tossed out. Jacob Delishmet would be quoted saying, the music is destructive, but that's not why Elise was murdered. She was murdered because Joe Fiorella was obsessed with her and obsessed with killing her. And then allegedly this murder was the inspiration to the movie Jennifer's Body. Wow, that's, that's great, you yeah. know. She was house sitting for a relative, but unfortunately she would not survive the night. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Emily Corshain. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Emily was living in Danville, California. She had actually earned her degree in physics. She was an incredibly intelligent woman. She loved characters like Xena and Wonder Woman. She loved to play softball. She always enjoyed helping her nieces and nephews out with their math homework. Many people would say that she was just getting started with her life. She had such a bright future ahead of her, but unfortunately somebody took that all away. This is the property of Emily's aunt and uncle, and it was in Contra Costa, California. It was like this huge like farmland and orchard, and it was sort of like this secluded home down this like desolate road. And Emily was actually asked to house it for her aunt and uncle while they were out of town. Actually, they were in Spain. On the morning of October 6, 2017, family and friends and coworkers had not heard from Emily and they got kind of worried. So. One of her co-workers would go out to the property where she knew she was at to check on her. When the co-worker walks in, she finds Emily and she is deceased in the master bedroom. Her cause of death was a gunshot. Someone shot her at least once. I'm not sure if it was multiple times or not. 
there was, I guess, a busted out window towards the back of the house, which appeared to be the way the person got in. There was no other source of forced entry. According to the aunt and uncle, when they got back in town, there was nothing stolen from the house, no money or anything. And so what police were basically working with was this must have been a botched robbery. The uncle believes that this was someone who knew that they were going to be out of town, but didn't know that they planned to have someone house sitting for them. So these people, whoever they may be, broke in and were probably met by Emily in a surprise and they ended up killing her and then fleeing. The night before, Emily had gone out to dinner with some friends and family. She had a great time. And then later that evening, she would call one of her nephews to do some tutoring over the phone, you know, for math. And she promised to call him the next day after work, but obviously that unfortunately never came. There was nobody in her personal life that they could discover that would want to do this to her. And there really wasn't that many people who really knew where she was at that particular evening. So ultimately what this keeps coming back to is this had to be done by someone who vaguely knew the family at least and knew they were going to be gone, but didn't know she was going to be there or assumed she may not be back in the residence at that time. But to this day, nobody knows who it is, but somebody out there has got to know the truth. If you have information about the murder of Emily Corshane, please call 925-313-2600. You can always report your information anonymously. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Fandel children disappearance. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened in Sterling, Alaska. And I guess that's about 140 miles or so south of Anchorage, a small, like remote little town, I guess. This is eight-year-old Amy and 13-year-old Scott Fandel. It was the evening of September 5th, 1978. They had gone to, I guess, a local bar with their mom and their aunt because there were video games at the bar for kids to play. Then at around 10 p.m., their mom, Margaret, and their aunt, Kathy, would drive them back to the cabin in which the family lived. Margaret and their father, Roger, had gone through a very bitter divorce and Roger had moved to Arizona. And so at the time it was just the two kids and Margaret and then Kathy had literally just moved there like that day to move into the cabin with them. Once they dropped the two kids off, Margaret and Kathy went back out to another bar. It wasn't uncommon for 13 year old Scott to babysit his eight year old sister, Amy. Next door to them was the home of the Lupton family who had five kids that the two of them would play with all the time. Now, according to the Luptons, Amy and Scott would go over to their house that night to hang out with the kids. But sometime after 11 p.m., the, the Luptons would send Amy and Scott back to their house because it was getting loud and it was time for bed. At 11.45 p.m., and no, this is not the actual cabin because the cabin has since been destroyed. But at 11.45 p.m., witnesses who drove past the Fandel cabin said that every light in the cabin was on, which was not unusual because the two kids were terrified of the dark. And so they would typically leave all the lights on to sleep. Margaret and Kathy got home around two o'clock in the morning. All the lights in the cabin at that point were off, which was kind of strange to Margaret. She also noticed that there was a pot of boiling water on the stovetop and there was an open box of macaroni and cheese and an open can of tomatoes. Something that Scott liked to do before bed was to have a, you know, some macaroni and cheese. But she didn't check on them in their room. She just assumed they were asleep or that they had gone back over to the Lupton house to spend the night. So she goes to work the next morning and then she calls the school to make sure the kids went there but the school says they hadn't showed up. She wants to leave work but her boss says, no, you can't leave. And then back at the house, Kathy notices the kids don't come home from school on the school bus. So she goes over to the Lupton house. They tell her that the two kids had gone home the night before and they never came back to their house. They didn't spend the night there. And so Kathy calls Margaret. Margaret says, screw you to the boss and she bolts and she goes back to the cabin. They can't find the kids anywhere, no sign of them. And it looked like at this point that they had probably been taken by someone while in the middle of Scott making his late night macaroni and cheese. And so 15 hours or so after they would have likely disappeared, Margaret calls police to report them missing. When the Alaska State Troopers arrived, they did find some shell casings like from bullets outside of the cabin, fairly close to it, but they didn't know if that had anything to do with wherever the kids were. They didn't notice, to my knowledge, any bullet holes like in the walls of the house or anything. There wasn't any blood, there wasn't any sign of a struggle, no doors were broken, no windows were broken. But what Margaret would tell them is that, you know, the kids would never have all the lights in the house off. And according to witnesses, like I said, at 11.45 p.m., witnesses saw lights on in the house. So by 2 a.m. when they get there, the lights are all off. So something had to have happened between 11.45 p.m. and 2 a.m. But 
to my knowledge, I have to guess that they took, you know, evidence like they dusted for fingerprints and checked all that, but probably didn't find anything. Initially, they do suspect that potentially their biological father, Roger, had something to do with this, but he was in Arizona at the time of their disappearance, and they can confirm that without a shadow of a doubt. Maybe Roger hired someone to do it. Sure, but the kids weren't in Arizona. They weren't with any of their relatives. They weren't anywhere. Roger's family starts blaming each other like Roger's brother, their uncle, would blame Roger. Roger would blame the uncle, both of which weren't in Alaska when this even happened. But over the years, police would begin to no longer suspect that Roger or anyone from his family had anything to do with the disappearance of these two kids. There was another theory that maybe someone at the first bar they were at that night overheard the fact that Margaret was taking the two kids home and that they were going to be by themselves because Margaret was going to go back out to a bar. Maybe someone took advantage of that. Maybe there was a predator at the bar that night who was looking at the kids and followed them home. Possible. They said they've had just no short list of suspects over the years, but they've never been able to actually identify anyone as being the ones who did whatever they would have done to these two kids. And by the way, if still alive today, they may look something like this. There's one theory that Amy may still be out there, but that, you know, Scott was killed the night of, that the whole thing was a thing to get Amy. But they're all just theories and speculation because really nobody knows. They couldn't find any like enemies of the family. There wasn't anyone who had been like stalking them that they were aware of. This was just a truly bizarre unsolved mystery and it's still unsolved to this day. No trace of these two kids has ever been found. They were clearly taken in the middle of the evening when Scott was making macaroni and cheese because the pot was still boiling. And now the cabin has been destroyed so they can't get any evidence from it even if they wanted to. So, if you have any information about the disappearance of the Fandel children, please contact the Alaska State Troopers at 907-262-4453. This was scripted, right? This was fixed? There's, there's no... Okay, so go back and watch Sam's video because he's definitely onto something. But hey, can us millennials, can we, can we bond over this real quick? Do we all remember the show Figure It Out, right? Figure It Out with Summer Sanders. How these kids had the stupidest talents ever. Remember how one kid's talent was he could bite cheese into the shapes of states? <sighs> and his parents were proud. Jesus, this girl collects human hair to make dolls. She was allowed to go on television with this. I suspect she's probably serving 30 to life in San Quentin. Is that a woman's prison too? No, I don't think so. This kid hangs lizards from tongue. Yeah, this is how COVID started. Ate 11 pounds of watermelon in one minute. That's not, well, I guess it is kind of talented. You know what, kid? Rock on. Fun fact, he grew up to become Jerry O'Connell. Made a ball of toe jam. Made a ball of toe jam. He dug his fingers betwixt his toes to collect that slimy goop, and he stored it in a jar. I have a feeling he may have graduated to collecting severed limbs in jars. Grows his own foot fungus, fuck. Our child should probably be in a hospital, <laughs> right? Cause he's growing his own foot. No, let's put him on national television and have people guess that he grows his own foot fungus on a giant head with words on it. What, it, what was wrong with us in the nineties? Growing a rat tail since birth? That's a weird way to flex you from Alabama. This girl's talent was dog drinks milk from her mouth. Yep. On television. <laughs> Gives pet monkeys makeovers and manicures? How do you still have your face? Owns the best dressed rat. Girl? A weird way to tell us that your sister's Lauren Bobert. This girl's talent was she holds the world record for longest name. Fuck. Rush Dent. 685 characters long. Your talent is what your parents named you? Blow on tails of armored animals? What? Girl, get out of here! How did you even, like, how did you figure that out? How did you figure out that's what you wanted to do with life? Are you still doing it now? Ugh. One kid's talent was Ben's fingers back to wrist. You're double jointed, not talented. A kid who discovered peanut shells hid the scent of pig urine. What? <laughs> A kid who sticks lobsters to his eyelids and tongue. This is why millennials are the way we are. We're, we're a pretty fucked up generation. <laughs> yeah. 
a Bible, a toilet, a helicopter crash. These are five of the craziest deaths. Viewer discretion is advised. In 1987, Franco Brunn was a 22-year-old inmate at the Metro Toronto East Detention Center in Canada. Well, one day when he was serving just a 15-day sentence, he tried to swallow a pocket-sized Gideon's Bible. It was two and a half inches by four and a half inches, and he had tried to shove the entire thing down his throat. He would be rushed to the hospital, but he would die of asphyxiation. Why he did it, it's unknown. This was Kurt Godel. He was an Austrian-American mathematician. Kurt developed a very unusual fear, a paranoia, if you will, about eating anything cooked by anyone else other than his wife. This actually became an obsessive and compulsive issue with him. But then when his wife died, he had no one to cook for him. And because he was afraid to eat food prepared by literally anyone, I guess even himself, he would end up starving to death over a long period of time. This was 28-year-old Michael Godwin. He was a criminal who was convicted of a murder, and he was sentenced initially to death, which would have been the electric chair. But then his sentence was eventually reduced to life in prison without parole. Well, in March of 1989, he was attempting to fix a broken television, I guess, in his cell. He was sitting on the metal toilet in his cell, and he took the wires of the television, and he bit into them in some way to fix them. And so he was electrocuted to death. The exact same fate he was initially supposed to get. In August of 1980, a woman living in Brazil was walking up a flight of stairs carrying a glass Pyrex dish. When she accidentally tripped on a step, the glass shattered beneath her. She fell and she pierced her throat on a giant shard of glass. She would end up severing an artery in her neck and was pronounced dead on the way to the hospital. And finally, in May of 2008, a young student in British Columbia, Canada named Isaiah was just walking down the streets in his neighborhood when all of a sudden a helicopter that was above him Something happened where it malfunctioned and it crashed. And it just so happened to land directly on top of Isaiah. He, along with the helicopter pilot and its two passengers, were all killed on impact. This is the horrifying aftermath of one of the worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. This story happened on Aloha Airlines Flight 243. It was a Boeing 737. And this particular flight had 90 passengers and 5 crew. On April 28th, 1988, at approximately 1.25 p.m., Flight 243 would depart from the Hilo International Airport in Hawaii. And it was on its way to Honolulu. Shortly afterwards, the plane is about 24,000 feet in the air. And at 1.48 p.m., there is a loud whooshing sound, as they described it. The captain said the plane just sort of rolled to the left. And the captain can recall that he turned around and he saw that the door behind him was gone. And he could see the sky from where he was sitting when he looked back to where the passengers were. This is because a huge chunk of the roof of the plane had just completely ripped off. 24,000 feet in the air. 58-year-old Clarabelle Lansing was a flight attendant. And it is reported that when the roof of the plane ripped off, Claire Bell was sucked out of the airplane, and she would fall 24,000 feet to the ocean below. I cannot imagine the horror that was going through her head, because there was nothing she could do. She didn't have a parachute. Why would she? She suddenly launched out of a plane and just free-falling, and sadly her body was never recovered. Meanwhile, the plane is going about 195 miles per hour with all of these passengers exposed to the intense winds that that would create. The engines were failing because debris had launched into them and all of the passengers, all they could do was hang on for dear life. It was a roughly 13 minute nightmare, but unbelievably, the pilots of this plane were able to safely land even though, as they're trying to land, another engine failed. They weren't even sure if the landing gear was going to work, but they did it. 
In the end, there was one fatality. It could have been significantly worse. You had 95 people on this plane, and many of them for 13 minutes had to hope they weren't just sucked out of this plane because of how fast it was traveling. 65 of them would end up having some form of injuries. Eight of them had very significant injuries, but would recover. And they determined that this was an explosive decompression, which caused the fuselage to rupture and basically blow apart. This was because of significantly poor maintenance, and there was a bunch of like fatigue cracking on the rivets of the plane. Many lawsuits were filed which would go in favor of the passengers. An accident with a fire hydrant would lead to one of the craziest, worst freak accidents. Viewer discretion is advised. It was May of 2017 in Vieira, Florida. An 89-year-old man who was celebrating his birthday that day, he was on the road driving to wherever he was going when all of a sudden something happened where he crashed and he hit a fire hydrant. So this is the damage that occurred to the vehicle. A lot of people at the scene said that, you know, the damage to the car, I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't like anything absolutely insane. But the man, when he crashed, was able to get out of the car. People saw him getting out. He was standing next to the car. The fire hydrant, it's not this actual one, but the fire hydrant was spewing water all over the place. And it was flooding that street very badly. When he hit the fire hydrant though, and it, it essentially the, it exploded, it created a five foot circular hole. And from what I understand, it was partially, the hole was partially under his car and the other half of the hole was like outside of it. Well, he fell into this hole where the fire hydrant was. The water pressure was so extreme that it actually created a whirlpool and it was a very, the, the suction of this whirlpool was very, very, very strong. It was so strong that it kept, you know, pulling the 89 year old man down under the surface and it kept spinning him. And he was underwater for four to five minutes struggling to get out. There were people who were literally trying to get him out, but that is how strong this whirlpool just so happened to be. It, they, it was, it was impossible. Like they were trying, but they couldn't get him out. One of the citizens who was there trying to get him out, well, he said he was like this, you know, 200 pound man, six foot, whatever. And he said the pressure was so strong, it was basically pulling him in. So rescuers arrived within, I guess, four or five minutes of all of this happening. And they were trying to get him out and they were really struggling. And finally, they were finally able, once the water pressure began to calm down, they were finally able to pull him out. But unfortunately, the man would die on his way to the hospital. He was drowning for a good five minutes. It's it's insane to me because it just all happened with him. I'm not sure what caused the crash, but he crashed into the fire hydrant. And again, the damage wasn't like horrific. The people who saw him when he got out of the car, everyone said he seemed normal, he seemed okay. And so he was going to be fine, but then he fell into that hole. It's insane like how deep the hole was as well. And just like the pressure, it's just, it, this is a, it's crazy. I was not aware that things like this can happen. He basically fell into a sinkhole, a sinkhole slash whirlpool. No one would ever think this kind of thing would happen. Hi, so someone asked me if I could show my entire pop collection. I made two videos recently, but I figured I'll do one video because I got a new one today that I'm totally nerding about. Ignore the dust. So we got John Hammond from Jurassic Park with the Jurassic Park door. We got Chucky. We got ourselves a claptrap. We got a Damon Targaryen. We got Medicine Bobblehead from Fallout, the video game, a favorite video game of all time. We got Hedwig, the owl, Harry Potter. We got Arya Stark, Freddy Krueger, Michael Myers, the Night King. He doesn't talk at all. Uh, Gandalf, Snape, Demogorgon, right above Hopper, Fernando Tatis Jr., baseball player, Pirates of the Caribbean dog. Tyrion Lannister, and we got ourselves a Jason Voorhees next to the gay gnome. Don't you fuck, don't you do it. I swear to God, if you hate crime him, you dumb mother... F then we got Dino DNA, Mr. DNA from Jurassic Park. Manny Machado, another baseball player. We got Dusmo from... Is that his voice? I know how he Mandel does his voice. Uh, from uh, Gremlins, the hottest video game character of all time, Cal Kestis. The hottest guy named Steve Harrington of all time, 
uh, Steve Harrington. Then we got Squid Game's bad guy. Then we got Yoda, I am. Then we got Leprechaun. I don't sound like this at all. Then we got uh, what I thought was going to be an actual green Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, but it turns out they forgot to color mine, I guess. So, but that's fine. Then we got Pennywise the Dancing Clown. Just below, Fatso the Clown from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. If you've never seen it, then you haven't lived. Then we got Steve Urkel and I do that. Ha ha, I'm a queer Mickey Mouse. Ha ha, this should ruffle some feathers. I discovered recently that I like to take it right up the... B Darth Vader. Then we got, oops, kind of weird there. Got Elliot and E.T. Then we got this cuckoo, cuckoo, biatch, Daenerys Targaryen, one of the coolest characters of all time. And uh, until the very end, sitting on the Iron Throne, something she never got to rule from because she turned into a crazy psycho then we got Genie from Aladdin. And then my newest one I got today. It's a mini one. That's the only one I could find. And I so nerded out when I saw it. I'm coming out today as a Battlestar Galactica freak fan. Love it. I got a little Cylon Commander. I only liked the, the new one. I've never seen the original one. I'm talking like the Edward James Olmos one. All right. Brilliant show. Absolutely amazing. One of my top three favorite shows of all time. If you've never seen it, it's a must watch. Battlestar Galactica. It's like, what, four or five seasons long. You don't think it's going to be brilliant, but it's brilliant. People say, oh, it's like Star Trek. It's nothing like Star Trek at all. Watch it. All right. Or Cylon will fracking frack you up the fracking butt. Oh, I like that a lot. <laughs> I just wanted to report, last week, this guy knocked on my door. When I asked who was it, he just went to rambling off about something he had to show me. I said, no, I'm not interested. And he said, oh, just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. You know, and he just stood there begging mm -hmm. for me to open my door. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Glenda Furch. Viewer discretion is advised. Glenda Gail Furch was born on June 7th, 1956 in Fort Worth, Texas. Glenda absolutely loved her family. Her family was the entire world to her. She had two daughters who would then eventually give her a few grandkids, and she was the absolute best grandmother a child could ask for. She pampered and loved these kids like no other. Religion and faith also played a humongous role in her life, and she would almost never miss church. If she ever did miss church, she was known to actually call the pastor later and apologize for not showing up. And at the time of the story, Glenda was working at the General Motors assembly plant, also in Fort Worth, Texas. It was the very early morning hours of September 28, 2007. Glenda was last seen leaving her job sometime around midnight or so. And that would be the last time anyone ever saw her again. By October 1st, 2007, her family hadn't heard from her. She did not show up for church and she did not call the pastor. And then her coworkers said she hadn't come into work. So one of her daughters uh, who had a key to her apartment would go to her apartment, knock on the door, call out her name, but no one answered. So she used her key to enter the apartment. She called out her mom's name. She didn't get a response. She did like a, a cursory check of the apartment, didn't see anything. Her car wasn't in the, in the parking lot. So she just assumed, okay, she went out of town and just didn't tell anyone. But the daughters still felt uneasy, and so they would end up calling police to say something felt off about this. And so police would then go to Glenda's apartment. Somebody lets them inside, and they do a walkthrough of the apartment, and everything seems pretty normal. Nothing is in disarray. There is no sign of any kind of struggle. There's no blood anywhere. There's no, there's nothing, no mess or anything. As a matter of fact, the apartment looked pretty immaculate. Everything. I mean, the, everything, the bed was made, the counters were cleaned, the carpets appeared to have been vacuumed, and there was also a really, really big smell of bleach. And so when Glenda's daughter talks to police, she says there was definitely not a smell of bleach when I walked into the apartment the other day. Which would mean that someone entered the apartment after Glenda's daughter did to further clean up the apartment. When police go through and they check everything, they adjust everything for fingerprints your likely sources, like your water faucets, your door handles, nothing. They found like one or two fingerprints and they were Glenda's. So it became very clear that someone very thoroughly cleaned this apartment, wiped down every surface possible. They vacuumed and bleached the floors. The police found no trace of foul play. The next thing they do is they go ahead and they check the dumpster to see if by chance anything is in there. And as they're searching, they find a couple of trash bags. And in those trash bags, they find evidence like receipts that prove that those trash bags came from Glenda's apartment. 
it showed, one of the receipts showed that she had gotten gas the night that she would have gone missing after work. And then she definitely got back inside the house to throw away that receipt. Well, in those bags, they find cleaning products, towels, and most of these containers are just empty. They find like rugs from her apartment that were thrown away. They find just a bunch more cleaning products and another one, including they find a big jug of empty bleach. They also find a cord that had been tied up. It looked like it was used to possibly bind someone with. They also found duct tape. They found a, a crumpled up duct tape, duct tape. Then they found the roll as well. That roll of duct tape on the inside did have a fingerprint. It did not match Glenda's fingerprints. They had her fingerprints on file because she had actually filled out an application to get a gun, which the gun from her apartment was missing. But this further showed that someone was in her apartment and cleaning the living Christ out of that place to eliminate any sign of themselves from being in there. I guess on the rug, they did find some of a small, tiny little bit of DNA that again, did not belong to Glenda. The fingerprint and the DNA at this, at this point did not match anyone though. Witnesses in the apartment complex would state that on the night that she would have gone missing, there was a black male observed going to and from her vehicle and also to and from the dumpster, throwing trash bags away. This person was seen by at least three different witnesses who all came forward to police. Her car was still missing as well. And at that point, they're like, well, there's a chance that she may be out there somewhere, possibly. Until they found her car. It had been completely burnt out. Glenda was not inside the vehicle, but any kind of evidence that may have been inside of it, completely incinerated. On October 29th, 2007, a man had stolen a car and then got himself in a high-speed pursuit with the police. That police ended with him being flipped over and he was arrested. The man in the vehicle was Rodney Eugene Owens. So while he's being processed for all of those charges and whatnot, he's being fingerprinted as well, they learn that he actually lived in the same apartment complex. As a matter of fact, lived across the way from Glenda. And he had a long list of criminal offenses. None of them were violent. They were all like petty crimes, you know, theft, uh, illegal substances. But they would end up running his fingerprint against the one on the duct tape. And it was a match. The small little bit of DNA found on the rug that was confirmed to be from Glenda's apartment because it was in the trash bag confirmed to come from her apartment, that DNA matched his DNA. He had denied ever being in her apartment or even knowing her, but now his DNA and his fingerprint were found to be in her apartment at some point. He had ample opportunities to observe Glenda from his apartment or where he lived at with a relative to kind of see her normal day-to-day -day movements. And it's believed he was just looking for money and maybe he planned to rob her and that he probably already broke into her apartment or was waiting just outside of it for her to get in when he then accosted her. He likely would bind her with the duct tape and the electrical cord, which by the way, they found electrical cord uh, somewhere on one of his, his property. But that electrical cord was tied up the exact same way that the electrical cord from her garbage bag was tied up. But police at that point, they don't really know what would have happened after that because Glenda's body has never been found. She's never been located. Oddly enough, they did find the body of a female during this investigation, but it was not hers. So they don't know how she was killed. They don't know if she was shot or stabbed, strangled or what. And I mean, you can't even 100% say she's definitely dead. However, they were still able to arrest Rodney Owens and charge him with murder. And they would go through a no body murder trial. By the way, I forgot to mention that the phone call I played at the beginning of the video was actually one that Glenda made, I guess a week or two before this whole thing took place about some guy stranger who knocked on her door and there was belief that maybe this guy, you know, Rodney, had come to her house before and tried to weasel his way in and maybe she turned him, obviously turned him away and maybe he responded by doing whatever he did to her. There was also a string of burglaries going around that time and they think that maybe that could have been linked to this and maybe she just got unlucky with a second person. But honestly, they don't really know for sure. But it could have very easily been Rodney and that makes this even more terrifying. Rodney's defense really didn't put up much of a fight, which let's be real, I mean, that's unfair to him because he's supposed to have a fair trial, but I guess they called no witnesses at all. They weighed heavily on the fact that her body was never found. That's really all they argued. Well, she's not here, her body's not here. He couldn't have killed her because we don't have her body. So how do we even know that? Which to be fair, sure. Yeah, that's a, a valid question. But we're talking about a loving mother and grandma who was heavily involved with her family and she would never leave her family like that. 
Her car was found burnt to a crisp. Somebody thoroughly cleaned her apartment, and it wasn't her. His fingerprint, his DNA, found essentially in her apartment. It's obvious what happened. And so the jury would find him guilty. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. They offered him less time if he would just reveal where her body is, but he won't do it. He would later be sentenced to another 99 years for unrelated charges. If you by chance have any information about the whereabouts of Glenda Furch's remains, please contact the Fort Worth, Texas Police Department. You can always report it anonymously, but her family deserves to have her back home. Scratch to see if you get a golden ticket. Oh my God, I got a golden ticket. Does that mean I get to meet Timothy Chalamet now or what? True Crimeers, this is the case of Holly Crewson. Viewer discretion is advised. Holly was born on August 27, 1971 in La Mesa, California. Starting from a very early age, Holly had this passion to maybe one day become a movie actress. She also participated in beauty pageants as a child and she loved it. And she would love to like dance at these pageants. Sadly, uh, several years later, a family friend of theirs would actually molest her. And, and that was obviously very traumatic for her. And then her parents got divorced. Then she got into a relationship with a man named Jack Sutton, and he was abusive. Jack had actually been arrested on three different occasions at least because he was beating Holly. But sadly, again, in situations with domestic violence and domestic abuse, it's very, very difficult to leave. And so Holly kind of always came back to Jack. Holly seemed to become more distant from her family. She started seeing her parents less and less. The last time that her mom would see her was in February of 1995. She visited her dad on March 4th, 1995, and that would be the last time he would ever see her again. Several weeks would go by and Holly's mom was becoming concerned because she hadn't heard from Holly. And so she tried calling her, but she didn't answer. So she tried calling um, Holly's friends and Holly's friends were like, well, we also haven't heard from her either in quite some time. So at that point, Holly's mom, Gwen, calls police to report her missing. But of course, police were like, well, she's like, what, 23 years old? She's an adult. Adults are allowed to go missing. It's not a crime. You know, the usual spiel that you hear a lot. The old uh, just wait and see routine. But after two years goes by and they haven't seen or heard from Holly, you know, police are now saying, hmm, maybe we should really look into this. Gee, thanks. So they would really look at her abusive boyfriend, Jack, and he denied having anything to do with her disappearance. He took a polygraph test, which he passed, but he did have an extensive criminal record, especially involved with literally beating Holly. So they've always kept an eye on him. So the news is running the story, of course, and it catches the attention of a particular woman. And uh, I guess they called her Joyce, and uh, she was a psychic. She went to Holly's mom and said, I've had visions about where your daughter is. She's in, I'm seeing her in a hospital. She's in a hospital gown, laying in a bed. She says that in these visions, she pictured Holly fleeing the, the area to get away from Jack. And that Holly, through this, had gotten into a drunk driving accident she even said, I think she's in a hospital in these particular areas. So the mom goes to one of these hospitals to ask. However, Gwen is quickly deterred because the hospitals and the police inform her that because Holly was over the age of 21, they weren't allowed to just release any kind of hospital records. So it got to kind of a dead end because they couldn't confirm or deny her being in, a, in that hospital ever. Three months after this, Gwen receives a phone call from a woman. Gwen says the woman identifies herself as Holly. She's heard crying. And at, at a point in the conversation, Gwen has a tape recorder and she records the conversation. So what you're about to hear is the actual recorded conversation that Gwen had with this person. Holly, I love you. Talk to me. This is your mom. Hey. 
Gwen is then filled with so much hope. Oh my God, Holly is alive and she's out there. She's in Ohio. Investigators dig deep into this call. It was a hoax. It was a prank call from a woman in Canada. It was not Holly. And this is why I hate the human race. <laughs> So as police are investigating Jack and having any potential involvement in whatever happened to Holly, they come across other witnesses who would state they saw Holly with Jack at the Pinesanita campground in 1995. And this would have been about two or three months after Holly was last seen by her own family. So according to this witness, Jack became belligerent because he was drunk and he began waving a gun around. Jack threatened to shoot the witness who was telling the story to police. And the witness swears that the woman who was there was Holly. So did something happen to Holly then? Back in 1996, off of State Route 79, and this is in an area kind of near San Diego, skeletal remains are found. However, they are not identified until 2006. They are identified as that of Holly Cruson. Police have not stated how she died. They've only stated that this is now a homicide investigation. What makes this so much worse is that Gwen Crewson died in 2003. This is three years before they revealed that the remains were Holly's. She died thinking that her daughter was still alive and she never got to find out the truth. Most people believe that Jack is responsible for Holly's murder, but they don't have evidence to corroborate that. And they are hoping that someone somewhere out there knows what happened to Holly and that person would come forward. If you have information about this case, please contact the law enforcement in San Diego County. 30 years ago, she was kidnapped and murdered, and they're still trying to figure out who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Holly Perenin. Viewer discretion is advised. Holly Kristen Perenin was born on January 19th, 1983, and she also had a little brother. It was August 5th, 1993, in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Holly and her family were visiting her grandma here at this home. Now, sometime earlier that morning, Holly and her brother had gone to a nearby house because I guess they heard there were some new puppies there and they wanted to go see them. Her brother ends up coming home, but Holly, pictured here with her dad, does not come back home. The last time her dad can recall seeing her was at about 11.45 a.m. And when she doesn't come home, they immediately start searching for her. And they report her missing to police. Police get involved very quickly and it's all hands on deck. They're all searching for the 10-year-old. They had volunteers going through just all the wooded areas. They had people searching on foot. They had people searching in the air. But they came up with nothing. They had no sign of her anywhere. Her parents go on the news begging whoever may have taken her to please bring her home safe. But sadly, that would not happen. It was October 23rd, 1993 in Brimfield, Massachusetts, here in this exact area, the remains of a young girl were found. They would be positively identified as that of 10-year-old Holly Perenin. And it was ruled a homicide. Several years later in 2000, Molly Bish disappears. She was a lifeguard who vanished. She was also a teenager. I covered her case over on my YouTube channel. Her body was eventually found in a wooded area. And, and there was a time where police actually thought those two cases may be connected. As a matter of fact, Molly Bish wrote a letter to Holly's parents years prior saying they hope that they find her safe. But then police would eventually say that the two cases were likely not connected at all. There was one suspect at one point. His name was David Poliat. Allegedly, there was physical evidence found near Holly's body that had evidence on it that linked back to him. However, he was never actually charged in connection with her death. And he would end up dying. And so he'll never face justice if he is the guy. And then someone else let it leak that the police had exhumed another person's body because that body may have had a letter on it. It was buried with a letter that may have had some mention of Holly's case. But when they dug up the grave, that item was waterlogged. It was completely destroyed. 30 years later, her parents are still wondering what happened to Holly. Someone out there knows the truth and maybe that person is you. If you have information about this case, please call 413-426-3507. All right, let's see how many years I have left. That's a shame.
She would set out to backpack in Northern Ireland, but unfortunately she would meet a very violent end. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Inga Maria Hauser. Viewer discretion is advised. Inga was born on May 28th, 1969 in Munich, Germany. At the time of this story, she was an 18 year old student in Munich. She was someone who was described as having a very intrepid spirit. She was very adventurous. She loved to explore. She had ambitions of one day becoming a singer, and she was a really good artist. She also loved to do things like backpacking, and that is what she was doing at the time of this case. In March of 1988, she would leave Munich to go backpacking across England, and then she went to Scotland. On April 6, 1988, Inga would board a ferry from Scotland, which would take her to Northern Ireland. She then arrived at the dock in Larn in Northern Ireland, where she was seen getting off and then she was never seen alive again. Inga kept a diary with her, a journal. She would write in it every single day. Now, later on, when they find her journal, she they noticed that the last diary entry was from when she was in Scotland. There would be no journal entries and no photos taken from when she got to Ireland. So people believe that she never even had a chance to do any exploring when she arrived, that she must have met with foul play almost immediately after docking in Ireland. When no one had heard from her, including her family, they would report her missing. And for the next two weeks, they are desperately searching for her. But then on April 20th, 1988, the 18-year-old girl was found. Her nude body had been found face down. And this was at Ballypatrick Forest in the town of Ballycastle. She had been beaten to death and sexually assaulted. And then they just left her body there. Near her body was her backpack and all of her belongings. Nothing was stolen. So police would try to find every person who was on that ferry with her when they landed in Ireland. There were about 442 passengers, but they were not able to track down all of them. They tracked down a lot and they were eventually all questioned. Some people would witness that she was talking to a man on the ferry, but they didn't know who it was. There was speculation that when she got off the ferry that she may have accepted a ride from a stranger, which is something very unusual for her, but that's all very speculative. They don't have any concrete evidence of any of it. There was DNA left behind on her body that did not belong to her. So they would actually get over 2,000 people to volunteer their DNA to match against that DNA. And they never found a match. And to this very day, they've never found a match. As recently as 2018, they had arrested two people, a man and a woman, in connection with this case. However, charges were never placed. Allegedly, there just wasn't any evidence to go forward with charging these two people. And I don't think their names have ever been released. So police believed that the man was the one to likely have killed her, and then the woman that they had arrested helped that man cover up the crime. But like I said, they, they didn't have any, anything to really place against them to make those charges stick. I'm assuming they've run the DNA as well, and I'm assuming it hasn't matched. By 2019, they would place this memorial there in the location where she was found, and police are still asking for the public's help in trying to solve this murder. The local investigators believe that this was done by someone local to the area and that the people who live there locally know who did this or have an idea, and they just need those people to come forward. You can always report information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. And Inga deserves justice like every other victim out there. And if you have the information key to getting that justice for her, you need to go to the authorities immediately. Her family has been able to lay her to rest, but they don't have that final part of the puzzle to get peace in all of this. So if you have information about who murdered Inga Maria Hauser in Northern Ireland, please contact the local authorities and tell them what you know. He vanished in 1991, but his family thinks that the reality is he was never really missing at all. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of James Hendrickson. Viewer discretion is advised. James, pictured here in the middle with some family members, he was born on May 15th, 1979, and he lived in Tucson, Arizona, and he had an older sister. His sister Tammy says that James was someone who loved to joke around and make people laugh, and that it was never a dull moment whenever James was around. He had a lot of friends, and he was just a really good kid. But on June 12th, 1991, in Tucson, Arizona, James seemed to just vanish. James's sister Tammy and his mom had gone out of town, and James elected to stay back home. So he would go to a babysitter's house, and that's where he went on June 11th, 1991. 
for whatever reason, the babysitter would allow James and I guess the four-year-old nephew of the babysitter to go over to her cousin's house, the babysitter's cousin's house, to spend the night. According to the babysitter's cousin, the house that James was at, James left that morning and decided to walk home. But he never got home, and he was never seen again. I believe the babysitter would report him missing, and then his mom and sister wouldn't find out until sometime afterwards because they were out of town. They only found out when they tried to call back home. So they would rush back to Tucson. The police were like, ah, he's just a runaway. He's 12 years old. It's fine, he'll be back. But James had never run away before. He had never done anything like this before ever. He also had nothing with him. He was 12. And days and days and days go by and he still hasn't come home. From what I understand, it, it looks like the police took almost a year to actually change this to an endangered missing person case. Now, allegedly, the police would kind of focus on the cousin, and this is the house that James was last seen in. The babysitter's cousin was someone who had a criminal history and was quite a shady character. The four-year-old boy who was there with James said he knows where James was taken. He said he was taken to Mexico. With permission from the boy's parents, he would actually take them to this park, which I guess is right by the Santa Cruz River, and he said that's where those men took him. They wrapped him in a blanket, and they took him to Mexico. Now again, this is a four-year-old child, so it's kind of hard to gauge how truthful it is. But then again, why would a four-year-old even know to lie about this kind of thing? So the cousin, and I guess another acquaintance of the cousin, would end up taking a polygraph test, and they both failed on, like, every question related to James disappearing. But despite them failing the polygraph tests, the police found absolutely, apparently, no evidence to actually show that they did anything to James. 25 or so years after he disappeared, his sister, who's now an adult, managed to get a hold of the police file. It's like an inch thick about with full of like interviews and whatnot. And based on most of the things that she saw in there, she believes that James was never ever missing. James never disappeared. He wasn't kidnapped. They believe that James was killed that night and he was disposed of. And it's just a matter of finding out who exactly did it, why they did it, because if it was the cousin, what what, they, what motive would there have been? And I don't know if maybe they have come up with a motive, but they just can't say it. Maybe it was an accidental thing. Maybe James saw something he wasn't supposed to see. Could be a number of things. But that was the last place he was seen. And it was the babysitter's cousin is the last person he was basically seen with or in the care of. So it really does sound like that's probably your, that's your person. But you have to be able to prove it. If by chance... James was not killed, and he is possibly still out there. He may look something similar to this. Unfortunately, they just don't have enough evidence to arrest anyone or charge anyone, so they're still asking for the public's help in trying to solve this. One, to find where James is, and two, to get justice for him. If you have any information about the disappearance and possible murder of James Hendrickson from Tucson, Arizona, please call 1-520-791-5159. You can also contact 88CRIME or 1-800-THE-LOST. You can always report your information anonymously. Please help this family get the justice they all rightfully deserve. This is a horrific story, and it does involve a child. So, just a heads up. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jamie Rose Bolin. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Jamie Rose Bolin was born on August 7th, 1995 in Edmond, Oklahoma. She was one of four kids. She had two sisters and a brother. At the time of this story, Jamie was a fifth grade student at Purcell Intermediate School. She enjoyed singing. She loved riding four-wheelers. She loved sewing and she loved watching movies. But unfortunately, her life would end at 10 years old. It was April 12th, 2006. Jamie got home from school that day and then she wanted to take her bike out and ride around the neighborhood, something she did all the time. Jamie would never be seen alive again. She never came home. So a search would obviously begin, and on April 14th, uh, this man here, Kevin Ray Underwood, well, he would help with the search, but for some reason he was giving bad vibes to the police officers. Something seemed suspicious about him. So police brought him in for questioning, and he basically admitted that, yeah, he saw Jamie that day. He told police in this interview how he fantasized about butchering people because his dad was a butcher. His online history was frightening. 
He was searching how to butcher people. He was searching about cannibalism. On one like public blog, he posed the question, if you were a cannibal, what would you wear to dinner? He then answers his own question by saying, the skin of last night's main course. Police were able to obtain a warrant to search his apartment. When they told him they were doing that, he just said to them, go ahead and arrest me then. She is in there and I chopped her up. He then said to police, I'm gonna burn in hell for what I did. When they get inside his apartment, they find a large bin and they open it and uh, they find Jamie. Her body was completely mutilated. There were clear attempts to dismember this child. There was an attempt to decapitate her. They found skewers uh, near where she was and police believe that he was trying to use those in order to cannibalize her. He would then go on to admit what he did. He had planned to kidnap an older woman and a five-year-old boy, but ended up taking her instead. When he brought her back to his apartment, uh, he hit her, where he says he then tells her, I'm sorry, and she then begs for her life. He would end up asphyxiating her, and then he sexually assaulted her uh, dead body. And it sounds like he did that more than once. He told police he wanted to cannibalize her. He wanted to eat her. He says he couldn't do it but he just had those urges and that's why he did this. He kept apologizing to police and he kept uh, basically saying how disgusted he was in himself and how he found himself gross for doing what he did. They, they discovered that the plan was to kidnap, sexually assault them, torture them, kill them, cut off their head, drain the body of blood, sexually assault the corpse, eat the corpse, and dispose of the organs and bones. That was his list. That was his plan. And this poor 10-year-old girl was the unfortunate random target. He didn't know her. She knew him. She trusted him. He managed to lure her inside of his apartment because she knew him and she thought he was a friendly guy because everyone in the, in the entire apartment complex said he was friendly. So he used that to his advantage. So he was charged with first-degree murder and kidnapping, and in February of 2008, he was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to death. He was actually scheduled to be executed on December 7th, 2023. I'm filming this on December 3rd. But um, as of just a couple, like a week or so ago, uh, they halted his execution temporarily. He had tried to appeal because he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome after he was convicted. And so there is this attempt to stop the execution from happening. But honestly, for what he did to her, I hope, I hope it goes through. A person like that just doesn't deserve life. She did. She did. One moment he was there, and the next he was gone forever. Hello, true crimeers. This is the disappearance of Jeremy Grice. Viewer discretion is advised. Jeremy Grice was born on May 12th, 1981. And at the time of this case, he's living in North Augusta, South Carolina and he is only four years old. And on the morning of November 22nd, 1985, he would vanish forever. Jeremy lived with his mom and his stepdad in a trailer with his seven month old sister. Uh, his biological father lived in the area, just, you know, not with them, obviously. That November 22nd morning, Jeremy's mom had gotten home from work about one o'clock in the morning, and then she pretty much immediately went to bed. She then wakes up around 7 a.m. to make coffee for, you know, Jeremy's stepdad. And as she's doing that, she walks down the hall, she peeks in on the seven-month-old, sees the baby is sleeping, and then she pokes her head into Jeremy's room and sees basically his bed with the covers all the way up, which she just assumed he was under the covers at that point because he always slept that way. So after she makes coffee and gets it ready, she goes back to bed. And then she wakes up at about 10 o'clock in the morning because the baby is crying. When she does that is when she realizes that Jeremy is not actually in his bed. He's not in his room, he's not in the house. He's not even outside the house. So she immediately calls police and reports that Jeremy is missing. A couple of things stuck out to Jeremy's mom. Uh, one was that his favorite jacket was still in his room and his shoes were still in his room and he would wear that jacket everywhere. And so she realized that he is out there without his jacket and without his shoes. They also had their family dog, which was always by Jeremy's side, no matter what. But the dog was still at home. 
A neighbor would then come forward to police to state that at 845 that morning, he saw Jeremy standing by their family's, you know, mailbox. And his little dog was right there with him. He also noted that he had his bicycle, but the bicycle was still at the house. And it looked like Jeremy was waiting for, like, the school bus, but there was no school that day. But they didn't get any other information other than that. So they conducted numerous searches throughout the area. This is Jeremy's biological father. They had drained two different ponds in the area searching for him, but they never found him. Jeremy was there, and then he was gone. And there has been no trace of him ever found. No clothing, no physical evidence, no blood, nothing. It's been 38 years, and I believe they do presume that he is probably deceased, but may look like this today. If you have any information, please call 803-642-1761. A young man was found stabbed to death on a trail, and police are still wondering who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of John Schmutzer. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, John was 24 years old, and he was working as a commercial banking analyst. In 2018, he had graduated from UW-Madison. It was just something he really loved doing. John was someone who loved animals. He loved to drink a glass of wine. He loved traveling. He loved classical music. And he was just someone that just everybody loved. This is Devil's Lake Park, and it is located in Sauk County, Wisconsin. From what I understand, this is a place that John would go to to jog like a lot of people did. On the morning of October 14th, 2020, some joggers near the CCC Trail, well, they saw a man kind of running very frantically away, and he kept, like, falling down, and he it just seemed very out of sorts, not like a normal jogger, but this was someone who was running from something. When those witnesses kept going further, well, they found something. It was a body lying on the ground just in a pool of blood. So the police and the sheriff's office were called, and when they arrived, this individual was pronounced dead at the scene. And they had been stabbed a couple of times. The individual would be identified as 24-year-old John Schmutzer. So the assumption is that this other person that these witnesses saw running away frantically may have been the person who stabbed John. But they also aren't sure but I believe there were like 15 or so different witnesses who all saw this individual running away from the general area where John was found. This killing appeared to be random. Like they don't really know the motives behind it. And there really just isn't much more information about this case. From what I understand, they have very little evidence. They had released an image of these three people here. They are not suspects in this. But they believe, police believe, that these three may be witnesses to what may have happened shortly after this murder took place. They may have seen something that they didn't really realize was anything, but they may have information. I mean, someone just jumped out of the bushes, it seemed like, and just stabbed this young guy for seemingly no reason. And that's kind of why authorities believe that this person may be a mentally unstable. A danger not only to others, but also themselves and they are just desperate for any information that may help find this killer. And somebody somewhere out there has to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the murder of John Schmutzer, please call 1-888-847-7285. A woman was killed in her apartment because the killers went to the wrong place. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Jonelle Melton. Viewer discretion is advised. Jonelle was born on July 17, 1976, and she was living in Neptune City, New Jersey. In 2003, Jonelle would marry uh, Michael Melton here, and the two of them began working at the same school. They were both working at Red Bank Middle School in Red Bank, New Jersey. Jonelle was a history teacher. She absolutely loved history, and her students would say that she always gave like the best lessons to make them absolutely engaged in learning it as well. She got them to love history just as much as she did. All the students just said that she was just the best teacher. She was sweet, she was kind, she was caring, and she, she really cared about her students. Which is why it was so strange on one particular morning when she didn't show up to teach. Now, shortly before all of this, at some point, uh, Michael had actually filed for divorce um, against Jonelle. 
The two of them remained very cordial, and it was clear that they both still had feelings for one another. But in terms of marriage, it just wasn't working out. So on September 14th, 2009, when Jonelle didn't show up for work, the school would call him asking if he could check on her. So he goes to the apartments that she's living in now on her own, the Brighton Arms Apartments. He sees that her car is still parked there, and when he gets to the apartment she lives in, um, he can basically just open the door because it's unlocked. He calls out her name inside the apartment, looks okay, but then when he gets to her bedroom, he finds Jonelle. She was lying on the floor and he presumed unconscious. So he called an ambulance right away, but when they got there, they would pronounce her dead. Jonelle had been beaten and she had a gunshot wound through her head. She was still wearing her nightgown, so it's presumed that this happened probably sometime in the middle of the night or very, very early morning. Police discovered that whoever did this entered through her kitchen window because it had been forced open and they found a shoe impression on the countertop. The shoe impression, by the way, did not match any shoes that belonged to Michael. Michael, of course, was considered the first suspect. He gave them an alibi, which was confirmed and corroborated. He willingly provided his DNA. He gave them everything that they needed. And eventually, they basically said that based on the alibi witness and based on his cell phone usage, he was nowhere even close to Jonelle's apartment during the time when she was probably killed. And so the police were like, well, we don't really think it's him. However, the public and Jonelle's family, they all felt it was him. Has to be him, right? He's the soon-to-be ex-husband. And the school he worked at at the time said, all right, we're going to have to basically not let you teach here anymore. They said, well, you can have a desk job until this investigation's over with, but presumably you may be a killer. Again, even though police have basically already stated, we don't really think it's him, but court of public opinion, you know. And so Michael had to fight tooth and nail for justice for Jonelle and to clear his name. That's when they, the police did come out and say that there was a piece of duct tape found at the crime scene that they believed had at one point been used to bind Jonelle to a chair. That duct tape had DNA on it. That DNA was actually Michael Melton's. Well, he had told them initially when they found the duct tape, he said, that duct tape had been stuck to my shoe when I found her. And so I, with my hand, I took it off, which would explain why the DNA was on there. There was other evidence at the crime scene that also had DNA on it that was not his or Jonelle's. So Michael is basically reaching out to a lawyer and he's getting people to help him investigate this. And he finds out that there is an informant. The informant said that it was, there was gang members involved in this and that's who did this, that they mistook her for being somebody else. Michael found out that the killers were actually looking for someone named David Munch, who was supposedly had $15,000 in, in a freezer in his apartment. And so when police were able to plug the DNA of other items into the system, it actually came back as a match to one of those people, one of those men who was rumored to be involved in this, a man named Gregory John Baptiste. He had been in jail at the time when this information came out. Initially, he denied having anything to do with it. But then as police kept digging into this, they found another informant, a fourth person who was involved, a woman who was actually their getaway driver. And eventually she comes forward to admit that she was in fact the getaway driver and she drove these three men to that apartment, not knowing what they were planning on doing, but they had killed someone when they got back to the car. You have Ebenezer, Ebenezer, Bird, Gregory Jean Baptiste, and then Jerry Spaulding. So this informant, the getaway driver, would say that, you know, she eventually found out that they heard that there was $15,000 in a freezer by this David Munch person, and they got information about where the person lived, and it turns out they went into the wrong apartment. They assumed at the time when they got inside that Jonelle was actually the girlfriend to David Munch, and that he just wasn't there, and so they had tied her to a chair and beat her for information. But they never got the information they wanted because they realized we're in the wrong place. And so they shot her in the head because she could identify them and they also never got their money from the other apartment. They also found out a fourth person was involved. His name is James Fair, but he was already serving 82 years in prison for something unrelated. The getaway driver was sentenced to time served, and all three of them got life in prison without the possibility of parole. And I really hope Michael got a lot of apologies, and he fought hard to get Jonelle justice. 911, what's your emergency? I just killed my children. Excuse me? I just killed my children. Where are you? Um, I'm in the abandoned house on Highway 77 right after you go underneath the highway. One of them's still alive. Hurry. How? Under what highway? You're on Highway 77 where? I'm on Highway 77 right after you go under 35 going towards Milford. Get an ambulance out here to save the one that didn't, uh, come on. Hurry up. What's your name? 
Bitch, call him. Have you already called him? Yes, ma'am, I have. Okay. I need your name. I want to say your name. Hello? Hello. Are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Are you in your car? No, I'm not in my car. I'm in the house walking around. And um, whatever's still alive, for real, she's asking to be saved, and I couldn't handle that. And so now she, she's, she's in an abandoned house. It's that been a long time. She might already die because so she's let out a lot. And hold on. What, baby? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kelsey and Kirsten Jeter. Viewer discretion is advised. Picture it here in the middle is Deborah Janelle Jeter. She was the voice on that 911 call. She was born at some point in the 70s. She would go on to eventually meet a man named Lester Jeter. The two of them got married and would end up having two girls together. Between 2004 and 2009, Deborah and Lester's relationship became very strained and it just began to deteriorate. Sometime around 2009, Lester would file for divorce and that kind of, it hit Deborah's mental health pretty bad. And she attempted to take her own life in front of her two girls. Deborah had spent some time in mental health facilities before, but after this incident, she was put back in a mental health institution. And so then the courts basically gave temporary full custody to Lester and also a restraining order against Deborah. And that any visits to Deborah, probably at the institution, had to be supervised if the children were there. So Deborah was in the institution for approximately 15 days. And then when she was released, the courts then threw out the restraining order and they threw out the temporary custody that Lester had. And so now she was allowed to have visitation with the girls without any supervision. On June 4th, 2009, 12-year-old Kelsey would post on Facebook, I get to see my mom tomorrow. Yay! She was really excited. She had no idea what was about to come. Deborah had said to the girls, I'm going to be picking you up tomorrow and I have a really big surprise in store for you. And so on that day, June 5th, 2009, she picked up the girls. She took them to some abandoned house off of the highway. I don't believe this is the actual one where she took them into, I guess, the bathroom. She took out a knife and she just slashed the throat of 13 year old Kirsten, her own daughter. And she began to like slash at her and stab her. Kirsten immediately told Kelsey, run, run, please get out of here. But unfortunately, Deborah caught up to her and from behind slashed her throat. 12 year old Kelsey died almost immediately. And that's when Deborah makes that incredibly cold 911 call. A call that makes you want to reach through the phone, through the internet, and just... <sighs> At one point, as Kirsten is bleeding to death and she is struggling to stay alive, she's trying to say something and Deborah has the nerve to say, what's that baby? Baby? Calling her something affectionate. She's the one who stabbed them. It's just so f Later in that 911 call, basically Deborah would state to them, hey, I don't have a gun, so make sure they don't shoot me. And so when police arrived, you know, within however long it took them to, Deborah was out in the driveway waiting for them. The knife she used was put onto the ground and the police went inside and they found the two girls. 12 year old Kelsey was already, she was pronounced dead. 13 year old Kristen was thankfully still alive and she was airlifted to the nearest hospital. She underwent surgery and she was actually saved. And so Deborah Jeter was arrested and charged with murder and attempted murder. What was the reasoning for killing or trying to kill both of her daughters? Basically, she said it, it all happened because of the divorce and you know me failing to end my own life. So she said she wanted to do something more drastic. I have no doubts that she was suffering from some kind of mental health issues. And quite honestly, I have to wonder, what, what, what did the hospital do for her? And, and how did they miss this kind of thing? And how, how did they just say, okay, yeah, you can be alone with your daughters now. I don't, I don't know, but at, at any rate, she would end up pleading guilty and she did so in order to avoid the death sentence. Gee, that must be nice to prevent death. And so she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He said they died because he casted a spell and the spell went wrong. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kendra and Alicia suing. 
Viewer discretion is advised. Kendra and Alicia are pictured here with their mom, Marla, and their stepfather, Lawrence, as well as two of their siblings. Marla Stroman would meet Lawrence Harris in 2005, and they quickly got married. And at first, it was a pretty happy marriage. Everything seemed to be going great. At the time of this case, the family is living in Sioux City, Iowa. I believe that three of the four children were from a previous relationship that Marla had, and then the two of them had an infant together. Soon into the relationship, however, Marla began to notice that Larry was acting odd. Larry says he is someone who practices witchcraft, and he meant it. Also, though, he had been diagnosed with some mental health issues. He had issues with isolation. He had tried to self-harm, and Larry was very heavily medicated. It got to a point where he stopped taking his medication. His behavior became extreme. It became kind of scary. And so Marla was like, all right, you need to start taking your meds or else we're leaving. But for one reason or the other, uh, you know, they all stayed together. On January 6, 2008, Larry would call 911 and ask for firemen to come because the house was on fire. And that's really all he mentioned. When they all got there, however, they found two bodies in the basement. 10-year-old Kendra and 8-year-old Alicia. When emergency services first arrived, Larry had blood all over his hands. When Larry was questioned, he said that he was trying to cast a spell in order to protect the girl's teenage brother. But that spell backfired. Something went wrong with it. And the girls died. And then he said that led to severe consequences. The girls had both been stabbed and strangled. And the reason why the house was on fire was because Larry was trying to cover up what he did by attempting to burn the evidence. Eventually, the prosecution would determine that Larry was trying to take revenge against Marla. He thought that she was cheating on him, and so he decided to kill these two young girls in order to get back at Marla. What a guy. Then he tried to say, oh, it's my mental health, it's my illnesses, it's what did it. But numerous psychologists who would speak to him after the fact determined that he was of sound mind when he did this. It showed premeditation. He planned this out. He knew right from wrong because he admits he tried to burn the bodies to cover up evidence. He still tried to plead not guilty by reason of insanity, but the jury didn't buy it. And for the murders of the two girls, he was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences and he'll never get a chance to be paroled. This case is an unfortunate example as to why we all need to be cautious and careful when using dating or meetup apps. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Khalil Wheeler Weaver. Fewer discretion is advised. On September 1st, 2016, the body of 19-year-old Robin West was located near an abandoned building. She had been strangled, she was sexually assaulted, and she was set on fire and it would actually take them two weeks to identify her body. On December 5th, 2016, contractors would discover the body of Joanne Brown. She was found at a vacant abandoned house in Orange, New Jersey. She had tape over her eyes and her mouth, and she had a jacket tied very tightly around her neck as if that was used to strangle her, and that was her cause of death, strangulation. A couple of weeks before Joanne Brown's body was found, another young woman, her name was Sarah Butler, she had basically vanished. And the last time anyone saw her was November 22nd, 2016. Now, it was her family that discovered that she was using an app called Tagged, a dating app or some kind of meetup app. I've never even heard of it before. They would discover that Sarah met with uh, a man named Khalil. And so they basically catfished him. Their goal was to lure him to a certain location so that they could catch him. Because they believed, since he was probably the last person to see her, that he was the one who probably made her disappear. Now, this plan worked. Uh, Khalil went to the restaurant and police were waiting for him. But they didn't have any physical evidence to connect him to the disappearance of Sarah. But then, Sarah's body, unfortunately, would be found in December of 2016. And that would finally prompt them to arrest Khalil Wheeler Weaver. He was a 20-year-old man who grew up in Orange, New Jersey, where all of this was happening. He actually grew up with relatives, a lot of relatives, who worked in law enforcement. 
People would describe him as kind of a quiet person. He always seemed to be like the nerdy kid in high school. At the time this case was happening, he was working as a security guard. And I mean, no one would ever put this kind of thing on him. So police go through his phone data and they find that, yep, he had an account on Tagged. He would go by names like Lil Yacht Rock or Pimp Killer Ghost. And they were able to literally find the connections he had with the three women who were murdered. And they even found a message that Sarah had sent him just before they met that she asked him, are you a serial killer? In which he said, no. She obviously asked that probably as a joke, kind of. So Khalil is arrested and charged with the murders of these first three women here. And he is convicted and he is sentenced to 160 years in prison. About a month after he was convicted and sentenced, police would identify the remains of a 15 year old girl who had went missing about two years prior to her being identified. 15 year old Mawa Daumbia, she had vanished in October of 2016. So this would have been right in the same time frame as the other three murders. She too had been found strangled and left in an abandoned house. Her crime scene and her death fit the exact same narrative as the other three women, because all three women prior were also strangled and left abandoned in like a house. Apparently they didn't discover the connection while they were going through his phone and his app that he was using. But at some point they were able to then go back and see that he in fact was communicating with the 15 year old girl just before she disappeared. And that Khalil was essentially the last person known to have seen her. So he was then charged with her murder. So those charges were placed in 2022, but he has, from what I understand, either not gone to trial yet or has not been sentenced for her murder yet. Khalil would plead not guilty to that murder, but uh, you know, again, it's they're still awaiting a trial, so. They don't have really any physical evidence that connected him directly to any of the murders, except one of the women did have some of his DNA under her fingernails. So they relied heavily on the digital evidence of, you know, that app, that, you know, tagged app. And witnesses who would state that they saw him with a couple of those women just before they disappeared and were killed. There was a woman who came forward. Her name was Tiffany Taylor. At the time, she was pregnant and she was unhoused. And she says that she met up with him after using the tagged app. When he picked her up, they were driving around and then he struck her over the back of her head. She woke up and she was being sexually assaulted in the process of it by him and she was handcuffed. She managed to convince him to bring him back to her motel room and he did it. And when she ran inside, she closed the door and locked it. And then she went to police, but police didn't believe her story despite still having the handcuffs attached to one of her hands. As a matter of fact, the police really just wanted to place a prostitution charge on her. If they had taken her seriously, one or two of those women would actually still be alive, more than likely. So the police failing to take her story seriously and investigate this led to death. And unfortunately, the consensus came down to, well, these were black women. And one of them was a black sex worker, so who cares? A lot of people care, that's who. I wonder what one or two of their lives would have been like had police done anything to actually save them. Rotten hell. So I just watched the movie Killers of the Flower Moon, the new Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Scorsese movie. And I'm like, I'm very torn on it. So first of all, I never read the book and I, I honestly can't sit here and tell you like, how it, if it covered the subject matter appropriately or not. But like, as a film, you know, as someone who loves film, I think the movie was really, really good. Like it was a fantastically made film and it's, it's long, it's three and a half hours long, but it didn't feel that long. Like the pacing, while it was slow, it was still like, it still kept me like engaged the whole time. But I have like, <sighs> I have a, I have one significant issue with this, is that Leonardo DiCaprio, who we all know is just this fantastic actor and pretty much anything he does, his character, Ernest Burkhart, was, was the focal point of the story. And I am really confused by that because I, f I got the vibes 
that they were trying to make Ernest Burkhardt's character like sympathetic, like we were supposed to almost care about him, that he was truly in love with his wife, Molly, but he is part of this entire plot to murder her family and other Osage people. He even poisons her like throughout the process of, of this. And this is a real story. This is like not a movie thing. This is, this is the actual story of what happened uh, in the 1920s. Ernest Burkhart was a real person. His uncle, played by Robert De Niro, who was really good in the movie, uh, was a real person. But this is a white man who was helping orchestrate the slaughter of indigenous people. And I'm like, are we supposed to be feeling something for this guy? Because I don't care if he says he loved her. He's a piece of shit. He's a psychopath, murderous piece of shit. I really felt like the story should have been told more through Molly's point of view. Lily Gladstone, by the way, subtle performance. She should win an Oscar for it, though. She is so good. But it really should have been told from her point of view, since it was her people and her family uh, being slaughtered because of the greed of colonizing white men. We got to see a lot of shots of Osage people being brutally murdered, but I don't feel like they really captured, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. Like, it's being told from the perspective of white people. <laughs> and we're the bad guys in this. Hi. <laughs> and if you really want to understand the atrocities of indigenous people in this country, the two real men basically got a slap on the wrist for committing mass atrocities. But really great movie, though. I mean, it really was. I just wish it was framed differently. First, he made the milkshakes, and then he grabbed the axe. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Cosberg family murders. Viewer discretion is advised. The Cosbergs lived here in this home in Vancouver, Canada. The family consisted of parents, Osborne and Dorothy Cosberg, and their six kids. Thomas, Barry, Marianne, Gail, Vincent, and baby Osborne Jr., who is not pictured in this photo. Now, Thomas did have a history of battling mental health issues. He was basically in and out of, like, youth homes and mental hospitals. He was being consistently treated by a psychologist. But the doctor never saw his issues as ever being something that would lead to actual violence or much worse than that. But unfortunately, violence is what would come. It was the night of December 9th, 1965, which would lead into the morning of December 10th, 1965. Thomas volunteered to make milkshakes for everyone in the family, except for his dad, because his dad was at work. But they did have a family friend over named Florence, and so he made her a milkshake too. Little did they know that the night prior, he had purchased a bottle of 25 sleeping pills, which he crushed up and put into all of the milkshakes. He then waited for all of them to pass out. Florence passed out, but then she woke up and said, Hey, I'm feeling tired, so I'm going to go home. He said, no, come on, stay here and sleep. And she said, no, it's okay. So she called a cab and she left. And it's a good thing she did. Then his father comes home at around one or two in the morning. He says, hey, I made a milkshake for you too. Because at that point, everyone else was sleeping. The dad had his milkshake and then eventually he passed out. Thomas then goes down to the basement and at around four o'clock in the morning, climbs back up the stairs, goes into his siblings' rooms where he takes an ax to all of them. He whacked them in the heads multiple times apiece. He tried to smother his baby brother, but luckily he did not do a good job and the baby would survive. He then goes to his mom's room with the axe and beats her over the head with it until her skull is caved in. And then he does the same thing to his dad. They had all been so incapacitated with the sleeping pills that they could barely function. He then steals his dad's car and runs it directly into a pole. Then he steals another car and goes to, I guess, his doctor. You see, Thomas had tried to see his doctor about a day or so prior to this, but his doctor wasn't available. They pulled six bodies out of the house that morning. Thomas was eventually charged with multiple counts of murder, where in court he would admit that he did exactly what he did. He gave them the play-by-play, -play, but he did so under extreme mental disturbance, which was confirmed by multiple doctors. They said he likely suffered from a sudden schizophrenic mental breakdown, and he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was institutionalized for about 10 years, 
1977, he was declared no longer a danger to society and was released back out into the world. But there were a lot of like restrictions with it. He was no longer ever allowed to purchase firearms, go figure. He could only live in approved places. He had to see the specialists once a week at least. And he actually goes on to live an incredibly normal life. He gets married. He works at the Vancouver Children's Hospital for 30 years without any issues or any incidents. And then he himself died on January 1st, 2016. I think a lot of us will probably be quick to judge like, oh my God, they, they put him back out in the world. But I think like I myself and many of us need to have a deeper appreciation for you know, schizophrenia and these severe, severe mental health concerns and issues. And sometimes people do actually do these things without even realizing they're doing it or unable to, you know, understand that what they're doing is wrong. It's a very real thing. And it's scary, of course. And, you know, honestly, I wish he would have served some time in prison. But for what it's worth, he got the treatment that de was deemed necessary and passed it with flying colors. And he lived a very, very normal life after that. But it goes to show that this kind of thing is a lot more complicated than we tend to think. How a person could do this to anyone, let alone a child, it, I will never be able to understand it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Christy Onstad. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Christy was a 14-year-old girl living in Bellingham, Washington with her family. She was described as lively and cheerful and popular at school. She was described as a very typical teenager. She got good grades in school. Her teachers said that she was really going to do something great with her life. But one man decided for everyone else that Christy wasn't going to be able to do that. In the very early evening of April 17th, 1995, Christy's mom, Sue, would call police to report that Christy was missing. And police would begin their search immediately. It turns out that Christy had not actually gone to school that day, which was highly unusual. But her mom didn't even know that until, you know, later that afternoon. The next day, a man named Willie Golightly would find Christy's backpack. And so Willie would call Sue, her mom. Now, Clark Elmore was Christy's stepdad. When he found out about the backpack, he went to Willie Golightly's home to demand it back. But Willie said, actually, I'm going to wait for police to collect it because this may be evidence and she's missing. And when police arrives, he basically hides himself. However, Clark came off as extremely distraught about Christie's disappearance. As a matter of fact, he was the one to organize the largest searches for Christy. And he himself was out there looking for her. So he didn't really come off as suspicious at all. But sadly, on April 21st, 1995, on the shores of Lake Samish, Christie's body was found. And it, it was, it was horrific. The 14-year-old girl was covered with a tarp and her head had been caved in with likely something along the lines of a sledgehammer. She had been struck numerous times, which just destroyed her head. But on the other side of her head that wasn't like crushed, there was a large metal like needle jammed into her ear, which actually pierced her brain. The coroner also determined that she had been sexually assaulted pretty brutally, and she was also strangled. This child was just eviscerated. Once the body was found, Clark Elmore told his wife, Sue, hey, I'm gonna go run some errands. And then he never came back. Police were already kind of on to him once the whole situation with the backpack came up. So what they actually did was they didn't tell him they found the body yet, but they called him and said, hey, we're going to be doing an extensive search by Lake Samish tomorrow. And their hopes was he would go there before them to like move the body. But they already knew where the body was, but he never showed up because instead he fled the state. Police did search his van that he used all the time and they didn't really find a lot of evidence in it that even showed Christy was ever in it. However, on Christy's body, they found a couple of tiny specks of like, a, like an orange paint. And they realized that he actually had a toolbox in his van with the exact same color. So they took samples of that orange paint and compared it to the specks found on her body. And they confirmed it was a match. It was the same paint. 
So now it's a matter of, now we need to find him because they issued a warrant for his arrest, but he had fled. They found out that he and Christy had a very kind of rocky relationship. He wasn't really all that pleasant with her, but they still couldn't really determine why he would do this to her. I mean, this was horrific. This was brutal. They would get their answer about seven days later because he flew back to Washington state and he turned himself in and he admitted to killing Christy. He revealed that when Christy was five years old, he molested her. And ever since then, anytime he yelled at her, she would come back with, hey, you gotta be nice to me or I'm gonna tell someone that what you did to me. And he said over time, she kept doing this and doing this and it just boiled up in him. And so on the morning of her disappearance, apparently he was supposed to take her to school in his van. He must have said something that angered her. And then she said, well, I'm gonna tell them that you molested me. And then according to him, he finally just snapped. He would say that he really wished that she would have gone to police because if she had gone to police, she would still be alive. He said the threats to turn him in is what cost her her life. So she finally gets in the van, but then he drives somewhere completely different. He then forces her clothes off of her where he then brutally sexually assaults her and then he chokes her thinking she's dead. But then he said that she, he saw her still kicking and so he brought a tarp over to her, covered her up with it, took a sledgehammer and bashed her skull in numerous times and then stuck a metal instrument into her ear to pierce her brain. And then he just threw her backpack thinking no one would find it. So the worthless piece of shit was arrested and charged with her murder and he would end up being convicted and he was sentenced to death. But boy, oh boy, did he get lucky. In 2014, the governor of Washington decided to put a stay on all future executions. And so Clark Elmore was then basically reinstated to life in prison without parole. But I believe that if they ever do reinstate the death penalty, he would still be on death row. And it's monsters like this as to why we have the death penalty. Because if anyone on this planet deserves it, it's this fucking monster right here. These are the last known images of a couple who would be murdered sometime shortly after they were taken. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lisa Guerreri and Brandon Rumba. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Lisa was a 19-year-old who had recently graduated from Mesa High School in Arizona. She was working for SRP. She loved to sing in church. She always seemed to have a smile on her face, and she was just a beloved person. She was dating 20-year-old Brandon. He was an Arizona State University student. He had aspirations to one day open up his own gym, and he too seemed to be loved by everybody. The two of them were described as just a super happy couple, and by all accounts, they were actually engaged to be married, even though Lisa didn't actually have a ring yet. On October 17th, 2003, the couple, who then lived in Scottsdale, Arizona at the time, wanted to celebrate their one year anniversary by trying to recreate a, one of their first dates. And so they planned to go camping underneath the stars. The two of them would borrow a white Ford F-150 from a friend or a relative, and then they would head out to their destination, which they didn't really tell anyone exactly where they were going, more of like a general area. They were supposed to be back the following morning, but they never showed up. And so once another day goes by, they still aren't there, they begin to go out searching for them. And they're really just searching more of general locations where they think they might have gone. And then that Sunday, off of Bumblebee Road, just off the I-17, the young couple was discovered. They first discovered the truck, and then when they looked in the bed of the truck, they found the couple had both been killed. Each of them shot multiple times in their heads. There was almost no evidence left behind, no shell casings, nothing. They didn't collect any DNA, they didn't have any fingerprints. The only thing they found was this disposable camera found within, like, chucking distance of the truck. They believe that someone had thrown it from the truck, trying to break it. So police were able to track the purchase of it to the exact day that Lisa and Brandon left. And this store was on the way to the location where they were found. On that camera were a few photos. There was an image of Brandon and then another image of Lisa. Presumably each photo taken by the other one. And then this photo, which was they determined was overexposed. And it looks like it's inside a building somewhere some kind of fluorescent light, but where it was taken, they don't know because they purchased this on the way to their campsite. But nobody knows who did this to them and why. 
they've interviewed all of their friends and their family. There is a rumor that there was like a friend that was in their friend group that kind of had a crush on Lisa and maybe, you know, she spurned his advances. Apparently that person, I guess, suspiciously picked up and left town shortly after these murders. And I guess, from what I understand, police interviewed him and gave him a polygraph test, which he passed, but he's never been named an actual suspect. In fact, nobody has been. There's also another theory that, because there was like a hundred or so people who were camping within, you know, several miles with, within this area. And it could have been a random, you know, car robbery gone wrong. But allegedly nothing was stolen, like cash or anything. I guess they may have had a video camera with them, but it was no longer there. So that's possible that that was stolen, but there was no money taken or wallets or jewelry or anything. Police allegedly have interviewed all or as many people as they could that they found out were camping within all of you know, the miles around this. And they said they didn't find any suspects that way either. Again, forensically, there was really nothing. There was nothing in the truck. There was nothing on their bodies. The camera didn't have any fingerprints or trace DNA or anything. All they know is that they are the ones to purchase that camera. But where was this photo taken if it was a new camera that they purchased on the way up to the camping trip site? And the camera was disposed of at the murder scene. So did they meet up with someone first? Perhaps. Maybe they went somewhere, took a couple photos, and that's why the killer decided to try to break the camera. Why not just take it though? So police don't know if this has anything to do with the murders at all, like this image. Or it may have everything to do with it. But they do know that these photos were the last photos ever taken of Brandon and Lisa, and this must have been literally an hour, maybe a couple hours before they were murdered. But to this day, they have not gotten justice. They have not arrested anyone. No suspects have been named. And so the police are still asking for the public's help in trying to find out who did this. Surely somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. There is currently a $10,000 reward, and sometimes money talks. You don't have to say who you are when you call, you just have to say what you know. If you have information about the murders of Lisa Guerreri and Brandon Rumba, please contact 1-800-932-3232. Help this couple get the justice they rightfully deserve. A young woman would leave her home in Colorado to go visit a boyfriend in Wyoming. 14 years later, her car is found buried. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case known as the Lil Miss murder. Viewer discretion is advised. Lisa Marie Kimmel was born on July 18th, 1969. She would be the oldest of four eventual children. She had two sisters and also a brother, but her brother unfortunately died when he was three years old in an accident. Lisa's grandma would call her my Lil Miss Lisa Marie, and so she ended up getting just the nickname Lil Miss. She used it everywhere. And as a matter of fact, when she got a car, she got a personalized license plate that said Lil Miss. Now, while Lisa was born in Tennessee, she was primarily raised in Billings, Montana. She was described as an incredibly hardworking individual. She was extremely dedicated to anything she was doing. Lisa was very outgoing, very charming, sweet, and just really fun to be around. When she graduated high school, she would end up moving from Billings, Montana to Colorado, specifically Denver, and she got a job there. She had a boyfriend named Ed Jarek, who I guess lived in the Cody, Wyoming area. At approximately 4.30 p.m. on March 25th, 1988, she would clock out of her job at a local restaurant. She got into her black 1988 Honda CRX, and she was heading to Cody, Wyoming to go visit her boyfriend. It should have taken maybe eight, nine hours or so for her to reach her destination, but when that time came, she wasn't there. By the following morning, her boyfriend was extremely concerned. This is before cell phones and email and all that. So he would contact the highway patrol to say, hey, I, you know, my girlfriend was on this particular highway. Can you see, is there any record of her? And they would end up finding out that at one point during her drive, she was actually pulled over for speeding, roughly four or so hours into her trip. They had the police citation to prove it, and they also had the recording from his, I guess, dashboard cam, where you could actually hear her talking and confirmed it was her. So that was about 9 p.m. that night, the same day she left on March 25th. That would be the last time anyone ever spoke to her. But then Lisa, her car, all of it just poofed 
into thin air and vanished off the face of the earth. But then on April 2nd, 1988, a man was walking along the North Platte River, which was in Casper, Wyoming, and he saw a body floating in the water. So he immediately goes to police. It is the body of a younger female. She was partially nude, and because of the extreme cold temperatures, her body hadn't started decomposing yet. The young woman had been bound, she had been beaten, she had been sexually assaulted, and she was then stabbed six times. Roughly a quarter mile away on a nearby bridge, they would find signs of blood. And this was a bridge that wasn't really used by that many people. So they found this pool of blood, which this is the actual photo, and then a couple more, you know, stains of blood nearby. The body would be identified as 18-year-old Lisa Marie Kimmel. The blood that they found on that bridge belonged to her. So they believe that the killer used that bridge to dump her dead body over into the river. Police would then get just so many tips with regards to potential sightings of Lisa. Now, many of these sightings were told to police after they had already found her body, and they claimed to have seen her after she was found. So there were a lot of false sightings, obviously. But there were a couple of sightings that people shared with police that would have lined up with the time frame of when she went missing before she was found. People said they saw her with a man, but she didn't appear to be in any distress. But police couldn't tell, they didn't know what was true, what wasn't, if any of it was valid. Who was this man she may have been with? And why? It wouldn't be until 2002 when they were able to pull DNA from her body, thanks to the advancement of uh, forensic science. So they found male DNA, they plugged it into the system, and it matched a man, 58-year-old Dale Wayne Eaton. In 2002, he was in prison for weapon charges. He had been convicted in the past of kidnapping. He was charged with manslaughter for killing one of his cellmates. Oh, Jesus Christ. He looks like a well-used baseball glove. Police found out he owned a property about 75 miles west of Casper, Wyoming. So they go to that property in hopes of finding any kind of evidence. They bring in some uh, pretty heavy equipment and they start digging. And then they finally strike gold. They found one car part, then another, then another, then another. They unearthed an entire car buried about 12 to 13 feet deep on Dale Eaton's property. The car had the license plates will miss, and it was a 1988 Honda CRX. This was Lisa Marie Kimmel's car. He was then charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, and murder. He was convicted and sentenced to death. And by the way, it's believed that Lisa was alive for about five or six days and being held captive in this bus on that property, and then she was killed. So some of the sightings may have been legit. Dale Eaton's death sentence would be overturned due to a technicality, and he was resentenced to life in prison without parole. Regardless, Lisa and her parents got the justice they deserve. On the afternoon of February 19th, 1971, two teenage boys were hitchhiking along Interstate 75, and this was near Lake Panasofsky in Florida, and they happened to notice that there was a body floating in Lake Panasofsky. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Little Miss Panasofsky, Viewer discretion is advised. This is a recreation image from the show Unsolved Mysteries, but when police arrived, they would take the body. She was fully clothed. There was no ID on her person, and they were able to determine that she was thrown in the water after she was dead, so this was a, a dumping situation. The coroner said that she was likely dead for a couple of weeks. She had been strangled with a man's belt size 36, it was actually still tightly wrapped around her neck. But with this being 1971, before they really had any kind of forensic technology, and the fact that her body was submerged in water for at least a few weeks, there really was no evidence to find. So they would have artists make up composite drawings and clay molds of the woman because they didn't know who she was either. So initially they came up with this drawing here, and then they did something kind of unusual. The artist would do two regression photos of what the victim would have looked like around 12 years old and then six years old, hoping that this may help jog someone's memory. But unfortunately, no one ever came forward. 
They put out an image of the clothing that she was wearing that day in hopes that maybe someone would recognize those. Nobody did. Little Miss Panasofsky was murdered, but who was she and who killed her? She was five foot two, approximately 100 pounds, and around 20 years old. They also wanted to put out the information that she had uh, orthopedic surgery to one of her ankles, and it was done by drilling holes into the bone and then wrapping the tendons through that. An unusual surgery that they were hoping a surgeon would remember or recognize. But again, unfortunately, nobody came forward. This was a more recent composite drawing done of the victim. The only thing we know about the killer was that he probably maybe wore a size 36 belt if that belt belonged to him. But that's really all they know about him. So six months after she was found, they buried her in this plot that just said Jane Doe 1971. By 2012, they would exhume her body where they would take samples of her isotopes and that would reveal that this woman was likely from Europe, more specifically, probably from Greece. And she may have been living in Europe roughly one year before she was killed and then came to the United States. One viewer would state that she believes that the Jane Doe was her friend Constantina from Greece. She went to the States in the 70s and went missing, never been seen since. It could be her or maybe not. Unfortunately, it's still unsolved. A cab driver is murdered, and it would take two years to catch her killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lucy Tremel. Viewer discretion is advised. Lucy was born on September 5th, 1967. In 1987, she would move to Banff, which is in Alberta, Canada. And at the time of this case, she's 23 years old, and she is a cab driver. And it was May 17th, 1990. She started her shift that night at 8 p.m. She had picked up a whole bunch of tourists and she would end up with about a hundred or so dollars. At 1.40 a.m. she was seen by another cab driver just outside this building, the Works Nightclub. Her coworker Larry noticed that a couple of individuals went into Lucy's cab, to which then Lucy would leave the area. A little bit later, Larry would reach out to their, I guess, dispatch person, Bruce, and he asked Bruce, have you heard from Lucy? Because sometime after he saw her, he tried to radio her, but she didn't respond. And that's when Larry actually sees Lucy's cab flying down the road, but the driver is a man. So he follows after this cab, and he's basically pursuing it. Eventually, the man driving the cab will stop the car, he, and then he'll get out, and he will bolt into a bunch of trees. And Larry didn't catch up with them, so he had escaped. Meanwhile, a couple of miles away, police discover the body of a young woman in the middle of the road. And she would be identified as Lucy Tremell. Lucy had numerous stab wounds to her neck. Whoever killed her stole her jacket, her wallet, and the 130 or so dollars that she had earned that night. When police would examine the vehicle, there was blood everywhere. They assumed that it was all Lucy's blood, but it turns out it wasn't. None of it was her blood. So it had to be from the killer. So police are trying to track down like the last fare, those three people that her coworker saw getting into her car, but eventually they were found and they were ruled out. Two years later, Unsolved Mysteries airs this case. And it aired in October of 1992, and then by November of 1992, they had gotten some tips. One of the roommates of this man, Ryan Jason Love, would go to police to state that the knife that was used to kill Lucy, which by the way was found shortly after the murder took place, well the roommate said the knife belonged to Ryan. Ryan had stolen the knife from a hotel he used to work at. So eventually they were able to collect a sample of his DNA and it was a match to all of the blood found inside the car. Reportedly, his motive was he just wanted enough money to impress his family. And Lucy was just a random target. He was convicted of her murder and got 20 years to life and he was released in 2011. This is one of the most evil and heinous cases I have ever talked about. And it is about kids, so I just wanted to give you a warning. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the long children. Viewer discretion is advised. This is Lam Long. He was originally a Vietnamese refugee who moved to the States. He would eventually meet Q, and the two of them would basically have a common law marriage. 
There were four total children, and Lamb was the father to three of them. The oldest child was actually fathered by a previous relationship. It was January 7, 2008. Lamb would go visit his wife, a Q, at the nail salon she worked at. This was roughly 10 a.m. He came in there asking for money. She gave him some money and said, hey, fill up the gas tank of our van. The rest of the day, she could not get a hold of Lamb. He was not answering his phone, responding to anything. And then finally at 7 p.m., Q was finally able to get a hold of Lamb, and he said the kids were missing. He had initially told her that I dropped the kids off with a friend, but then they, she basically found out that was a lie. So then the couple goes to police to report the kids missing. Q and Lamb are questioned separately by police as others are out there looking for the kids. At one point, Lamb says, I need to talk to Q. And so they allow it. He looks her in the face and says, the kids are dead. Because he did it. He killed all four of them. He had taken them to the Dauphin Island Bridge. And this is near Mobile, Alabama, by the way. And then he systematically and coldly threw each one of them off the top of the bridge about 100 feet to the water below. All four of the children were alive when he threw them over. Three-year-old Ryan, two-year-old Hannah, one-year-old Lindsay, and four-month-old Danny. Over the next couple of days, their bodies were all recovered from the water. The coroner confirmed that all four children were alive when they were in the water. Danny, Ryan, and Lindsay died of blunt force trauma from hitting things in the water, and they also had drowned. Hannah's cause of death was just drowning. All of them defenseless, all of them in absolute terror, watching their own father throw their sibling off the bridge, and they would all die slowly. And the person meant to protect them he was arrested and charged with all of their murders. He would be convicted and sentenced to death. But in 2018, his defense team would get his death sentence reversed and sentenced to life in prison without parole due to an intellectual disability and an IQ of 51. Let's throw the switch anyway. That's a lot of face. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mac Hill. Viewer discretion is advised. Mac Oren Hill lived in Lubbock, Texas. Unfortunately, I really don't have any photos for this case. In August of 1987, a fisherman was here on Amon Lake, which is in Montague County, which is 200 miles east of Lubbock, Texas. Well, a fisherman found something unusual, a 55 gallon steel drum in the water. So he contacted police, they arrive and they retrieve the drum from the water it had been weighed down with cement, and when they pried it open, they found the mummified body of the person. It had been wrapped in a carpet and in blankets, and it was tied up with neckties. The body from the lake was identified as 43-year-old Donald Johnson, and it appeared that he had been shot to death. Very quickly afterwards, this man, Mac Oren Hill, was considered a person of interest slash suspect because... He was a former business partner of uh, Donald Johnson. They had attempted to start businesses, but every single time they failed. Now, Donald Johnson did have his own business. It was a paint and body shop. As a matter of fact, the body, when it was found, was wearing a shirt for his business. Well, Mac had been driving his business truck after he would have been murdered. And he was found living in Donald Johnson's trailer. Again, after he would have been murdered. This is when an acquaintance of both Donald and Mac would come forward. His name was Herbert Elliott, picture I don't have, and I don't have a photo of the victim either, sorry. Well, he would identify Mac Hill as being Donald Johnson's killer. He said he saw Mac shoot him. And this occurred on March 3rd, 1987, in the body shop that Donald Johnson owned. According to Herbert, Mac then used a knife and a hammer to basically open up wounds on the body to drain it of blood. He then helped Mac wrap the body up in carpet and blankets, tied it up, and helped him put it in the drum, and then helped him dispose of it in the lake. Now, Mac Hill says that can't be because I wasn't even there. Herbert was the one who killed him, according to Mac. He said he was sick that day, he was at home, but his alibi could not be confirmed. 
So both men would be arrested. Now, because Herbert Elliott would testify against Mac Hill, he was given a 20 year sentence and has since been released. Mac Hill was sentenced to death. Seems pretty harsh for a case without any solid forensic evidence, but his ex-wife would come forward and, and testify that she saw him shoot her stepfather back in 1978 and wrapped him in blankets and dropped him in a lake. He was never charged with that murder. Mac was executed on August 8th, 2001. She was set on fire while still alive, and it may have been a hate crime. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Maggie Long. Viewer discretion is advised. Maggie was born on December 17th, 1999, and she lived, I guess, in Bailey, Colorado with her parents, and I do believe she had siblings too. At the time of this story, she was a 17-year-old high school senior at Platte Canyon High School. She was described as someone who was very passionate about everything she did. She had a very fierce love for community, and she loved being involved in all of the student organizations. Her friends and family and schoolmates would describe her as kind, altruistic, genuine, generous, ambitious, and she would give up her day in order to help someone else in need. But sadly, on December 1st, 2017, just a few weeks before her birthday, her life would be taken. Maggie and her family lived here in this home, which was located on, I guess, like a, a ranch type property. And they, it was surrounded by just a bunch of openness. And it was a pretty large property. Very, you know, big home. Well, on December 1st, 2017, police would be called because the home was on fire. When fire crews arrived, they were able to put out the flames and there was damage to the home, but it was pretty minimal for the most part, except for one very, very horrific thing. Inside the home was the burned remains of a body. At the time, they didn't know who it was. However, Maggie Long was missing from the home. Maggie was confirmed to have gone to school that day. She was seen leaving the school at the end of the day. She was going back home to pick up some things to go back to the school for a little like a dance or a party that was happening, but she didn't show up for that party. I think it took them almost a week to finally identify the remains found in the home, but they were able to confirm that they were of 17 year old Maggie Long. Missing from the home were several guns, like a nine millimeter, an AK-47, and thousands of rounds of ammunition, plus some like porcelain figurines. Initially, police said that this was a robbery that Maggie must have walked in on, and so she was killed because of that. In 2019, they would come forward with information stating that Maggie was actually set on fire while still alive. And this was a purposeful act. They purposefully lit her on fire and sadly she burned to death. In 2019, they did release these sketches of three men who were seen, I guess, in the vicinity of the home. There were apparently witnesses who said they saw some kind of altercation happening in the house, but how these images came to be, like who they came from, I'm not 100% sure, but these are considered the suspects in this case. These were released two years after the murder. As recently as 2021, police would reclassify this as not, I guess, not being a burglary that was interrupted, but instead they've now classified this as a hate crime. Maggie and her family are Asian, and apparently, I was reading some other articles that were kind of like, that stemmed off of this story, but apparently police in that somewhat, in that similar community had arrested some, I guess, some men who had been burglarizing homes, and they were specifically targeting Asian households. And these were like white men who were doing it. But I, I don't think those men, from what I understand, have any connection to this case. At least not that they have like said out loud. Because none of those cases ended in anything like arson or murder. But again, they, they police have said that they believe that this was likely a hate crime. And they, they obviously have some kind of evidence to, you know, come forward with that information which is just another level of awful and evil. They have since released a $75,000 reward for any information that may lead to the arrests of the individual or individuals responsible for Maggie's murder. So if you recognize any of these three men, please contact the local authorities. They actually have the Maggie Long task force you can call at 303-239 4243, or you can email maggie.long.tips 
at state.co.us. You can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Someone or someones entered Maggie's home that day, stole some items, and then set her on fire while she was still alive and let her burn to death. Someone has got to pay for that horrific crime. Maggie and her family deserve that right and they deserve her justice. So please come forward if you have any information. Please help Maggie find that justice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mary Ann Clibbery. Viewer discretion is advised. Mary Ann Clibbery was born on May 21st, 1935 in Chicago, Illinois. In 1959, she would take on the job as secretary at the Al Zulo Remodeling Specialist Store, and that was also located near Chicago, Illinois. At the time this case happened, she's 69 years old. She is the happy mother to five children from previous relationships, but she was in a relationship with this man here, and the two of them were planning on spending the rest of their lives together. But unfortunately, that would not get to happen. Now, eventually, after the owner, Al Zulo, passed away, he would give equal share to the business to his longtime employee who had been there for over 30 years, Mary Ann, and also George Hansen. Mary Ann and George did commercials together. Mary Ann typically handled the financial side of the business, while George Hansen, uh, he basically dealt with the sales portion. By 2004, Mary Ann was just hoping to retire very soon, but she never quite made it there either. It was December 22nd, 2004. George Hansen and another worker would enter the building and they discovered something horrific. They found Mary Ann on the floor at the end of the hallway, just surrounded by blood, and she was deceased. There was blood spatter all over the walls. It appeared, based on the forensics, that someone had probably beat her over the head, then came back sometime later and then beat her again because there was wet blood on top of dry blood, which led the investigators to believe that those first couple of blows didn't kill her, but the killer didn't realize that until a short time later when he came back to do it again. The attack on Marianne seemed very personal. This seemed like almost like a grudge type killing or someone who just really hated her. There was a previous employee who did work there who was fired, who really openly did not like Marianne at all. But when police would look into him, they found out his alibi and everything, and they determined that there was no way he could have done it. They had one other suspect though, the co-owner of the business, George Hansen. So as they're looking into George, they are made aware of some evidence that was found that was thrown over a bridge that was a black trash bag. Whoever threw it over the bridge likely thought they were throwing it into water, but they missed the water portion and it landed on the ice. Inside that bag, there was a purse, there was a pair of gloves, a bloody hammer, a sweater. They determined that the sweater belonged to the Al Zulo store and the purse contained an ID and it was Marianne's ID. So as police are looking into George, they discover that he may have been embezzling money from the company. As a matter of fact, he was embezzling money. And it's believed that Marianne had probably just found out that he was doing this and probably confronted him about it. Police also quickly discover, our best friends here, life insurance policies. There was one for each of them. So one for Marianne and one for George in the amount of, I believe, $150,000. And that was probably a common thing to do in terms of like a business arrangement. In case one of their untimely passings, the $150,000 would help buy out the other half of the business. So the life insurance policy wasn't as suspicious in this case because it was such a common practice in scenarios like this, but it was also potentially a motive especially considering George was cooking the books, so to speak, and embezzling money. Now back to the trash bag with all those things in it. Well, there was a pair of gloves in it that they were able to get DNA from. And there was blood on those gloves and blood on the hammer. The blood matched Mary Ann. There was fingerprints on some of the items. The fingerprints and the DNA found inside the gloves, well, they were a positive match to George Hansen. So George was arrested for her murder. Now he says, I didn't do it. I left the office the night before around 5.15 p.m. He says he then went to a couple of bars, had a few drinks. He had gone out and done things with his wife, with his daughter. He had an itinerary of things he did during the time where she would have been murdered. He says the reason why his fingerprints were inside those gloves with, with Marianne's blood on it is because he actually went back to the office at seven, about seven o'clock that same night that she would have been killed, noticed she was dead, with the bloody gloves next to her body, basically, and other items of his that had blood on it. So he says in order to not be considered a suspect, he scooped them all up and he put them in a trash bag. Later confirmed by a witness who saw his truck with his specific license plate 
by the bridge where the trash bag was overthrown, so he probably had to make up a story as to why he threw the bag over as well, or to account for why he was there. But the jury would also learn that George and Mary Ann did not have a great relationship. That on the afternoon that she would have been later killed, they had a loud argument in the office, a private argument, likely about the fact that she had caught him embezzling money. And so George, who to this very day still denies having any involvement in the murder, he was convicted by the jury. He says he regrets not calling 911 the night before when he found her body, that he should have done it then. Okay, sure. But the mountain of physical evidence, circumstantial evidence, the motive, life insurance policy, embezzling, the arguments, the fact that, didn't like, that she didn't like him very much, it was clear he did it. And so he was sentenced to 60 years in prison, which for him is the rest of his life. Womp womp. Some people would refer to this case as the Reservoir Dogs Killers. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Michael Moss. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael Moss, pictured here, showing his love of motorcycles. He was born in 1984, and he lived in England. At the time of the story, he is 15 years old, and he is attending, I guess, a special school. His father had died, and he was apparently going through a lot of grief and expressing a lot of anger and kind of, at times, violent. And he was disruptive in his normal class, so that's why he was moved to this school. He was also living in a children's home because... His mom was having a hard time, you know, taking care of him through these, like, violent kind of outbursts. But other than that, Michael was actually a really good kid. He was just not handling the loss of his father very well, which is understandable. On November 13th, 1999, these three teenage boys would lure Michael out to a park in the Liverpool area. Alan Bentley was under the impression that Michael Moss was trying to get with his girlfriend, and that made him really mad. So he wanted to enact his revenge. So he and his two friends, Graham Neary and Mark McKeefrey, well, according to them later, they that day watched the movie Reservoir Dogs. And they say that this helped inspire them to do what they were going to do to Michael Moss. They knew Michael loved motorcycles, and so they lured him out to this park with this promise of seeing this cool new motorcycle. When he arrived, they cornered him and brought him to a secluded area where they stripped him naked and then they beat him and they stabbed him for two hours. One of them would say they took penalty hits with his head, meaning they, they pictured his head as being a football and they were kicking it as if they were playing football. One of the boys tried to sever off his ear and they sang the song Stuck in the Middle with You as they were torturing him to recreate a scene from Reservoir Dogs. They then played tic-tac-toe on his back with a knife. They carved the game into his back while he was alive. And then after all of that torture and pain and all of the 49 stab wounds, Michael Moss died. He would be discovered later on that morning. He had 10 broken ribs. His cervical vertebrae was broken. He had 50 bruises to his body and 49 stab wounds. His face was unrecognizable. This also happened a few years after the James Bulger case, so this was like another painful reminder of that. The three boys were found and they were arrested. It was discovered quickly that they were the killers. They would all get convicted, all got life sentences with parole, and since then, all three of them have been released into the world. When you board a cruise ship, you of course never expect to be murdered at sea. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Mickey Kanasaki. Viewer discretion is advised. Mickey Kanasaki was originally from Japan. When she was about five or six years old, though, her family moved to the United States. And that was around 1960 or so. Later on in life, Mickey would become a secretary at a law firm where she would meet a fireball of a lawyer called Lonnie Kukontes. The two of them would start a romantic relationship that eventually would lead to marriage and they lived in a beautiful home in Orange County, California. But the happy marriage did not last very long. Mickey would tell friends that Lonnie was a very controlling person, and he could have kind of like an aggressive personality. Six years after they got married, they would divorce. But then in 2006, Mickey was under the impression that Lonnie wanted to attempt to rekindle their relationship. Lonnie said to her, I promise I'm going to do things better. I'm going to work less. I'll be less aggressive. And so what he did was he booked them a cruise 
to maybe kind of restart this relationship. The cruise was aboard the Island Escape, and they were going to be uh, basically going around Italy. They would explore the sites in Italy, and they seemingly have a great time. But two days into the cruise, everything would change. On May 25th, 2006, that night, they had some wine in their room. And then according to Lonnie, uh, Mickey would get up to go find some herbal tea. Lonnie then says he took an Ambien and he fell quickly asleep. When he woke up at 4.30 in the morning, Mickey was not in the room. So he goes out looking for her on the ship. However, he has absolutely no luck finding her. He notifies the crew and then the crew begins a very extensive search of the, of the vessel, but they too cannot find her. Then when the ship docks in Naples, he packs up his belongings and Mickey's belongings and he disembarks. Lonnie then flies back to the United States, and then, on May 27, 2006, the body of Mickey Kanasaki was found floating off of the Italian coast. The autopsy would show that she was murdered. She specifically had been strangled to death. There was no water in her lungs, which basically indicated that she was dead before she was in the water, which means suspicion immediately fell onto Lonnie. In every interview after that, he kept referring to Mickey as the body, not by her name. Police also learned that when he returned to the States after Mickey disappeared, he immediately went to a girlfriend's house. And according to her, he seemed completely unemotional. Didn't seem phased at all by her disappearance. When police interviewed this girlfriend, who by the way was also an ex-wife of Lonnie's, she would eventually tell police that Lonnie had made plans to possibly kill his wife, Mickey. And he was going to inherit the nearly $2 million estate of Mickey's upon her death. So Lonnie was arrested and charged with her murder. The evidence against him was pretty much largely circumstantial. There really wasn't much physical evidence at all. You know, the ship itself and their, their room that they were staying in was not forensically tested in any way, but they had enough strong circumstantial evidence that they could go to trial with this. He would try to say that Mickey was violent and, you know, she had a bad temper. She was suicidal. He said that the girlfriend slash ex-wife was lying about him saying he wanted to hurt or kill Mickey. But what they did know is that Mickey was murdered. She was strangled and then she was thrown off of that ship. The only one on that ship who had any means to do so or a motive was Lonnie. And the financial part of it was huge. So the jury found him guilty and they convicted him of her murder. And for killing his ex-wife, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A realtor is found murdered inside of a property. And finally, police think they know who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Mike Emmert. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this story, Mike was married to Mary Beth Emmert, and the two of them were realtors. They worked in Seattle and they lived in Redmond, Washington. By every account, the two of them were madly in love with each other. They had a great life. They were both incredibly successful. Mike would win real estate awards and they seemed to have no enemies in the world. It was January 4th, 2001. Mike received a call from a man he knew as Stephen. Stephen said he was interested in buying a home that Mike had showed him the previous day. His wife, Mary Beth, did not ever meet Stephen, but Mike would describe him as a man in his like 50s. He walked with a cane and had a limp. So on January 4th, he goes to meet this man at about 11.30 a.m. He goes to show the man this property in Woodenville, and at approximately 12.30 p.m., the owner of the home would come back to her house for lunch. She saw the front door was open, and then she heard running water coming from upstairs. When she went up there, she saw that the bathtub and the shower were running, and in the tub was the body of Mike Emmert. He had been beaten and stabbed. After reaching out to his wife, they would find out that his ring and his watch were stolen, but Mike's wallet and his cell phone would be found later in Seattle, just like abandoned. And then his Cadillac Escalade was also found later. The murder of Mike Emmert appeared to be very well planned, that this was orchestrated, that this was probably even a hit, that this Stephen person may have been a hired hitman, but why would anyone want to do that to Mike? They couldn't come up with anyone who had any grudges against him, no enemies, no bad business dealings, nothing. They don't know who on earth would want to do this to him. They don't think robbery was the motive. 
Police believe that the man with the cane may have been faking this, you know, uh, handicap. They think that the cane may have been used to actually bludgeon Mike and there may have been a hidden knife or even like a skinny sword um, in there in which it was used to stab and kill Mike. At one point, a man named Jeffrey Solo was considered a suspect. He walked with a limp, he had a criminal history, but police were able to rule him out. Mike's murder would go cold and it would go unsolved. And then in 2011, police reopened the case. They found some items with DNA on it that did not belong to Mike or any of the owners of the home. The DNA came back to this man, Gary Kruger. He was a former police officer. He had been linked to four other previous murders where the victims were completely unrelated. This adds more fuel to the fact that he may have actually been a hitman, but for who? Well, that question has never been answered and it likely never will be because Gary Kruger is dead. About three or four months before the DNA came back from Mike's crime scene belonging to him, he drowned in a lake after he was seen robbing a home and he was escaping the home, went into the lake and he drowned and he died. He had been linked to other robberies as well as those other murders. But again, police have no idea who may have hired him if he was a hitman and why there was a hit put on Mike Emmert. That part is still a mystery. They did find out that there was a point after he retired from the police force that he actually worked in real estate. And one of the other people he may have killed was a real estate lawyer. So maybe this was related to some kind of real estate thing. Maybe this was about eliminating competition, perhaps. But all they know is that he was present at the crime scene where Mike Emmert was found murdered and he had no reason or business to be in that home. He did not know the homeowners. He was not a real estate person for that home. So it's pretty clear that he is the likely murderer of Mike Emmert. But in the end, Mike doesn't get his justice. Mary Beth doesn't get justice for her husband. And nobody knows why this ever happened. Hello, true crimeers. This is another missing or murdered indigenous woman case. And this is the case of Minnie Rainbow Andy. Viewer discretion is advised. Unfortunately, like many indigenous women cases, I really don't have much information to provide to you. This is the only confirmed photo of her that I could find. But Minnie Rainbow Andy was born on February 27th, 1986. She lived in Wapato, Washington, and she was described as someone who loved to fish, she loved swimming, and she loved embracing her culture and going to powwows. She loved the beaches in Hawaii, and she loved being an ant. But on July 9th, 2017, Minnie's life would come to a tragic end. The incident allegedly took place on 70 Egan Road in Wapato, Washington, and Minnie had just been found um, on the ground with several blunt force injuries to her body. She had severe injuries to her head and her chest. She was rushed to the nearest hospital, but would be soon pronounced deceased. Her death was absolutely ruled a homicide, but all I really know from that point moving forward is that one man was indicted for her murder, Christopher Levon Lagme, a 31-year-old from the area. He was indicted in September of 2017 for her murder. But then sometime later, they dropped all charges against that man. And he was released, and the charges were dropped without prejudice, which means that they could uh, put those charges back on him at a later date. But this happened a few years ago and there's been, there's no updates. This is it, this is the last update there is. There's virtually no news coverage of her murder. There is really no stories about her. If you search her name, uh, really the first few links are, is something about her, but very, very brief information. And then the rest is about Minnie Mouse and stuff like that. Nothing else about her or her case or where it stands. She was murdered by someone. Someone beat her to death with a blunt force object. They apparently had someone, but I guess they didn't have the evidence. I'm not sure because there's really no explanation. And that is, that's, that's the case kind of frequently in cases like this, where it's, it's an indigenous woman. Ugh, you know, people just have this, eh, well, who cares kind of attitude. I read a quote from uh, one story I was doing about an indigenous woman. And the quote was, if you want to get away with murder in this, in this country, just kill an indigenous woman. And that, that really does appear to be accurate, sadly. I wish I knew more about Minnie. I wish I knew more information to give you guys. I wish I had more details about the investigation into her murder, but I have nothing. 
And that's not fair to her. That's not fair to her family. And that's not fair to all the indigenous women out there. It just simply isn't fair and it isn't right. I hope that one day she gets justice because she deserves it just like anybody else. Times with this ax, but managed to still go about his morning routine. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Peter Porco. Viewer discretion is advised. Peter and Joan Porco lived in Bethlehem, New York. They had raised two sons who by the time this case occurs are full grown adults. Christopher Porco is a 21 year old student at the University of Rochester. And then their son, Jonathan is in the United States Army. Peter was a clerk for the New York State Supreme Court. And at the time of this case, he's 52 years old. It was November 15th, 2004. Peter had failed to show up for his job at the Supreme Court. And so another associate of his was sent to the home to check up on him because he also, they weren't answering their phone. And this was extremely unusual. This associate found what looked like the spare key to the house in the actual door and the door was partially ajar. He then looked down and he saw drops of blood on the cement leading to the door. And then when he walked in, it was a bloodbath. He found Peter Porco lying at the foot of the stairs, just covered in blood. It appeared he had been walking in his own blood. There was blood just all over the entryway. It just looked like an absolutely horrific attack occurred here. So obviously the police and ambulance are called and when they arrive, they head upstairs and they notice more carnage. There is a woman lying on the master bedroom bed with an ax next to her and the bed is covered. It's just drenched. It's saturated in blood. They could tell that Peter Porco was probably lying on this side and he must have been attacked on this side because there is an astronomical amount of blood there. But by a miracle, Joan was actually still alive. She was fighting for her life, but she was still there. And so she was rushed to the hospital. And when she is basically before she goes into a coma, a detective asks her, hey, did your son Jonathan do this? And reportedly, according to him, she shook her head no. And then he asked her, did your son Christopher do this? And then she allegedly nodded her head yes. What led them to even prompting that question? I'm not 100% sure. Now, here's what's very disturbing. Based on the blood evidence there at the scene, I'm talking about outside and, you know, just throughout the house, they believed that Peter Porco was actually alive after he was struck by the ax 16 times. There was evidence that he got up out of bed after being hit 16 times. He went to the bathroom. He did his thing in the bathroom. He then goes downstairs to get ready for the day. The blood evidence continues in the kitchen where it shows he actually made a pot of coffee. The coffee was still hot. He had written out a check to pay off one of Christopher's uh, speeding tickets. He actually goes outside the house to pick up the paper while holding his cup of coffee. He then goes back to the house, but the door is locked now because he locked himself out. He found the spare key that was hidden under a rock somewhere, put it in the door to unlock the house, and he goes back in. And then he falls dead at the base of the stairs shortly after walking back in. Even though he was struck 16 times by an ax, part of the brain was still properly functioning that allowed him to continue to do his morning routine. Joan Porco would survive, but she had some pretty severe damage to her face, her head, her brain. When she finally awoke from her coma, she said that she actually had no memory of who did this. And so it was no longer uh, Christopher. She even released a statement basically saying that, uh, you know, it wasn't him. Please, it's not him. He did not do this. But the damage that she suffered to her brain was so severe that she just wasn't going to have the recollection to help identify who did this. Christopher was brought in. He was told, hey, your mom initially identified you. And she's like, I don't know why she would say that. They look more into Christopher and his background. And it turns out he had basically flunked out of Rochester, was later readmitted, but he was readmitted because he forged documents from another school. And then they found out that he, his father and mom found out recently that he had forged like loan documents in, in Peter's name. And they found an email where Peter emailed Christopher and said, I'm going to the authorities about this. We love you. We want you to succeed, but we also can't let this happen. And then two weeks later, they both end up axed in their home. Christopher says, well, I was at the University of Rochester the entire night. However, his roommate said he was not. They then meticulously looked through all of the CCTV footage on the freeways and highways between Rochester and the, the home. They see his distinct yellow Jeep leaving the campus around 10.30 p.m. 
the alarm system to the Porco home was disabled at 2.14 a.m., which is actually pretty much the exact time it would take to get from Rochester to the Porco house. The phone lines were cut at 4.59 a.m., and then he was seen driving back to campus at 8.30 a.m. The window of time, it worked. It was perfect. He absolutely could have driven from school to the house, killed them, and gotten back in plenty of time. They would confirm that there was like little things on his Jeep that made it distinct, that proved it was his Jeep they saw driving away. He had a toll booth tag in his car. They took DNA from it, and they did that just to prove that he was the one physically in that car who passed by that toll booth who they saw driving, you know, basically on the roads, and the DNA was a 100% match. It was Christopher's DNA putting him in his vehicle. So he was officially arrested and he was charged with murder and assault. He would continually deny he had any involvement. He said the real killers are still out there somewhere. His mom, who he bludgeoned with an ax and intended to kill, literally was by his side the entire time defending him, saying there was no way he could do this. And she was his champion while he was in court for the murder of her husband and his dad. But the evidence against him was absolutely overwhelming. The motive was there, the, the tra tracking his vehicle was there, the fact that he was one of the only few people who knew the code to disarm the alarm. Now, there wasn't any blood evidence found in his vehicle, so they believed he must have changed his clothes or was wearing some kind of suit over himself when he killed them, or tried to kill, you know, his mom and killed his dad. But everything else forensically, it lined up. He was the one. He did it. And so, a jury found him guilty, and they convicted him and Christopher Porco was sentenced to 50 years in prison. It has been 29 years since she was last seen. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rachel Geraldine Pratt. Viewer discretion is advised. Rachel Pratt was born on May 8th, 1979, and she was one of, I believe, eight siblings. The family lived here in Garden City, Kansas, and the date was January 16th, 1995. Rachel's mom was working a late shift that night, but she would come home a little bit earlier than usual at about 2 a.m. When she got home, Rachel wasn't there. So she waited up all night. She sat in the living room and waited for Rachel to come home, but she never did. At some point around 5 a.m., she says she thinks she hears a car really close to the house that sounded a lot like the car that Rachel's boyfriend drove. So the mom would then ask the siblings, hey, when was the last time you saw Rachel? And they all said right around one o'clock in the morning. They had been up watching a movie. It ended around one. They went to bed and that's the last time they saw Rachel. And then her mom gets home at two o'clock in the morning. So at some point between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., Rachel disappeared. So Rachel was reported missing to police. They would discover that she brought no belongings with her, no extra clothes, her identification, her social security card, all left at home. The only thing that was seemed to be missing was her jacket. She was always considered a really good kid, a good student. She had never run away from home. She always obeyed her curfew and never caused problems. But then the police would find out that Rachel may have been pregnant at the time and she was 15 years old. They discovered that her 18 year old boyfriend had gotten her pregnant when she was 14. So she had actually gotten arrested just a month or so prior to the disappearance for stealing a pregnancy test. That's how it was found out because nobody knew she had this older boyfriend. And so once the mom found out, they were basically pressing charges against him. And Rachel was supposed to be testifying in the upcoming, I guess, hearing regarding this case. But then she disappeared and the charges were dropped. Rachel hasn't been seen since and we're almost at 29 years. There is hope amongst the authorities that she may still be alive out there, but with it being almost 29 years and not one person ever seeing her, she never once used her uh, social security number after her disappearance. She never tried to reorder a uh, her identification card. So there is that thought that she may have met with foul play. Did her boyfriend do something to prevent her from testifying? Well, if he did, he hasn't been arrested. And to my knowledge, he hasn't been charged or anything because they have no body. Rachel may look like this today if still alive. There's been no reports of anyone looking like her giving birth. If you have information, please call 620-276-1300. This is the last known image of a young girl just hours before she would be murdered. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Global Cold Cases. 
And this is the case of Raynard Murray. Viewer discretion is advised. At the time of this case, Raynard Murray was a 17-year-old girl who grew up in Glengarry, which is in South Dublin, Ireland. She was one of three kids. She had a brother and a sister. I guess Raynard was planning on attending the arts program at University College Dublin. And at the time of this case, she was working at a boutique. Raynard was a big fan of reading. She loved poetry. And she loved, like, theater, like going to plays. And her passion was to one day she wanted to become a writer. But sadly, that would never get to happen. It was September 3rd, 1999. Raynard had been working at the boutique here at this shopping center. When she got off of work that evening, she was seen on CCTV with a friend leaving that shopping center. And then they were heading to a nearby pub. Uh, I guess specifically the Scott's Bar. They were there until about 11.20 p.m. when she decided to leave, but she was planning on meeting back up with her friends later that night. But she left the bar and she was going to make the 15-minute walk back to her home. She would end up walking down this laneway. I guess this is between Silchester Road and her house at Silchester Park. Now, witnesses would later say they heard the sound of a woman screaming, possibly the sound of a woman screaming, fuck off leave me alone and go away. At 12.20 a.m., Raynard's sister would actually find her body in that laneway. Police were called, an ambulance was there, but she would be pronounced deceased at the scene. Raynard had been stabbed four times. This was in the side of her body, in her chest, and in her shoulder. Based on the blood evidence, it appears that she was able to actually get up and, and walk about 200 feet before she collapsed and then died. This was literally 50 yards from her front door. And that's why her sister discovered her because it was so close to the house. Raynard was not sexually assaulted and nothing was stolen from her. This is apparently a composite drawing of a man who was apparently seen in the area around the time the murder would have happened. This may be the suspect, but this person has never been identified. A motive has never truly been established either. Over the years, the Irish Guardi have interviewed like 8,000 people. They've even arrested some people, but have never actually been able to pre press charges on anyone. A profiler would say that the killer was likely a young man in his mid to late 20s, single, lives at home with his parents. He is likely a loner and a possible illegal substance user and may have been in psychiatric care at one point. The profiler believes that this is someone who would likely kill again and it's probably someone local who is very familiar with this particular area. By 2008, the Gardi had basically reopened like a cold case team to work on this case. They discovered that there were some issues with the initial investigation, like witness statements that weren't followed up on, that the murder weapon wasn't searched for enough because the murder weapon was never found. They also want to try some new theories that maybe this wasn't what the profiler said it would be. Maybe this was someone who knew Raynard. They couldn't find any other similar attacks or murders like this that had happened in that time frame. The, you know, new people working on this would even say that this may have been like a grudge type killing, that this was done in like, out of anger maybe. There was also a theory that they floated out there that maybe this was actually a woman. A lot of people, from what I understand, have actually suggested that. It was dark that night and, you know, maybe this is the suspect, but maybe they're just a little bit off with their description. Apparently there was like a memorial location for Raynid that had been defaced at one point, which could mean a number of things. It could be the killer who did it or it could just be some random asshole. But here it is now in 2023 and her murder has still gone unsolved. And somebody out there has got to know the truth about what happened that night to Raynard Murray. And her family deserves justice. If you have any information about who killed Raynard Murray, please contact the Garda Confidential Line at 1-800-666-111. You can report your information anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Police in Alberta, Canada are asking for the public's help in trying to identify this person. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rachel Alpeche. Viewer discretion is advised. This particular story happened on February 1st, 2022, here in Red Deer, which is in Alberta, Canada. 
At approximately 6 p.m. that day, Rachel Alpeche had gone to her car to start it up. It was cold, so she wanted to warm the vehicle up. She then goes back into her home and then comes back a few minutes later when she notices there is someone in her car trying to steal it. So Rachel, she jumps onto the hood of the car in an attempt to get the person to stop. But the person does not stop. He or she speeds away. Rachel falls off the hood of the car and then is run over by the car. When police arrive and an ambulance arrives, she is sadly pronounced deceased. And then the person had just gone off with the vehicle. A couple of days later, her 2018 Kia Rio was found. If they collected any evidence in terms of like fingerprints or DNA from the car to match to anyone, I'm not 100% sure. So police found CCTV footage from two different locations. This one was from about 6 p.m. in the area of where the incident occurred. They have not stated that this person is actually a suspect, but this person may have information about who did this or just anything. And so they've been asking for this person to come forward. They found another image about five kilometers away, at, and this is about 6.15 p.m., of the same person. Again, they've just stated that the, this person is a person of interest, and at this point, they just want to know if they have information. But if they are a suspect, I, again, I am not sure. These photos right here were taken from the Nyberg Avenue area. But unfortunately, they have gotten no tips, no one has come forward, and Rachel's case is still unsolved. Rachel and her family, they deserve justice. And so if you have any information about this case, please call 403-343-5575. You can also call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. And you can always report your tips anonymously. 33 years after a woman's body was found, she would finally be identified, but the killer is still out there. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Roberta Lynn Weber. Viewer discretion is advised. It was April 23rd, 1990 in Volusia County in Florida, and I guess near Daytona. A person was just on a walk when they noticed on the side of the road a skeleton. When police arrive, they do in fact confirm that these are the remains of a person, but it was not the complete body. However, the more they looked, they found other portions of this skeleton kind of in the same area, but scattered. There was no clothing with her. There was no identification, no wallet. There was a nylon rope around her neck. And so the coroner did determine that this person was murdered and that it was the body of a female. However, they had absolutely no idea who she was. So she would be nicknamed the Volusia County Jane Doe. Sometime afterwards, they would come up with this clay recreation of what the woman may have looked like. I guess they said that her hair was tied up in pigtails. The clay recreations always seem to, they're just always seem to be very unnerving. But, you know, they put this image out there and nobody responded to it. Many years later, they would then change that and come up with this digital recreation of what she may look like. But again, nothing came from it. And then just this year, 2023, they would use genealogical testing using like the ancestry, you know, sites to build up her family tree and kind of find out who her family might be. And that's how they found her sister in Missouri. And that's how police discovered that their Jane Doe was likely this woman, 32 year old mother of three, Roberta Lynn Weber, or she would go by Bobby to a lot of people. Apparently, the last time the sister ever saw her was in 1989. The police tracked down her three children, and they said the last time they saw her also was in 1989. She had just gotten divorced from her husband. Their marriage lasted about 10 years. But the thing is, is it doesn't seem like anyone filed a missing persons report. The sister would say that she just assumed that she either moved to California or she was just dead. And so her kids thought she abandoned them or she was dead. It's sad that, like, no one seemed to be looking for her. And here's the other thing is, I don't know where she disappeared from. I know she wasn't from Florida. One detective I saw an interview with said that she was from California. But then her sister said they assumed she had moved to California when she disappeared. But moved from where? I don't know. And there really isn't much more information other than that. They have now reopened her murder investigation. 
So if you have information, please call 386-254-1537. An indigenous woman's killer would be murdered themselves the following day. Hello, true crimeers. This is another missing or murdered indigenous woman case. And this is the case of Rosenda Strong. Viewer discretion is advised. Rosenda Strong was a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. At the time of this story, she's 31 years old. She's a mother of four children. Everyone described her as an incredibly outgoing woman. She was very friendly, and people said you can always distinguish her from her very unique laugh. At the time of this story, in 2018, Rosenda is living with her sister, Sissy. And on the night of October 2nd, 2018, Sissy would lend some money to Rosenda. Rosenda then got into, I guess, a vehicle with some of her friends, and then they would head to the Legends Casino in Toppenish. And this is in Washington State, by the way. That same night at the casino, Rosenda actually ran into her aunt. The two of them hugged, they chatted for a minute. And according to her, the aunt, Rosenda seemed really bubbly. She was happy. She was her normal self. She was having fun. And then at around midnight, someone would see Rosenda leaving the casino with a man. And this appeared to be a voluntary action. And then she was never seen or heard from again. For nine months, she was just another missing indigenous woman, something that unfortunately happens far too often with no publicity, with no real media coverage. It appeared that Rosenda was just going to become yet another tick on a long list of unsolved ticks. Her family held out hope that, they, that she was out there somewhere alive, begging for her to come home, begging for whoever has her to let her come home. Nine months later, they would get the very unfortunate answer. On July 12, 2019, two homeless men would discover one of those large freezers just left abandoned. And this was like on the outskirts of the Yakima Reservation. And inside that freezer was a body, later confirmed to be that of 31-year-old Rosenda Strong. The missing persons case then became a homicide investigation, but there wouldn't be any news until July 1st, 2023. In November of 2018, the body of this woman would be discovered. Her name was Jedida Moreno. At first, there was no connection between her and Rosenda's murders until police came out with the information. They would reveal that it was Jedida Moreno who actually shot and killed Rosenda Strong the night she went missing. Both women were at a house with a few other male acquaintances. The two women got into an argument when Jedida took out a gun and she shot Rosenda. She then had the other men help her hide the body. The following day, she got into an argument with some of those men. They took out a gun and then they shot her dead and then dumped her body. Five men have been indicted, but this just happened. So this is still ongoing. If you recognize one of these images, then it's possible you may know a killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Rosie Tapia. Viewer discretion is advised. Rosa Maria Tapia, who would go by Rosie, she was born on January 17th, 1989 in Salt Lake City, Utah. She was one of five total kids. Rosie was described as a very dramatic young girl, full of energy. She was like free-spirited, who just loved to listen to music, who loved dancing. She loved playing Super Nintendo. She loved being outside with her friends and riding her bike. But at the age of six, all of that would be taken away from her and everyone who loved her. It was August 13th, 1995. Rosie's mom would wake up at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and when she went to check in on the kids, she noticed that Rosie was not in her bed. And then she sees that the window to the bedroom, the screen, had been pulled off. And so she immediately, frantically starts searching everywhere. She can't find her. So the police are called, and a search begins right away. And by the way, this is just another look at the window that Rosie would have been kidnapped from, because they do believe that she was kidnapped. Police did find a shoe impression on a towel that was on top of a dresser in her room, and they determined that the screen had been pulled from the outside of the window. Unfortunately, just a few short hours later, at approximately 10 o'clock in the morning, near a canal, the body of the six-year-old girl was found. She was face down in the water. The coroner determined that her cause of death was drowning, and she was sexually assaulted. One of her older siblings uh, had been babysitting her the night before. And then earlier in the afternoon, the day before she would have been taken, the sister said that Rosie went to go out and play at the playground when, uh, when it got dark, all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. And then a man that she described looks like this was there holding Rosie in his arms saying that she got hurt. 
So he gave her to the sister and then he said, bye Rosie, and he then walked away. This is a fully grown adult man that no one in the apartment had ever seen before. And they had no idea how he even knew her name or where she lived. I guess she could have told him, but he was described as a white man. He was wearing sunglasses and a baseball hat. It's possible this man may be the one who took and murdered Rosie. They put this sketch out there with a description of how they got the image. And you would think that maybe the man who brought Rosie back to the apartment would come forward to say, oh my God, that was me. Here's my DNA and all everything. You can take all of it because I wasn't the one who did that to her. But no, he's never come forward. Whoever that was has never come forward. A neighbor would say they saw a man who looked very similar to this, but in very wet clothing, walking away from the location where Rosie was found. He matched this description and he was in a pickup truck. But who is this man? Police, of course, would interview many, many, many people from the apartment complex. Uh, they would interview like friends that were close to this family, friends that may have gone to their house several times. I guess there was a friend of Rosie's father that kind of became a suspect or a person of interest because he was acting very strange after Rosie's disappearance. It almost appeared like he was trying to lead police away from the canal where she was found. However, he had a apparently a very solid alibi that police have, I guess, confirmed. He also had no criminal history and they, they just had nothing on him. And so her case has basically just gone cold ever since. In 2019, I guess the family hired a private investigator and he would go and interview a bunch of people. And I guess there was a witness that police had overlooked that was also a neighbor to them. And they gave a description of someone they saw. And that person looked like this. So the suspect was a friend of a man named Danny Woodland, who was an acquaintance of Rosie's sister, the one who was babysitting her. So this friend, Danny, said that he used to climb into through the window to see the sister and that his friend knew that he did this and knew that there was access to this apartment through the windows. But to my knowledge, police have not found any evidence linking this unknown person. I don't know his name. There really isn't any like DNA. There wasn't any fingerprints. The shoe impression could help. But now with that being decades later, it probably isn't going to help anything. I think they scraped underneath Rosie's fingernails, but I don't know if they've really gotten any actual DNA from anything. And if they have, and if they've run that DNA against all of these potential suspects, nothing's ever come up as a match because no one has ever been arrested for connection with this case. And it has gone unsolved ever since. So if you recognize one of these two men or you have any information about the kidnapping and murder of six-year-old Rosie Tapia from Salt Lake City, Utah, you can contact the Salt Lake City, Utah Police Department at 801-799-3000 or the cold case database tip line at 833-DPS-SAFE. Please, if you know anything about this young girl's murder, please let authorities know. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. Please help Rosie get the justice she rightfully deserves. Okay, so take a deep breath again, because nothing bad's going to happen to you. We're all here, okay? And this is, we're going to hopefully sort this for you today. Okay, so let's pull back the curtain. <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to be afraid of snowmen until I was introduced to Jeffrey the Snowman Dahmer over here. This is their idea of curing someone who's afraid of snowmen? By showing her the scariest, most terrifying, murderous snowman of all. Look at the way it's glaring at her. Like, that that snowman wants blood. Look at him. He is staring literal daggers into her back. If he had daggers, they would be in her back. You had John Wayne Gacy who dressed as a clown. You got this guy who dresses as a snowman. That might be the Zodiac Killer underneath that thing. Why is he standing with an attitude? That snowman needs the blood of children to survive. Fuck the hat, bring him to life. He needs the blood of children. Who are the professionals on this show? Because they don't need jobs anymore. Uh, also, what's Fabio's problem over here? Why does he have an attitude? You're upset that the stabbiest looking snowman of all time has scared the woman who was afraid of just normal snowmen? The snowman that was probably brought to life with the same curse that Chucky uses to make himself come alive. Also, fuck your buttons. Jesus Christ, hello! Hi! Okay. 
Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sean Vincent Gillis. Viewer discretion is advised. On February 27th, 2004, the body of Donna Bennett Johnston was found. She was found in a drainage canal in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There were tire tracks, fresh tire tracks near her body, which police would take images of and castings of. They did a very extensive search to see where that tire may have been purchased, and they kind of came into some luck. It was a very rare brand of tire. In fact, only 90 of those tires had been sold. They were able to narrow it down even further and found the car it belonged to. And it belonged to, oh, come on. Ugh. God, it looks like a Pomeranian died on your face. Well, it led to him, Sean Vincent Gillis. Then they collected DNA from him with a search warrant, and they discovered that his DNA matched DNA found with Donna's body. But it wasn't just her murder he was linked to with DNA. Then they got a warrant to search his home, and they found some extremely disturbing images on his computer. He had taken photos of Donna Johnston's mutilated and dismembered body, including images of her body in his trunk. They also found images of several other women who were also murdered. He used these images for self-gratification. <sighs> some people, some people. Sean Gillis was born on June 24th, 1962, and he basically lived his whole life in Baton Rouge. His dad abandoned him when he was a child, so he was raised by his mom and his grandparents. By the time he was 17, he already had a long list of issues with police, DUIs, possession of marijuana, contempt of court. And then in 1994, he would later confess that his first murder victim was Anne Bryan. She was 82 years old. He had broken into her house simply with the intent of sexually assaulting her, but when he touched her, she screamed. And so he says he then slit her throat to make her stop screaming, and then he stabbed her 50 times. He would then kill Catherine Hall. She was a woman who apparently lived on the streets and was a known user of illegal substances, and he just killed her and then threw her away like she was trash. He then killed Hardy Schmidt. He had stalked her when she was jogging, and he finally decided to do something to her. So he actually hit her with his car. He then forced her into his car, where he would then later sexually assault her, and then he murdered her. And then two days later, after storing her in a trunk, he dumped her body. He was also linked to the murder of Joyce Williams. Lillian Robinson, Marilyn Nevels, Johnny Mae Williams, and according to him, she was actually his friend. They had been friends for 10 years, and then he just, he just decided to kill her. He said his urge just, he couldn't fight his urges, and he just did it. And then Donna Bennett Johnson was his last victim. He had sexually assaulted her and then strangled her to death. He then slashed off her breasts, cut off her left nipple, he cut out a tattoo she had on her thigh, and then he severed off her arm at the elbow. And then he just threw her away like she was just a bag of garbage. But it was his tire tracks that would lead to her killer being caught, which then led to the DNA, which then led to them finding out that the DNA was also on several other of these women. And so basically the caterpillared mustache piece of human garbage would end up just confessing. God damn it, I hate this photo. So in 2007, I believe, he would plead guilty to the murder of Joyce Williams. And then in 2008, he was charged with the murders of Catherine Hall, Johnny Mae Williams, and Donna Bennett Johnston. And he was convicted for every murder he was charged with. God, and he was sentenced to multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. And he is just a... God, those eyes are utterly horrifying. He is just a sick man who did this for his own gratification. I don't understand how humans, there, that there are people out there who can be this way and be comfortable with it. Like he was doing these things and it was easy for him. He, he was comfortable with it. It gratified him. I don't understand it. He ended the lives of eight women. And some of these women, unfortunately, people just didn't seem to care about. And that's just what makes this, it just makes it worse. How are there people out there that exist that can do something like that to these eight people or anyone in general? I hope his life in prison has been nothing but complete and utter hell on earth. 27 body parts across multiple trash cans, and to this day, they're still trying to figure out 
who put him there. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Global Cold Cases, and this is the case of Seiichi Kawamura. Viewer discretion is advised. It was April 23, 1994, here at Nakashira Park in Tokyo, Japan, where a maintenance person was going around collecting garbage. When they got to one of the garbage cans, one of the bags had apparently ripped open, and what they noticed inside was something absolutely horrific. It contained several diced up human body parts. So the police were immediately informed. When they arrive, they go from trash can to trash can and they find another trash bag and then another trash bag and then another trash bag, every single one of them full of body pieces. The trash bags were tied with what they described as a very unusual knot, something that only fishermen would probably know, fishermen in the area. And the bags also had holes cut in them to drain any excess liquid from them. The body parts themselves were diced into like 20 centimeter by 30 centimeter cubes. In the end, they had collected most of a single human body. However, it was missing its torso, the head, and also the genitals, of which have none of those have ever been found. The fingerprints and the feet prints were basically scraped off, but whoever did this missed one finger. And through that, they were able to identify the victim. His name was Seiichi Kawamura. He was last seen alive on April 21st, 1994, so just a few days before his body was found. When he didn't come home that night, his wife would report him missing and, you know, her and family and police would go out searching for him. But obviously they would never find him. Whoever did this to him knew what they were doing. Mean, they were very precise. These were people who were very, very skilled with the human body and knew how to make very clean cuts in the way they did. But whoever did this has never been identified. There was a theory that because he had recently left a religious group that he was a part of, that maybe this was a retaliation for him leaving it. But ultimately, people believe that he may have fallen into the wrong crowd, possibly with an organized crime syndicate. Maybe they were retaliating against him for something. Three days after they found his body, China Airlines Flight 143 crashed, and pretty much this took all the investigators away. Then in 1995, there was the sarin gas attacks on one of their subway systems. So the investigation into his murder really never got a good jump start. They investigated for 11 months, but never found anything. And unbelievably, they have a statute of limitations, and it has expired, meaning whoever did it will never be arrested for it. He was just trying to see if the young boy was safe, and he died for it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Sergeant Roger Motley. Viewer discretion is advised. Roger Lamar Motley was born on August 15th, 1955. And at the time of this case, he is married and he has four children and he is living in Opelika, Alabama. And at the time of this case, he was a sergeant for the Opelika Police Department there in Alabama. He had been doing that for 18 years. It was October 4th, 1993, when Linda Lyon Block, her nine-year-old child, and her common-law husband, George Sibley, they had parked their car at a Walmart parking lot there in Alabama. A person who was shopping at Walmart had left the store and noticed the car with a nine-year-old boy in it, and this person felt that something was off, that the boy may be in danger. It looked to them, to this customer, that the boy was trying to, like, call for help. So this passerby just so happened to notice that Roger Motley was there in the shopping area and she called attention to him to go check on the car. The customer also said she believed that the family may be living in the car. So Sergeant Motley parks his vehicle behind their car and he gets out and he approaches the vehicle. Now Linda was not in the car at the time because she had gotten out to go to the payphone. But Mr. Sibley was in the car and Roger Motley came to him and asked him for his driver's license. George told him, I don't have to have a driver's license. And then he says he sees the officer put his hand on his gun. And so he pulls out a gun that he has and he begins to fire several rounds at Sergeant Motley. Linda hears the commotion. She runs back towards the car and she sees what's going on. So she takes out a gun that she has. Witnesses would state they saw her running towards... Sergeant Motley, she then stopped, 
She then squatted down, pointed the gun at him, and fired several rounds at him. He had been hit directly in the chest by one of her bullets. Sergeant Motley had given his bulletproof vest to another officer just recently. So the bullets that he took were fatal, and he died. So Linda and George were both arrested because police had arrived by that time. The two of them refused to work with their attorneys. They said they had acted in self-defense. They said Alabama did not have the authority to even try them because Alabama was not properly readmitted into the Union after the American Civil War. Now, by the way, they were on the run from Florida because they assaulted her ex-husband, like violently stabbed him. So they were charged with capital murder and both were convicted and both were sentenced to death. She was executed on May 10th of 2002 and he was executed on August 4th, 2005. I don't know what happened to the nine-year-old, but he got justice. A young girl was playing hide and seek with some friends and in an unfortunate twist, she has never been found. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Shannon Marie Sherrill. Viewer discretion is advised. Shannon was born on August 12th, 1980, and her and her family lived here in Thorntown, Indiana. There really isn't much information about Shannon because she was only six years old when this happened. She was a student at Thorntown Elementary, and I believe she had one sibling, a younger brother. It was October 15th, 1986. The six-year-old girl who lived at a trailer park with her mom and her brother, she was outside playing hide and seek with about nine or 10 other kids. And this is at around 1.30 p.m. The neighborhood, by the way, was at the 600 block on Plum Street. From what they understand, Shannon was last seen going behind a trailer, possibly to hide playing the game. But then they couldn't find her. And when it came time to wrap up the game and everyone were to go home, the neighborhood kids said they didn't know where Shannon was. The family, the neighbors, they all searched this entire neighborhood looking for her, but they came up with nothing. And so she was reported missing to police. Nobody saw her like running away. Nobody heard like a car coming up into the neighborhood or saw a car coming into the neighborhood. Nobody heard any scream as if someone had just been like taken. There just was no witnesses who could say they saw or heard a thing. Her parents who were divorced at this time, uh, they would both be questioned by police. They would both take polygraph tests. Both of them passed their polygraphs with flying colors and both of them were essentially cleared as having any involvement in whatever happened to her. The police would come out and say that this is a non-family abduction and that she was an endangered girl. Bloodhounds were used and I guess they were able to trace her scent to a nearby cornfield and then a cemetery, but then they lost the scent trail. The case goes cold for a very long time until 2003 when the family receives a phone call from a woman claiming that she thinks she is Shannon Cheryl. She would basically constantly contact them stating that she is the girl. The woman's name was Donna Lynette Walker. Turns out it was a hoax. It was all just a cruel joke on the family, possibly trying to extort money or something. So she was arrested and she got a dozen felony counts and she would end up getting 18 months in prison for it. Another suspect was a serial killer named David Elliott Penton, but he would end up getting cleared. If alive, Shannon may resemble this image. If you have information, please call 765-436-7677. A single discarded cigarette would lead to this. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks viewer discretion is advised. The Summerland Leisure Center wasn't really a theme park, but it was like a big entertainment center. It opened in 1971 and it was located on the Isle of Man, which I guess is between Great Britain and Ireland. It was this big open 50,000 square foot building. The exterior of the building and the interior of the building were actually built and designed by two different teams. Those teams did not join hands basically, and they didn't coordinate any of the construction planning at all. It was built to hold roughly 10,000 people. It would have things like a dance hall, it had a miniature golf course, it had a roller skating rink, it had a whole bunch of games. There were bars and restaurants. 
It was a place that people would go on holiday with their families. And on August 2nd, 1973, it was business as usual until 7.30 p.m. when all hell broke loose. So in the miniature golf course section, there were three teenage boys who were basically hiding and smoking a cigarette. One of them, when they were done, flicked the cigarette. And what it did is it ended up burning, I guess, one of the walls of this kiosk that they were sitting in. That kiosk was right against the exterior of this giant building. I guess this portion of the building was covered in galbestos. I guess this consists of steel sheeting with asbestos, but it's extremely combustible. And a fire started immediately. And before anyone could even notice or do anything, the fire was basically, it had engulfed the exterior of the building. The people on the inside had started to see like smoke coming through the vents, but there wasn't like this immediate panic and there wasn't like this immediate need to evacuate the building. Eventually the fire would actually burn through the fire alarm wires. So the alarm never even went off. Firemen weren't even called until 20 minutes after the fire started. And it wasn't by someone in the building, it was by people who were away from the building. One of them was a, uh, a guy who was on a ship. So it took longer for the correct authorities to get to the building. There were roughly 3,000 people in the building at the time. Once everyone realized what was happening finally, they all bum rushed towards the exit. The fire exit doors were locked. And so now you had all these people rushing out the same doors and they were all crushing each other. The fire had burnt up the roof and you had these what they called molten fire hot, basically like balls of fire falling from the ceiling and landing on people and starting more internal fires in the building. When it was all said and done, 50 people had died from being crushed to death or burning alive and 80 more people were seriously injured. This is a memorial that's put in its place nobody was held criminally responsible. This might be the image of a cold-blooded killer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Suya Kim. Viewer discretion is advised. Suya was originally from Seoul, South Korea, and then she met her future husband. His name was Su Young Kim, and so in 1981, they got married, and then they would eventually end up having two young boys. By the time all of that happens, they had already moved to the United States and they were working kind of at flea markets for a while and they wanted to uh, basically open up their own shop. And so eventually they were able to do that. They opened one shop in the Brooklyn, New York area and then another one was in Long Island, New York. They were a totally happy family. They were excited for this new life in America. But on June 29th, 1991, that would all end. That night around 8 p.m., Soo Young got home and noticed that his wife wasn't there, which was very unusual. So he starts to call around to her friends and they all say, no, I have not seen her. And he's calling everyone he can think of, but no one knows where she is. So later, Soo Young and his brother, they go into the parking garage where they would usually park their cars and they found her car there. And it was ice cold. She hadn't been, she wasn't driven in a very long time. And so at that point he became very concerned. And so he would call the police to basically report her missing. And then the following day, the police call him and say, we have found a woman's body and we need to know if this is Suya. He goes to the morgue and confirms that the body that they found was in fact Suya Kim. She had been stabbed nine times, was thrown into a dumpster, her clothes were taken off. They didn't see any evidence of a sexual assault, but they couldn't say that she wasn't. The way the body was discovered was kind of unusual. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, but essentially in the early morning hours, a security guard was walking around when he noticed a white male kind of struggling to put something in a dumpster. So the security guard, Joe Jones, he's asking this guy or telling this guy, hey, you can't dump things there, it's not allowed. The guy comes to him and says, how about I give you 20 bucks, is that okay? And Joe's like, okay, fine. So as the guy, again, recreation, but as the guy approaches Joe, he notices he has blood on his shirt and he gets a pretty good solid look at the guy. And then basically after the guy leaves, Joe waits a while and then he, along with another person, starts to dig through that dumpster to see what that man was putting in there and that's how they found her body. He gave a description of the vehicle that he saw with this man and eventually police, based on the license plate number he gave, he only had a partial plate number, they were able to trace a car to a Taiwanese foreign exchange student, but they quickly determined that this person, she had absolutely nothing to do with this. Again, they didn't have the full license plate number. They also gave a lie detector test to Joe Jones, you know, suspecting, oh, maybe this guy is lying and he was the person, but he passed the lie detector test with flying colors. And after looking more into him, police realized this isn't the guy. He did not do this. 
But this is the description that Joe gave um, based on his pretty much up close and personal experience with this man. This is the guy who was putting basically the body into the dumpster. So this is the killer. I mean, there is no doubt that this right here is the person who killed her. He was a white male wearing round glasses. He would have been in his 20s at that point, 1991. He was approximately five foot six, maybe weighed about 130 pounds. And the man was driving a blue Nissan at the time. Police do also kind of have this somewhat suspicion that he may actually have connections to that Taiwanese foreign exchange student to the car that they were able to link based on the partial license plate number. However, that person has never said anything about this guy. And really they were just kind of grasping at straws. But the point is, is they don't know who this is. They've never been able to identify him. No one has ever come forward. Somebody out there has got to recognize this man, or at least remembers someone who looked like this man back in 1991. The murder would have taken place likely in Brooklyn, New York, and that's where the body was found. So somebody somewhere out there knows the truth, and perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about who this man is, and any information about the murder of Su Ya Kim, please contact the New York City Police Department at 212-694-7781. No. In the middle of a conversation, a young woman would be abducted from a payphone, and it would take 16 years to finally catch her killer. Hello, true crimer-ers. This is the case of Tammy Bowers. Viewer discretion is advised. Tammy Lane Bowers was born on March 8th, 1971. She is described as someone with a humongous personality. She kind of loved to be the center of attention. She loved to goof around to make people laugh. She was just a really fun person. By 1990, she is living in Ascension Parish, which is in Louisiana. Tammy was going to school to become a nurse, and she had just recently moved in with a friend, and they had not set up a phone yet. And obviously, this is before everyone, you know, had cell phones. So she would use the payphone a lot. She would call her friends, she would call her family, she would have long conversations on payphones. This gas station was the regular place that she would go to use the payphone. And that's exactly where she was in March 6th, 1990. This was relatively close to where she actually lived. At 11 p.m., she uses that payphone to call one of her friends. They have a pretty lengthy conversation. They're laughing. They're having a good time talking. They were discussing her upcoming birthday because it was literally a couple days from this point. And then all of a sudden, the friend on the other line says that he hears her say, Oh, you startled me. And then he hears the sound of a scream and then a scuffle and then nothing. The friend would get into his car and rush to the location where he knew she was. The payphone was off the hook. This is not the actual one. Her glasses were sitting on the ground. Her car was there. The door was opened. The keys were in the ignition. Her purse was on one of the seats and nothing was stolen from it. But Tammy was gone. Two days later on her birthday, there is a body discovered. And on her 19th birthday, the body is identified as Tammy Bowers. She had been beaten, sexually assaulted, and she was stabbed. She was partially clothed. Next to her were a couple of clothing items that didn't belong to her, like this, and then also this shirt. Police would collect all of it, but in 1990, they didn't really have, they didn't really know what DNA testing truly was at that point, but thankfully they stored everything in, in a really good way. A witness would come forward to state, and he was a trucker, that he had been driving past this food store when he saw a young white woman talking on the payphone. And then he saw a car that he described as a Gran Torino had pulled up next to the payphone. 
a black male gets out of the car and begins walking towards the payphone area. But the man had been driven by and he didn't see what happened after that. There were no other witnesses who saw what happened. There were no witnesses who saw the body being either dumped or heard the sound of someone screaming in this area. It is believed that she was, you know, kidnapped, taken to this area where she was then assaulted and then killed. So where she was found was likely where she was killed. There was at some point a speculation that her ex-boyfriend may have been responsible for this. They had just broken up, but he was really upset about it. He did not want to break up, but Tammy did. He kept trying to get back with her. She kept saying no. He would come to the house and he would scare her and her roommate. And I guess he could get kind of violence, but police would look heavily into him. He did have an alibi. Now they couldn't do DNA testing like we have now, but they could do blood typing. The clothing items that were found next to her body did have blood and semen and they took that and were able to get the blood type from it and that blood type did not match his and at that point they knew he was not the killer. Fast forward now to 2006. DNA technology is obviously extremely advanced at that point. So they take DNA from this item and from this item which includes uh, hair samples that do not belong to Tammy, plug them into the system and they get a match. It belonged to 39-year-old Herman Frazier. He had a very long rap sheet, which is why his DNA was already in the system. Now, at first, he would deny he had anything to do with it. But then they showed him the DNA information, and he agreed to take a plea deal. He would plead guilty to manslaughter and second-degree kidnapping, and then was sentenced to 50 years in prison, without the chance of parole. He'll be about 90 years old when he's released. But then he drops a bombshell. He tells them, okay, I did it but I also had an accomplice, his friend Tolbert Morris. He was the guy driving the car, which was not a Gran Torino, but looked almost similar to a Gran Torino. And just by chance, they pulled into that parking lot where they found, you know, Tammy on the phone and they just, just decided to kidnap her. They took her to the area where she was essentially found. They sexually assaulted her, both of them did. And then they beat her with a wood log and then stabbed her. Forensics would find other DNA stains basically on those clothing items. They did not belong to Tammy, they did not belong to Herman. Using the mitochondrial DNA process, they were able to link those DNA samples to Tolbert. It was not a 100% match, but the odds of it being anyone else were very, very low. It seemed like Tolbert was really the mastermind of this whole thing. So he was convicted as well and sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. She was last seen leaving this building and then less than a week later, she was found in a ditch. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Tammy Haas. Viewer discretion is advised. Tamara Ann Haas, who would go by Tammy. She was born on April 13th, 1973. Tammy was described as a funny person. She loved to make her friends laugh. And she was just like this typical teenager. She loved talking on the phone. She loved boys. And she was just a really, really good friend. At the time of this case, she was dating this guy here, Eric Stuckel. They apparently had a pretty decent relationship. But that would all change on September 17th, 1992. Tammy and Eric were attending a homecoming party here at this barn, the Stevenson Barn. And I believe the barn was in Nebraska, but Tammy was from Yankton, South Dakota. So like just across the state line. According to other people at the party, Tammy and Eric were last seen walking down this road from the barn house. And this was sometime before midnight. Now, Eric says the two of them would walk to his home. And then from there, he says Tammy decided to walk home on her own. But Tammy never got home. And so she would be reported missing fairly quickly, but they wouldn't have to wait long. A couple of days later, off of this road, about two miles from the farm, in a ditch off of that road, the body of a young woman was found. That body would soon be identified as Tammy Haas. The coroner would determine that Tammy was killed by a broken neck, and she also had a few other minor injuries to her body. Obviously, she didn't do it herself. Someone did that to her. And so police had to track down her last movements and they had to interview 400 or so people that had last seen her. This included her boyfriend. From what I've read, there were witness accounts that I guess someone saw a male and a female having a significant argument 
I guess by a power plant that was near a dam that was really close to where all of this occurred, that this argument appeared to be violent with the man potentially dangling, I guess, the woman over a railing. And this was between 12.30 a.m. and 1 a.m. on now rolling into the morning of September 18th, 1992. So the farmhouse is here. I guess the argument was seen taking place up here. And then this is where her body was eventually found. Now, this is a more current image, but this is a location of a car wash that apparently Eric Stuckel was seen at cleaning his car thoroughly just 19 hours after she went missing, which of course raised some red flags. Eric Stuckel was asked to take a polygraph test, which he did, and he failed badly. However, as we all know, polygraph tests are not 100% accurate, and they cannot be used in a court of law. It sounds like the belief is that this couple that was seen fighting by this dam, this power plant, was believed to be Eric and Tammy, but no one could say for sure. And nobody witnessed the actual murder or the death. So Eric Stuckel was eventually arrested and he was charged with her murder because he was the last person to see her. According to Eric and his family, Tammy was seen at his house sometime, I guess, after like one o'clock in the morning. But the stomach contents of Tammy would confirm that she could, she was not alive any time later than about 1230 or so. Again, not a 100% accurate test. But based on that, they believe that, you know, Eric and his family were lying. And they found, I guess, some hair in the trunk of Eric's vehicle. Hair that visually, under a microscope, looked like Tammy's hair. Again, not a 100% match. The prosecution said that Eric and Tammy got into a fight and without malice, without intent, Eric inadvertently killed Tammy. So basically he was charged with manslaughter. He would plead innocent to all of this. They're saying that she died somewhere else. He then put her into his trunk, drove her to the ditch and left her there. However, they have no evidence to show where she may have been killed, when she was killed. And honestly, they had no physical evidence actually connecting Eric to the murder. I guess other than a couple of hairs found in his trunk, but they were dating and there's always cross, you know, contamination where hairs can fall off, you know, easily into a trunk. So Eric goes on trial and he is found not guilty and he is released. And from what I understand, I mean, double jeopardy obviously would apply. So even if they had evidence to show that he actually did do it, they wouldn't be able to try him again. Somebody killed Tammy. Someone broke her neck. She didn't do that to herself. The last person to physically see her was Eric. He claims she went walking home on her own at two or three in the morning, basically. So someone random must have found her and killed her. A year or two ago for me making this video, uh, her grave was actually defaced. Someone specifically damaged the part that talked about justice for Tammy. And this happened during a time when a lot of her old friends were in town. So there is a belief that someone she knew may have done this if it wasn't Eric. But police are still looking for the public's help to find out who did this? If you have any information about the murder of Tammy Haas, please call 605-668-5210. She was found stabbed to death in her apartment 50 years ago, and they still have no idea who did it. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Teresa Sue Hilt. Viewer discretion is advised. Teresa Hilt, who would go by Tess, she was born on January 6, 1951, in Chillicothe, Missouri. At the time of this case, she is a 22-year-old psychology student, and she's doing so at Northwest Missouri State University. She was described as a small girl with a big personality, a big smile, and a bigger laugh. She was just a really cool, fun person. But sadly, it would all come to an end in such a brutal way in 1973. On the night of August 3rd, 1973, Tess was over at a friend's apartment, and she would leave that apartment sometime around 10 or 11 p.m. She then goes to another friend's apartment. His name is Edward Happel. And when she gets there, there are two other friends of his there. Now, according to Edward and the friends, Tess would leave that apartment at somewhere around 2 a.m. Her apartment was literally like 60, 70 feet away. The following day, Edward was supposed to meet up with her, but she was a no-show. He goes to her apartment, notices the door is unlocked, so he enters and he finds Tess brutally murdered. She was lying face down on her bed. She had a pair of her own stockings wrapped around her neck. She had been stabbed many times and she was posed. So the killer put the knife in her hand and then put her hand kind of behind her back for whatever reason. She was stabbed in her chest many times through her heart 
and her sexual organs had been mutilated and her neck was broken. This was clearly a rage killing. Someone was very angry and it was brutal. Tess had her own hair. She had swallowed some of her own hair and that hair was just covered in blood. That's how intense this attack was. Oddly, the police sergeant who was in charge of this would state that he believed the killer was actually a woman. His reasoning? The crime scene had been cleaned up. Men don't clean up. Uh, I could probably list a hundred cases where men definitely cleaned up the crime scene. It's pretty damn common. But he seemed to be focused on this concept that it was a woman. Not saying that it wasn't, but that's kind of a stupid reason. Something else interesting is that they discovered her traveler's checks and her wallet in two different locations, and her apartment was right here. This would indicate that someone either threw them there after they killed her, or they were dropped by her as she was struggling with whoever this was. But nobody heard screams or the sounds of a struggle. At all. Apparently, they had at least 20 to 30 suspects. They interviewed a bunch of people. Many people would actually take polygraph tests, and those tests would help clear several people out. But one person refused to do a polygraph test. The name of that person is not known. Well, the belief is that that person was actually a woman, stating that she just didn't want to be involved in this, that a polygraph is just time consuming and she doesn't know anything about any of it. Then there were people who would come forward to say that a creepy man had been seen on campus in the days leading up to her murder. And even Tess had said that there was like a man basically, you know, pawing at her this like creepy, greasy haired guy. And that guy was also allegedly seen at the apartment building. There was a rumor that one of her professors who had just gotten divorced, he may have been the killer because Tess had said she was interested in an older man. Another suspect was a man named Michael Sperano Jr. He had killed his own mother. Some people think that that man is the greasy haired man that people were seeing. I don't know if they've ruled him out or not. Another suspect, of course, is the man who found her, Edward Happel. She had been in his apartment with two other men, apparently. Her home is 60 feet away. Apparently, there were issues with his statements. They, they were, there was a couple little lies in them. He suggested that he and Tess were dating, but they didn't have proof that they were. There's like a rumor that basically he wanted to go out with her and maybe he asked her out and she said no. And then he got really pissed off and attacked her. Edward Happel has since died, but I'm not sure about the other two friends who were allegedly there in that apartment that night. Could the three of them have done something to her? Maybe. And one of the biggest issues of all is that shortly after this murder, there was a flood um, at the police station and all of the evidence collected in her case was destroyed by water. So they have no evidence. So if they hope to get something, they may have to exhume her body. Maybe there could have been DNA somewhere on her. But unfortunately, because of that significant setback, and with, they said, they said a laundry list of suspects, this case has been very difficult to solve. And it is still unsolved. If you have any information about the murder of Tess Hilt, please call 660-562-3209. You can also email tips for tests, and the four is the number four, not spelled out, at AOL.com. Please help Tess get the justice she rightfully deserves. This was a roller coaster in which the two trains would race each other, which is a fun idea if it weren't for the fatalities. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story takes us to Revere Beach in Massachusetts, back when everyone talked like an old-timey gangster. Everything was colored in pastels as far as the eye could see, and everyone was dreary because of it. They wanted thrills, they wanted excitement. Revere Beach boasted it had some of the largest and fastest roller coasters on the face of the earth. And now I'll stop talking like this, because it's god-awful annoying. One of those roller coasters was called the Derby Racer, which opened in 1910 back when I was going through my second senior year at college. The concept of the ride is you would board the train dressed in horrific clothing, and you would race each other throughout the tracks. Look at those old broads holding onto their hats. Like, they would be on this ride. Come on. You should be sipping tea somewhere. Now, I don't know if the people on the trains had any, like, say in how fast their train was going, but even still, both trains would be extremely competitive about it, 
and they would be screaming and hollering at each other, laughing and having a great time. In a twisted bit of irony, there was a man who worked at the park who was giving a safety speech on the Derby Racer before the ride would begin. And unbelievably, as he's giving that safety speech, he falls a pretty good distance and died. This would cause them to lose their license for this particular ride, and it was shut down temporarily. Eventually, the ride would reopen, and it would go back to its success. This was the most popular ride they had. And then in 1917, a man would board one of the trains, and as the train is going up its steepest incline, his hat blows off in the wind. And as many people do instinctively on rides like this, when that happens, he tries to grab the hat. He literally takes the bar off, the safety bar, and he stands up. But when that happens, he loses his balance. And he falls from this train onto the other track. And then the other train crashes into the man and drags him 35 to 40 feet at top speed, literally across these wood slats of the track. When it was all said and done, the man was pronounced dead at the scene and they would determine that almost every bone in his body was broken. He went through absolute hell, but hopefully it didn't last that long for him and he didn't feel pain for that long. Unbelievably, the ride would not be shut down, but by 1936, it was demolished and rebuilt and simply called the new Derby Racer. Riders, beware. Are they spinning? They're rotating like a bunch of rotisserie chickens up there. Who thought this was a good idea? There's people in those pods. Oh, God, no. Nope. Plummet, plummet, plummet. It's raining people. That's all I can see. It's like nothing, there's no roof. Three people would die during two separate accidents at Kings Island Park in one night. Hello, true crimeers. This is another Deaths at Theme Parks. Viewer discretion is advised. Today's story took place at Kings Island, which is located in Mason, Ohio, about 24 miles northeast of Cincinnati. The date was June 9th, 1991. At approximately 8.30 p.m., a 22-year-old man named Timothy Binning was near this little pond which is located i guess at the beer garden area he was there with a friend and they got close to the water and timothy was like i'm gonna do something silly i'm gonna splash water on my friend so he reaches over puts his hand in the water to splash but is immediately electrocuted and then he falls into the water his friend 21 year old william haithcote immediately jumps in the water to save his friend and so did the 20 year old security guard his name was daryl robertson but the two Good Samaritans who were going in there to save another person were both electrocuted. Full body electrocution. Those two men would die. Timothy Binning, the one who initially fell in, who they were trying to save, actually survived. He had severe burns on his arms and his neck. Later, the investigation would show that there was a surge in the aerator pump that did not have a functioning ground fault circuit interrupter. And so Kings Island would later be fined about $24,000 for this incident. That exact same night at 9.45 p.m. aboard the flight commander ride, which I showed at the beginning, you are put into these little pods and the thing rotates, I guess, while you're spinning around. Not something I could ever do. A 32-year-old woman named Candy Taylor was on the ride that night. During one of the rotations, Candy had somehow slipped out of her harness and slid over to the empty seat next to her where the harness was not like put down. And so when it made a second rotation, she slipped left out of the ride and she fell, she plummeted 60 feet to the concrete below. This would later be blamed to a design flaw. Yeah, no kidding. Candy Taylor's family would sue Kings Island for somewhere around $8 million, but I'm assuming they must have settled and it must have been discreet because I don't know the result of it. In 2008, a teenage boy was found dead right here on this road. But the question still remains, how exactly did it happen and who did it? Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of TJ Ainsworth. Viewer discretion is advised. 
Travis James Ainsworth, who would go by TJ, was born on July 2nd, 1991, and he lived his entire life in Texas. TJ was described as a young man who was just a joy to be around. He was incredibly intelligent, and he actually had a 4.0 GPA at school, and his mom would say that he was just a sensitive kid, but was always there to help someone if they needed it. But sadly, in June of 2008, all of that would come to a tragic end. In the very early morning hours of June 2nd, 2008, along Highway 243 near Canton, Texas, a passing motorist would call 911 in a panic because there was a young man lying in the middle of the road. As a matter of fact, this is the exact spot that the young man was found. The motorist, while calling 911, said that the young man was still alive, and he was saying things like, why did they do this to me? And then he also said, don't let them hurt me anymore. The person who saw this stayed by this young man's side until the ambulance arrived. He wanted to make sure that nobody else drove by and accidentally hit him. He also didn't want to risk moving him in case he injured him more. The young man was put into an ambulance. He, they could tell he already had some broken bones, but however, just before they arrived at the hospital, the young man was pronounced dead. He would soon be identified as 16-year-old T.J. Ainsworth. The night prior, he was out with some friends, and according to them, they dropped him off at a Walmart, and this was sometime around midnight. And then at some point between 1.15 a.m. and 2 a.m. is likely when TJ was, well, whatever happened to him, happened to him. TJ suffered a lot of injuries, but they could not determine if he was struck by a car, and they think possibly even an 18-wheeler, but they also don't know if perhaps he was thrown out of a moving vehicle or if he jumped out of a moving vehicle on his own accord. The injuries didn't point to like a specific cause, but it had to be vehicle related. And the fact that he himself was saying, why did they do this to me and don't let them hurt me anymore kind of goes in the direction of was this a foul play situation? meaning something happened that led to somebody purposefully killing him, and maybe he knew who they were. I know they interviewed the friends he was with, and I'm assuming they've cleared them, but I don't know for sure. But as of right now, his case is still unsolved. So if you have information about the murder of T.J. Ainsworth, please contact the Canton, Texas Police Department. 27 years ago, she vanished from her neighborhood, and her family is still trying to bring her home. Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Trudy Appleby. Viewer discretion is advised. Trudy was born on September 4th, 1984. That would make her a year older than me. And at the time of this case, she's living in Moline, Illinois. She's described as a really fun, outgoing young girl, big personality. She loved to be outside. She loved to be on the water. And everyone just seemed to love her. But on August 21st, 1996, Trudy would vanish forever and she was just 11 years old. Trudy was last seen that morning between 9.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. She was walking out of her house and kind of down the street. She was wearing a black one-piece bathing suit, stretchy bicycle shorts, white socks, and dark blue shoes. They were by Nike, and they had white shoelaces. Now, earlier that morning, Trudy's dad had already left for work. But when he got home and Trudy wasn't there, he would immediately report her missing. From what I can see here, Trudy's parents weren't actually married. And I guess the, Trudy's mom had given up custody to Trudy's dad because apparently her mom had a learning disability. And so she wasn't like living with them. But later down the road, Trudy's mom would say that, you know, the dad had a habit, you know, a, kind of a, a bad lifestyle illegal substances, drinking, that kind of thing. And she kind of said, I need someone to blame, and so I blame him. That that lifestyle may have led to this, but I think that's more of just her acting out in frustration. But at any rate, the police quickly got moving on this, and then the FBI became involved, and they're questioning everyone in the neighborhood. And that's when they got the information about how Trudy was last seen by a couple of people between 9.30 and 10.30 that morning. The neighbor said it, it looked as if Trudy had gotten into the vehicle of another man. They think the vehicle was a Chevy celebrity and that the man inside the vehicle was maybe in his mid to late 20s, possibly 30s. He was a white male. He had brown or black curly hair down to his shoulders. 
He was wearing a baseball cap, so this description here, if you can see it. And the neighbors who witnessed this stated that it looked like Trudy willingly got into this vehicle, that she pro probably even knew the person. It wasn't like an abduction, like she wasn't stolen off the street. But who that person was, nobody seemed to know, nobody seemed to recognize the vehicle, I guess. And they just kept searching and searching and searching for her, but they never found her. And the case basically went cold. Even though the detectives are like, the case isn't cold, we're still working on it, but it would be a very long time before they got any actual concrete evidence or statements. As a matter of fact, it would be not until 2017 when police announced they had or have a suspect in this case. Yeesh. A man named William Ed Smith. I guess he was an acquaintance of or friend of Trudy's dad. Well, a witness comes forward in 2017 to state that he, in fact, saw Trudy in the vehicle with, with Ed here. And that Ed had threatened the witness, if you tell anyone about this, I will murder you. Police would then find out that within like less than a week after the abduction took place, he had his vehicle completely scrapped and it was just gone forever. This is David Whipple, who was Ed's son-in-law. He may have been the one to come forward with this information, but I'm not 100% sure. But from what I understand, David and Ed would actually go out to, I guess, the lake or the river, you know, like for fishing and whatnot. And there, it was actually kind of somewhat common for Trudy to go out on the river with them. And so what is believed may have happened is that either David or Ed had convinced Trudy to get into the vehicle and then they took her out to the lake or the river and then maybe something happened maybe an accident took place and they didn't want to get caught or in trouble for it it's just a theory the morning of the disappearance Trudy had asked her dad hey can I go swimming today he said no she was last seen wearing a bathing suit which would indicate she had plans to go to the water you know against her dad's wishes now, unfortunately, William Ed Smith, he died in 2014, a couple of years before this information even came out. Police managed to get a warrant to search, I guess, the boat that may have been used that day. And this would have been decades later, of course, but they took a whole bunch of swabs and the FBI processed it and they got, unfortunately, nothing from it. You know, they have searched the waters, they have searched this island, and again, they've come up with nothing. In 2022, David Whipple dies. So that's two men who are tied to this case, potentially, who are now dead and have never faced charges and have never said where Trudy is. Police also named this man, Jameson Fisher, as a person of interest. He was a friend to uh, Ed and David. He may have gone out to the, the, the river with them that morning or that day. But as far as I know, he's still alive, but no charges connected to this case have been put on him. Just this year in 2023, they got a warrant to excavate a property in Kelowna. They dug and they dug and they looked, but they got absolutely nothing. But somebody out there knows something and Trudy deserves to be brought back home. If you have information, you can contact that number or 309-797-0401. She died in a tub full of alcohol in one of the worst unusual deaths. Viewer discretion is advised. So this particular story happened in Taiwan in 2004. Family members would go to their loved one's home, I guess when they had not heard from her in about a day or so. When they get inside, they look all over for her and then they finally find her in the bathtub. She is lying in it, she's nude, and her head is above the water. However, the woman was dead. Their first natural assumption was she drowned in the bath, but again, her head was above the liquid. And when I say liquid, I don't mean water. This is not the exact tub, of course, but the bathtub was about halfway full of alcohol. And at first glance, this was incredibly unusual and nobody could determine what led to this behavior and what led to this death. So at the autopsy, her blood test would indicate she had a 1.5% blood alcohol level. That is astronomically high. Blood alcohol levels at 0.4% is when they start to become lethal. And she was at 1.5. The other bizarre thing is they would learn that she didn't actually ingest much alcohol at all. 
So how on earth did her blood alcohol level get that high? Well, and this is something I did not know could happen, but it absorbed into her skin. Based on time frames of when people had last heard from her, based on like rigor mortis, and based on the damage that was done to her body, they would determine that she was sitting in that bathtub full of alcohol for 12 hours straight. Why would she do that? Well, between 2002 and 2004, Taiwan was dealing with the SARS epidemic. It had infected over 8,000 people worldwide. 664 of the cases came from Taiwan, including at least 73 deaths. From what they were able to gather, family thinks that she believed that sitting in a tub of alcohol would actually help her not get SARS. She was doing it as a way to remedy it or prevent it. I don't know where she got that information, but that is why she was in the tub. But what she didn't know, and quite honestly, what I did not know, and I'm not sure if you guys did either, that you could absorb alcohol through your skin. They also think she probably inhaled some of the fumes that would eventually come off of it. And they believe that at one point, the blood alcohol level got so high that she was unable to move her body. Whether or not she felt any pain or, you know, what experience she went through physically, I'm not 100% sure. But it certainly took her quite some time to eventually pass away from this. I have never heard anything like this before. 40 seconds is all it took to gun down five people for absolutely no reason. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the 2002 U.S. Bank murders. Viewer discretion is advised. It was September 26, 2002 in Norfolk, Nebraska. Police were called to the U.S. Bank, which is located on 13th Street and Pacewalk Avenue. When they arrive, it is, it's a bloodbath. There are bullets everywhere, shattered glass, and there are five bodies. Samuel's son, Lola Elwood, Joe Mosbach, Yvonne Tuttle, and Lisa Bryant. Son, Elwood, and Mosbach were actually employees of the bank whereas Bryant and Tuttle were customers that morning. Based on CCTV footage, they discovered that these killers walked in and within 40 seconds of them entering the building, they shot all five people and then they left. They didn't even steal anything. Within like an hour or so, police were given a tip that three men had broke into a home nearby and they stole a vehicle from that home. That vehicle was found and they determined that those men then stole another car. And finally, those men were spotted outside of McDonald's within like three or so hours of this shooting taking place. From what I understand, the three men that were caught right then were Jorge Galindo, Jose Sandoval, and Eric Vela. And then later that night, Gabriel Rodriguez was found and arrested. What police found out was that these four men had been planning this bank heist for about four weeks. One of them at least was going to be the getaway driver in the lookout. One of them went into the bank and just to kind of get a feel for who was in there, they then left it and told the others where everyone was positioned. And for whatever reason, the men went in there with guns and just started shooting. They had planned to rob this bank, but instead they just shot and killed everyone. They basically would say that something chaotic happened almost instantly and they just reacted. So ultimately, these five people died for nothing. I mean, it's senseless and awful regardless, but they fucked up their own plan, and so they kill all these people for what? So, all four of them were charged in relation to the murders. Sandoval, Galato, and Vela, they were all convicted and sentenced to death. Rodriguez was sentenced to multiple life sentences, but he did not get the death penalty. And as far as I can tell, these three men are still waiting to be executed. The bank itself was eventually torn down and it was turned into this memorial park to honor the five people who were lost so senselessly. She had plans to meet her friends to go shopping that day, but unfortunately, she would never show up. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Valaine Briggs. Viewer discretion is advised. Valaine was born on September 6, 1958 in Dillon, Montana. At the time of the story, she is 18 years old, and she had moved from Montana to Salt Lake City, Utah to attend school. And it was the LDS Business School, at least back then. Valaine was known as a very reliable and very punctual person. 
So when the time came for her to meet up with her friends one day and she didn't show up, they all knew something was wrong. It was May 5th, 1977. Valaine was last seen leaving a classroom at about 11.20 a.m. The plan was for her to go back to the apartments that she lived in with a couple of people, and then they were going to go shopping. So one of the roommates would contact Valaine's boyfriend, and he said he hasn't seen or heard from her either. So he goes to the school where he also attended, and he finds Valaine's car still there. But Valaine was nowhere to be found. So, the 18-year-old girl was reported missing officially. They would search for a couple of days, but sadly, on May 7, 1977, at 4.45 p.m., two hikers were in Lambs Canyon, and it's there that they found the body of a nude female. They would confirm that it was the body of Elaine Briggs. She had died of strangulation. Pictured here are the exact bindings that were used to tie her up. They believe she was strangled with a three-quarter inch cord or rope, which was not found. She herself was in a green trash bag, but apparently none of it yielded any physical evidence to point to the killer. Valaine was laid to rest, and everyone was still on edge, wondering, is there a killer still out there? And then in July of 1977, a 17-year-old girl was hitchhiking, and one of the people who picked her up noticed that she had an identification card that said Valaine Briggs. This person knew about the Valaine Briggs story. So this girl was contacted by authorities. They questioned her for a couple of days. And she said some unknown man who had picked her up before gave her that card. And they were able to conclude that she herself had nothing to do with the murder. But who this man was, to this day, nobody knows. Salt Lake City Police have interviewed a couple of people, potential suspects, but so far all of them have either been ruled out or there's no evidence to connect them to this murder. I think they've also ruled out the boyfriend. And sadly, her case is still very much unsolved. If you have information, please call 833-377-7233. She was referred to as the Torso Murderer. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Valerie Pape. Viewer discretion is advised. In January of 2000, behind a grocery store in Mesa, Arizona, a man would observe a petite woman lifting a trash bag into a dumpster, and she was clearly struggling to do so. The person who saw this waited for the woman to leave, and he went to see what was in that trash bag. And it was a nightmare. It was a human torso, there was no head, there were no arms or legs. And they were quick to identify the woman who it was based on her appearance and her vehicle. It was Valerie Pape who dumped that trash bag in the dumpster. The 47-year-old woman was then quickly arrested by police and she admitted that that was the body of her husband, Mr. Ira Pomerantz. At the time of this case, she was 47 and he was 60 and Valerie was originally from France. The two of them would marry in 1995, but almost immediately their relationship became tumultuous. It became just very sour, as people would describe it. They argued all the time. She claimed that he was violent towards her. He always denied that. In 1997, Valerie had opened up her own beauty salon. In that exact same year, Ira's bar that he owned went bankrupt. And so it caused a lot of friction between the two of them. And this is when family and friends would say their relationship just became very volatile. Police have been called to their home on a number of occasions due to domestic disturbances. She would say he was an abusive alcoholic. She showed that she had bruises. By 1999, she issued a court order against him, but then she rescinded that court order and said they have reconciled. There was rumors that they were in debt. There was jealousy because living with them from time to time was a man named Michelle Sauvage. And Ira thought that Valerie and Michelle were having an affair, which she denied and so did he. After the torso was recovered and Valerie was arrested, they searched the home to see if they could find any other clues, but they really didn't come up with anything. As a matter of fact, to this very day, they have not found the rest of his body. But based on the torso, they can confirm his cause of death was he had been shot. Valerie had purchased an electric chainsaw a couple of weeks prior to this murder, which would indicate and show premeditation. 
Initially, she said she dismembered the body after finding him shot dead in their home, but nobody believed that. And she would end up pleading guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Her friends and family said she was a kind and sweet woman, but she still refused to say where the rest of his body was. And no one can confirm if he really was abusive or not. She served her 16 years, was released, and then was deported back to France. They tried to rob an armored car facility, but instead they left behind three bodies and got virtually no money. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of the Vallejo armored car murders. Viewer discretion is advised. November 13th, 1991. It's 8.51 p.m. when the Vallejo, California Police Department received a very disturbing call. The Loomis Armored Incorporated Warehouse had been robbed. When police arrive, they have to be extra cautious because they're not sure if the criminals are still there. This is a recreation from Unsolved Mysteries, but as they walk in, they notice the gate is partially open and there is a man lying face down on the ground. They then quickly find two more security guards lying face down and tied up, just like the first man. Two of the men would be pronounced dead at the scene. The third individual would be taken to the hospital, but eventually would also die. The three men were identified as Martin McCumber, Dennis Jacobson, and Alfonso Lonteo. Martin had a wife of 20 years. Alfonso was six months away from getting married to the woman of his dreams. He had recently switched to working night shifts there at the armored facility in order to make more money to pay for the wedding. All three men had been shot in the head. Whoever did this left behind an absolute mountain of evidence. They left behind virtually everything. So while this is a recreation from the show, the evidence that is in the recreation is the actual items from the robbery. They found things like a pair of shoes. They found lighter fluid. They left the murder weapon behind. It was an eight inch blue steel Colt Trooper 357 Magnum revolver. And it was confirmed to be the gun that was used to shoot all three men. They also found a pair of bolt cutters near a giant open hole in the fence, which is where the perpetrators likely entered through. They found gloves. They found uh, a jacket with ski masks, more gloves. They found a giant bag, actually a couple of giant bags full of money. The bags of cash weighed about 90 pounds each. So obviously the perpetrators, they, they couldn't carry them. It was too heavy for them. And they left them all behind. Across the street at a park, they found an AK-47 with another mask and another jacket, gloves. The police put up roadblocks all around the area to see if they could find anyone with information about what happened. The perpetrators pretty much got away with nothing because there were still hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars there at the armored car facility that hadn't been taken. And from what I understand, they really didn't get a dime. This whole thing was a failure on their end that left three innocent men just trying to do their job, left them all dead. They had wives, they had children, they had brothers and sisters, moms and dads. They had families, people that loved them dearly. And whoever did this just annihilated them for no reason. So at these roadblocks, police would get some, you know, pieces of information from witnesses who said that on the, the night this happened, it, they saw, one person saw a white male running from the facility. Another person saw a black male running from the facility in a different direction. Police also believe that the people responsible for this, at least one of them, likely knew this facility well, probably even worked there before. They at first couldn't figure out why the three of them died. I mean, all of, they found their masks and gloves. They were clearly covered up. No one would have recognized them. And so that's how police believe that one of them, one of these three men at least, must have recognized the one person who involved who may have worked with them before. So they had to all die, apparently. And then in March of 1993, this man here, Thomas Young, was arrested for unrelated firearms charges by the ATF. While in custody, police got a tip from an informant that said he was involved in the Vallejo murders. Now, there was a lot of physical evidence left behind, like there were fingerprints, there was hair, there was saliva, there was DNA. But for a long time, they didn't match anyone. But some of the fingerprints would end up matching him, Thomas Young. And so in November of 1993, he would finally confess that he was involved. There were four total people involved. It was Thomas Young, Assad Muhammad, Eugene Livingston, and then a man named Victor James McLean, whose photo I cannot confirm or find. 
Eugene Livingston had in fact come up on the police's radar during the initial investigation because he did use to work for that facility. He worked with some of the victims. So then Thomas Young would basically agree to take a plea deal in order to testify against the other men. He was initially going to be sentenced to 25 years to life by being convicted of one of the murders. But then he decided he no longer wanted to testify against the other men. So charges against two of the men were dropped. So they still had Thomas Young and Eugene Livingston. Livingston would then confess to being involved in the robbery and planning it, but he was not involved in the actual murders. And so in 1996, he was found guilty of second degree robbery and conspiracy to commit robbery, but was found not guilty of murder. He got three years in prison and then was released. He said Assad Muhammad was the actual mastermind of this whole thing. He continued to deny any involvement. However, they found saliva on one of the ski masks and that DNA would end up matching him. He was convicted of all three murders and got life in prison without parole. Previously, Thomas Young would have gotten 25 years to life, meaning he could have asked for parole. But because he recanted, that deal was taken off. He was then convicted of three murders and got life without parole. The fourth individual, Victor McLean, they never had enough evidence to go forward with any kind of trial. So he was left unpunished. He committed a murder because he wanted to play Xbox. I wish I was lying. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Violet Mullen. Viewer discretion is advised. 15-month-old Violet lived here in this flat in Oldham, England. And she lived here in this flat with her mom, Claire, and her mom's boyfriend, Gary Alcock. In January of 2010, an ambulance was called to their home because the 15-month-old child was unresponsive. And apparently she had blue lips and looked, quote, spaced out. Paramedics couldn't do anything for her, however, when they arrived and she would be pronounced dead. The autopsy would show a staggering 35 separate injuries on this little tiny girl's body. Multiple rib fractures, she had bruises over every part of her body, and had severe brain damage. This tiny, innocent, defenseless little life had been beaten to death. And the reason why is just fucking insane. This smug piece of crap, Gary Alcock, was at home watching Violet, and he was playing his Xbox. And the little girl at the time was sick, and so she needed some more frequent attention. She needed to be changed. She needed to be fed. And every time she would, you know, kind of you know, stumble into the room to ask for help, he would get really pissed because he was playing Xbox, and she kept interrupting him. And apparently she interrupted him one too many times because the last time he punched her as hard as he possibly could in her stomach. And then he just kept wailing on her, punching her, beating her, slapping her until she became unresponsive. And then he just put her in her crib like nothing happened, but she was gone. And when Claire came home from work, she helped cover it up. She initially was trying to prevent anyone from finding out what happened. Instead of immediately going to the police, immediately calling an ambulance, the moment she noticed, she waited a very long time. It's possible the child could have been saved had they been called right away. So both of them were arrested and charged with various crimes. Claire would be found not guilty of murder. However, she would be found guilty of causing or allowing the death to happen and basically trying to help him get away with it. It was said in court that she was more concerned about having a man in her life with stability than she was about the life of her child. And she only got five years for it. Gary Alcock was convicted of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison where he could ask for parole after 21 years. A 15 month old child lost her life because a grown man wanted to play Xbox. <laughs> I cannot show you the rest of that video, but literally just a half a second later, the man in the video dies in one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. Now, I don't know exactly when this story happened. I believe this occurred in China. And this is in some kind of like paper mill or 
paper factory. Some people have stated that there, that beeping you hear, that there is actually, basically it's the machine is stating that there is a paper jam in this machine. And then it appears that the man in the darker clothing is showing this person in the, in the lighter clothing, I guess how to operate this machine, or perhaps even trying to say, hey, this is why we don't put our hand in the machine. We're, no one's really 100% sure. But literally like the moment after I cut off that video, the man in the dark clothing is literally by his hand sucked into this machine and he is flattened. His entire body goes through it in quite honestly, an instant. And the only thing I could hope is that his death was instantaneous and that he didn't feel much of anything because what happens to him is absolutely horrific. He is there and then he is just gone the next moment. And you can tell that this other worker is just like completely taken aback because it happened so quickly that he barely could even process what he just saw. Yes, you can see this video, full video online. It's super quick. There's no blood or gore shown. But if that man's death was not instant, I cannot imagine the level of pain that that man had to be in for as long as he was until he eventually died. I don't know why he was putting his hand near the giant rolling machine, I don't know. But it's what cost him his life, unfortunately. Imagine instead of a rock, that that was a person. That would be one of the worst deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised. So what I just showed you was a jaw crusher, sometimes referred to as a boulder crusher, but like a much smaller version. This one is a much larger industrial version that will literally take a massive boulder and turn it to pebbles. These are machines that consist of two massive metal jaws. One of them is stationary, so it never moves. And then the other one is constantly pressing against the other one in a very rapid movement. Well, there is an incident, and yes, you can see this entire incident online. A man was working on one of these large industrial jaw crushers when there was a jam. He climbs into the machine as it is still running, and he is then attempting to unjam it. He must succeed, because then he immediately gets pulled into the machine. And then this, you know, giant heavy rock falls on him. The next thing you know, you can basically see him with his hands holding on to whatever he can. And in the video, you can see him like vibrating very fast as he is being sucked slowly into this machine. There are also people you see occasionally walking around. What they were doing, I don't know. Why there wasn't a big old red stop button being pressed immediately, I don't know. From what I understand, the lockout tag procedure, I'm not too familiar with it, but it was not being utilized, which happens a lot. But the man is slowly being dragged through these giant metal jaws. Meanwhile, he has these giant rocks and small boulders collapsing on him. And then he's gone. He has run through the jaw crushing machine, a machine that turns these giant boulders into dust, basically. Okay, so pay attention to this rock and see what happens to it so you can get an idea. That rock basically folded in half like a pancake. It, it, it was compressed. That man had to have gone through hell and he was alive for, you can tell he was just by watching the video. There was another story in Anaheim, California. I think it was 1991. A very similar thing happened. A man was trying to clear out a jam and he just literally fell all the way to the bottom of the chute and he was crushed by the jaws slowly. They also add water to these machines, I guess as like a lubricant. And there was, in the Anaheim story, there was a massive pool of water at the bottom. So the man was being crushed to death while drowning as well. Please be careful at work. I don't want any of you to like become a subject on my page. And watch out for your coworkers as well. Keep an eye on them. Your life is not worth whatever it is they may be paying you to go into these machines and unjam them. If you have the lockout tag procedures, use them. Stories like this do not need to happen. All they could see were his legs sticking out of the meat grinder where he died in one of the craziest deaths imaginable. Viewer discretion is advised.
Pictured here was 18-year-old Jomar Jungko, and he lived in Iloilo in the Philippines. On June 22, 2019, the 18-year-old was working at a meat processing factory there, and he had only been working there for about two weeks. This is not him, this is another co-worker of his. And the co-worker is basically showing how the meat grinder works. Pretty simple machine, it seems like, but also a pretty strong and powerful machine. Jomar was not trained on how to use it. And as a matter of fact, he was not assigned to be using this machine at all that day. However, when one of his co-workers would step into a different part of the factory, Jomar was alone in the room with this machine. They don't know the reason behind it or why he did it, but he must have wanted to just try helping out the rest of the team, so he began to operate this meat grinding machine. And at the time, it was you being used to make, uh, I guess, a spicy chorizo. A few minutes later, when the co-worker comes back and all they could see are legs sticking out of the meat grinding machine. I obviously probably can't show you the whole image, but it is available to see. But I do probably have to blur it out. Half of Joe Mar's body had been pulled into this meat grinding machine. The machine basically would end up stopping on its own due to the jam of his body being stuck in it. It would have been apparently impossible for him to reach the power button from when he went for, was first sucked in. And he didn't apparently make any sounds or screams or anything. So essentially they believe that he had reached into the machine with his hand as it was running and then pulled him forcefully into it. And then it just completely drug his body halfway at least into the machine. It took them some time, but they were able to eventually get his body out and he was absolutely deceased. The coroner would state that he did not die from being like ground up. That's not what happened to him. His body was pretty much fully intact, but what happened was he essentially was asphyxiated. He suffocated. His body was compressed into the small workings of this machine. And so he was alive for a sh at least a short period of time while he was struggling to probably free himself. But eventually his chest and everything would compress to the point where he could not breathe properly. And he was suffering for some time. And then finally he ended up dying by essentially asphyxiation. They determined that there was no foul play involved, that this was just a horrific accident. But let it be a lesson to make sure everybody is trained on all the machinery in these factories, even if they never use them.